Chapter 20 Disquiet Mara watched. Through the open screen of her study she could see a runner dashing up the road from the distant Imperial Highway. The muscular young man wore only a breechcloth and a red cloth head covering bearing the mark of a commercial messenger's guild. Lacking the power of a major house, the guilds could nonetheless provide sanctions enough to guarantee that their couriers moved through the empire untroubled. As the runner reached the front of the estate house, Kiyoke hobbled down on his crutch to offer greeting. For the Lady of the Akoma, cried the messenger. The adviser for war accepted the sealed parchment and, in turn, gave the messenger a token, a shell coin cut with the Akoma chop, to serve as proof the man had discharged his duty. The runner bowed in respect. He did not linger to take refreshment, but turned back down the road, his pace only marginally more sedate. Mara noted his departure with a stab of concern. Couriers from the Red Guild were seldom the bearers of good news. When Kiyoke arrived in her study, she held out her hand for the message with trepidation. The identifying mark on the parchment was the one she feared, the chop of the Anasati. Before she cut the ribbons and read, she knew the worst had happened. Takuma was dead. In the doorway, Kiyoke looked with troubled eyes. The old lord has died. Not unexpectedly, Mara sighed as she put down the short message. She glanced over the accounts of her flourishing silk enterprise that had worn at her patience only minutes before. Now, as if they represented a haven against difficulties, she longed with all her heart to return to them. I'm afraid we will need Nakoya's counsel. Mara called her servant to tidy up her documents, then led her adviser for war through the estate house to the chamber across from the nursery that the old woman had adamantly refused to give up, even when promotion to first adviser had entitled her to better. As Mara set her hand to the floral painted screen at the entry, a querulous voice called out, Go away! I require nothing! The Lady of the Acoma glanced hopefully to her adviser for war, who shook his head. He would rather have braved a frontal charge on a battlefield than lead the way into the old woman's quarters. Mara sighed, shoved back the screen and flinched at the outraged cry that emerged from the piled blankets and pillows on the mat. My lady, Nakoya said sharply, forgive me, I thought you were the healer's servant bringing remedies. She sniffed, rubbed at a reddened nose, then added, I wish no visitors to offer pity. A bed with a congestion of the chest and a fever, the old woman found her annoyance overcome by a spasm of coughing. Her white hair stood up in stray locks, and her eyes were red-rimmed in a face like crumpled wet parchment. The hands that clutched the blankets looked devastatingly fragile, and yet, at the sight of Kiyoke, Nakoya rallied to outrage. Mistress, you have a cruel heart! To bring a man to a sick woman's bedside and without warning. The Akoma first adviser flushed scarlet with embarrassment, but remained too stubbornly proud to avert her face. Her stormy gaze fastened next on Kiyoke. You, old campaigner, you should be wise enough to know better. I'll not suffer myself to be stared at. Mara knelt by her first adviser's bedside, the sympathy Nakoya so stoutly disdained hidden deep in her heart. The old woman's age made even small illnesses more hazardous, as today's news made clear. Always before, Nakoya's frail appearance had hidden a whipcord resilience, a fibre of staunchness that made her seem indestructible. But now she was miserable with her cold and shrunken with years to a husk of her former vitality, her mortality became frighteningly apparent. Mara patted one of the wrinkled hands. Mother of my heart, I am here only because your counsel is sorely needed. 
The tone of Mara's voice jolted the old woman from self-pity. Nakoya sat up and coughed. Daughter, what is it? Takuma of the Anasati has died. Mara's fingers tightened on the first adviser's hand. He succumbed to the illness that kept him abed this last six months. Nakoya sighed. Her eyes turned distant and fixed inward on what might have been a memory or a thought only she could discern. He refused to fight any longer, poor man. He was a worthy warrior and a generous and honourable opponent. Under the blankets, Nakoya's thin body was racked by another fit of coughing. As she struggled to regain breath, Mara spared her the need to speak first. Do you think it wise for me to approach Jiro? Nakoya's hand tightened inside her mistress's. Dota, as much as he hates you for choosing his brother over him, he is not as obsessed as Tasai always. With the welfare of the Anasati placed upon his shoulders, responsibility might bend him to reason. From the doorway behind Kiyoke, Kevin's voice unexpectedly interrupted. Never underestimate the human capacity for stupid, illogical and petty behaviour. Nakoya gave the Midkemian an irritated glare from her pillows. Annoyed as she was that Kiyoke should see her dishevelled and sick, the presence of a young man was that much worse, and yet she could not show anger. Despite the slave's odd behaviour and disregard for Surani custom, despite his inconvenient but genuine love for Mara, Kevin had a nimble mind. Reluctantly, Nakoya admitted, Your... slave gives good counsel, daughter... We must assume that Jiro will remain intractable until he proves otherwise. The Anasati have been our enemies too long, for all that they have been honourable. We must proceed cautiously. Mara said, What shall I do? Send a letter of condolence, Kevin offered helpfully. The suggestion brought blank looks from Mara and her two advisers. A letter of condolence, Kevin repeated, then belatedly realised there was no Surani equivalent. It's the custom in my homeland to send a message telling someone you share their loss and wish them well. An odd custom, Kiyoke allowed, yet it has some sense of honour about it. Nakoya's eyes brightened. She looked long and shrewdly at Kevin, then mustered a congested breath and spoke. Such a letter will provide an opening for communications without conceding anything. Most clever. Well, one could look at things that way, said Kevin, bemused to find the concept of compassion mistaken by the Surani mind for another machination of the game. The idea won Mara's approval. I shall draw up a letter without delay. Yet she made no move to rise. She held Nakoya's hand and her fingers tightened as if reluctant to let go. For an interval she stared at the weave in the counterpane as if avoiding the old woman's face. Nakoya said, There is something else. Mara glanced uneasily about the room. The first adviser's instincts as a children's nurse had never left her. Faintly disparaging, she said, It has been years since you played the part of bashful maiden, daughter. Speak your mind and be done. Mara fought the burn of sudden tears. The subject she most urgently needed to broach stole her poise. We must seek a <clears throat> bright servant to begin to... 
The old nurse fixed her former charge with a withering look. You mean I must begin trading a replacement? Mara all but protested outright. Nakoya had stood in place of the mother she had never known. To imagine a time without her seemed impossibly bleak and unreal. Although the subject had been lightly discussed, she had put off decision and action. Yet the mantle of rulership forced the cold truth that now she must. Only Nakoya could handle the subject with equanimity. I am old, daughter of my heart. I feel chill in my bones on warm days, and my duties begin to weigh on weak flesh. Do not let my dying come on me without the surety that you have sound guidance by your side. The Red God won't hurry to take you, said Kevin with a grin. You're too mean yet. Don't blaspheme, Nakoya snapped, but her wrinkled lips twitched and she buried a smile behind a cough. Try as she might to dislike this barbarian, he was handsome enough to forgive much and his loyalty to Mara was unquestioned. Mara said, Kiyoki could... But the hard-bitten former warrior interrupted with a gentleness his soldiers never knew. I am almost as old as Nakoya Mara. Her name was spoken with an affection that showed no disrespect. I served your father gladly, and have given the Akoma both my sword and my leg. You have given my life a purpose far beyond my hopes as a young man. But I will not see you foster a weakness. His voice turned stern. I refuse the honour of Nakoya's mantle. You must have a strong, clever mind and young blood at your side to advise you in the years after we are gone. Mara's grip on Nakoya's hand did not loosen, and her shoulders stayed stiff. Kevin drew breath to intervene, but a quiet touch from Kiyoke restrained him. The old warrior said, when a force commander trains his young officers, he is a fool if he cuddles them or shows softness. Lady, Kiyoke appealed plainly, the exigencies of an advisorship require more than blind obedience. Understanding of what is necessary for the good of the house, as well as the will to play the great game. I have had no time for children. Would you deprive me or Nakoya of the chance to train our successor? Such a one would become the joy to enrich my late years, even as the son I never had. Or the daughter? Mara said playfully, though her voice shook. Kiyoke managed a slight upward turn to the corner of his mouth, as close as he ever came to smiling. You are that already, lady. Mara regarded him and then Nakoya in turn. The old woman's eyes were bright from more than fever. She watched Keoke as if the two of them had a conspiracy. Mara's confusion crystallised into suspicion that the matter had been extensively discussed without her. Already you have someone in mind, you old war dog. There is a man, Kiyoke allowed, a warrior who has a fast sword, but whose performance in the ranks is unsatisfactory because he thinks too much. He's an embarrassment to his officers, and he won't hold his tongue, Kevin concluded out loud. Do I know him? Kiyoke ignored this, steadily regarding Mara. He has served you well though most of his duties have been among your outer holdings. His cousin... Sarik! Mara interrupted, intrigued despite her unhappiness. Lujan's cousin, the one with the quick tongue that you sent away because the two of them together... She broke off and smiled. 
Is it Sarik? Kayoke cleared his throat. He has a very creative mind. More than that, my lady, Nakoya added, struggling against a thick voice. The man's a devil for cleverness. He never forgets a face or a word spoken in his presence. In ways, he puts me in mind of both Lujan and Arakasi. Though she had met Sarek only briefly, Mara remembered the young man. He had a charm about him, manners that could not be shaken, and a gift for asking embarrassing questions. Both were traits to be valued in a future advisor. Thinking fondly of Lujan and his flexibility in embracing innovation, Mara said, It sounds as though you two have done the interviewing for me. I yield to your better wisdom. She held up her hand, ending discussion on the matter. Send for Sarik, and begin his training as you see fit. She moved to rise, and belatedly recalled the parchment in her hands. I must draft a letter to Jiro. She turned in appeal to Kevin. Will you help? The Midkemian rolled his eyes. I'd sooner toy with a relly, he admitted, but fell into step as his mistress left the room. Kiyoke lingered a moment to wish Nakoya a speedy recovery. His courtesy was returned with imprecations. As Mara, Kevin and the Akoma advisor for war beat their retreat down the hallway, the sound of the old woman's coughing followed them. Chumaka, first advisor to Lord Jiro of the Anasati, finished the message. Rings of polished shell flashed on short fingers as he rolled up the scroll and regarded his young master with dispassionate eyes. Seated in comfort in the great hall of the Anasati, Jiro stared into space. Fine hands drummed on the floor beside his cushion, and the sound echoed faintly through the traditional room of parchment-covered doors and beamed ceilings, age dark and waxed to a patina reflected in the parquet floors. On the walls hung a collection of sun-faded war banners, many of them prizes of vanquished enemies, and, at length, the new lord's gaze seemed to focus on these. He raised what seemed a disinterested question. What is your opinion? As strange as it is, my lord, I judge the message sincere. Chumaka made an effort to stay concise. Your father and Lady Mara, while not friendly, had arrived at mutual respect. Jiro's fingers stilled. Father had the happy capacity for seeing things in ways that suited him. He found Mara clever, and that won his admiration. Above anyone, you should know that, Chumaka. Those same qualities gave you your position. Chumaka bowed, though the master's tone implied no compliment. Jiro fingered his embroidered sash, blandly thoughtful. Mara seeks to disarm us. I wonder why. Chumaka weighed his master's intonation carefully. If one were to view this matter in an objective fashion, Lord, one might consider this. Mara feels that there is no real cause for conflict between your house and hers. She implies there may be cause for mutually beneficial negotiations. Despite all care, Jiro bridled. No real cause. His handsome features went blank to hide an unreasoning flash of anger. The death of my brother is not cause. Chumaka laid the scroll on a nearby table as though he stood balanced on a silken cord. The room was airless and hot, and he could not keep from sweating. Buntakapi's death was an excuse he knew too well. As boys, the siblings had been constantly in contention, Bunto frequently bullying and tormenting the less athletic Jiro. 
that Mara had overlooked Jiro and chosen Bunto for her husband had never for a day been forgiven, despite the lady's selection having been determined by flaws, not virtues. She had taken the fool she could exploit above the better man. Yet that distinction held no meaning in terms of childhood rivalry. Bunto had been a ruling lord first, never mind that the prize had been poisoned and that ultimately Jiro lived to inherit the mantle of the Anasati. The wound festered because the young man nursed boyhood grudges. Though he sat in his father's seat, Jiro would not shed the resentment of an upbringing where he continually ranked second, behind the heir Halesco and even behind plodding Bunto. Chumaka knew better than to argue. Unlike his father, the young master was more concerned with being right than with the subtleties of winning the great game. The first adviser tempered his phrases accordingly, as finicky as a cook choosing seasonings. Of course, my lord, the injury still causes pain. Forgive my insensitivity, but I referred more to legal distinctions than to ties of birth. Your brother renounced his allegiance to House Anasati when he assumed the Akoma mantle. In strict interpretation, no harm was done to House Anasati. An Akoma lord died of Mara's machinations. I was remiss not to allow for your personal grief at the loss of a brother. Jiro swallowed frustration that his sly-witted first adviser had outmaneuvered him. At times the man was too crafty. That his worth was incalculable for that reason did not make him any more likable. With a flash of annoyance, Jiro said, You're cunning enough in your own fashion, Chumaka, but I warrant you play the game as much for your own amusement as for the glory of House Anasati. This bit a little too near the bone for Chumaka's liking, even had the remark not come close to an outright accusation of disloyalty. In all ways, I strive for Anasati triumph, Master. Quickly changing the topic, he asked, Shall we send a reply to Mara, Lord? Jiro waved casual assent. Yes, write something suitable. But make it clear I'd as soon rape her while my soldiers burned her house as send her... No, don't put that in. Jiro slapped his thigh, disgusted with the innuendos of politics, when he much preferred to articulate his true feelings on the matter. A smile touched him as he thought of something. No. Thank Mara for her condolences. Then make clear to her that, out of respect for my father... I'll continue to honour his commitment. I will seek no conflict with the Akoma while my nephew lives. After a poisonous pause, Jiro added, But also make it plain that, unlike my father, I will only feel regret if Ayaki dies. If my nephew is threatened, Anasati warriors will not rush to his rescue. Chumaka bowed. I shall word the message in the appropriate manner, Lord. Jiro dismissed his adviser, brusque with impatience to be back to his library. Except when it came to gratification of his passions, the new Lord preferred his collection of book scrolls to politics. Yet the Anasati first adviser showed no trace of disappointment as he hastened back to the cubby that served as his personal quarters. There, seated behind a cramped desk, a clerk scratched figures on a slate and opened ledger by his elbow. On a second desk that overshadowed Chumaka's sleeping mat, documents had already been separated into three piles, messages that were of no immediate concern, those that needed relatively quick attention, and those that required urgency. One note rested alone in the last pile. Chimaka picked it up and perused the contents before he thought to sit down. He scanned the lines twice and then laughed. Ah, ah, at last, after all these years. Turning to the clerk, a young man talented enough to warrant appointment as the first adviser's personal clerk, 
Chimaka said, Mara of the Akoma has been too lucky by anyone's measure since she came to power. Here we see one reason why. The clerk looked myopically at his superior. Sir? Chimaka settled into his favourite seat a cushion so threadbare and faded that the cleaning slave spoke of it as an heirloom. Kavai, my agent in Zulankur, saw a clerk of a factor for the lord of the Minwanabi passing a message to an Akoma servant. What does that tell you? The clerk blinked, always more comfortable with figures than conversation. A spy? Or several. Warmed to his favourite subject, Chumaka shook a demonstrative finger. But, in any event, we know that I was not the only one to insinuate an agent into the house of Minwanabi. Even now that memory was sour, for the talented courtesan sent to Jingu had ultimately become unreliable. Of course, her instability had proven a major factor in Lord Jingu's demise, a good outcome from Chumaka's point of view. Unlike his master, who harboured ill will toward Mara, Chumaka viewed the great game as simply a game, more complex and less predictable than most, and right now the opponent to be wary of was the lord of the Minwanabi. Unlike his predecessors, Tasayo not only had the power of a mighty house, but the wit and talent to use it. He was the most dangerous man in the empire, particularly since Aksantuka had bested him in the contest for the white and gold. For without the duties of warlord to distract him, Tasayo could turn his full attention toward the game. Picking up writing brush and parchment, Chimaka began a line in his elegant style, the characters long and fluid and precise as ones penned by a professional scribe. He mused as he worked. We face a player of unusual talents. Two, actually. For our master burns to humble Mara of the Akoma, as well as Tasayo of the Minwanabi. We must be quick to seize whatever opportunity comes our way. I shall order our man in Sulankur to keep a close watch upon this factor and see if we can begin to trace the route by which messages reach Lady Mara. Chimaka paused and tapped his brush against his chin. I haven't seen this good an operation at play since Jingu obliterated House Taskai. He ruminated further on the past. Too bad their exceptional spy network failed to save them. I presume all their agents died or became grey warriors. Softly, he added, a shame such cunning artistry had to turn to dust. Chumaka sighed in what might have been envy, then ended his sentence with a flourish. Anyway, our young master has decreed that we play a three-handed game very well. We shall do so to the limit of our wits. The triumph is so much more satisfying for the difficulty. To himself, as much as Kavai, Chumaka surmised, it was not because Tekuma was gifted the gods know that the Anasati became the most politically well-connected house in the empire. If Jiro would follow his father's lead and let me do my work without interference. He let the thought trail off. The clerk said nothing. Exposed to this sort of rambling before, he was never entirely sure he understood his supervisor's odd mutterings. An apprentice was not fit to question a journeyman, much less a master such as Chumaka, even if at times the first adviser appeared to hold his own lord in contempt, which of course was impossible. No one with such a wrong-headed attitude could rise to such an exalted place in a great house. Chumaka finished his missive, then said, now to write a response to Lady Mara, enough so that she'll not worry for the time being, but not so much that she'll count the Anasati as a friend. He took a deep breath, then softly, wistfully sighed. Ah, that would be a woman to work with, wouldn't it? 
the clerk left the question unanswered. The formation of blue-clad warriors reached the entrance to the Akoma Estate House. From a distance, Kevin watched as Shinzawai's soldiers saluted, then stood at ease, while their officer mounted the steps in two easy strides to stand before his hostess. He bowed with irresistible charm. You are gracious to receive us, Lady Mara. Kevin felt a twist of black jealousy as Mara warmly smiled in return. Oh, Colonel, you are always welcome. The barbarian's sour expression did not lift as she presented her advisers and counsellors to the Shinzawai retinue. A newcomer stood beside Lujan, and Mara introduced him. This is Sarek. Sarek looked nothing like his cousin, being more muscular and darker, but there was a familiar wry set to his mouth as he said, My lord, and bowed his head slightly. In manner, he and Lujan were nearly twins. Sweating, out of sorts, and still disgruntled by the argument he and Mara had shared upon rising that morning, Kevin lingered at a loose end while the lady led her guest inside and Lujan ordered one of his patrol leaders to escort the Shinzawai warriors to quarters set aside for them. For a week, Kevin had known Hokanu, now heir to the rulership of his house, would be visiting. Mara had been cryptic about the reasons, but gossip around the estate said plainly that the Shinzawai son came to pay court to Mara, seeking an alliance bonded by ties of marriage. Kevin snapped a switch off a tree branch and angrily whacked the heads off a few flowers. The motion pulled at the scars on his back and shoulder. Irrationally, he longed for a practice sword and a few hours of hard physical workout. Yet, despite his heroic defence on Mara's behalf, after the night of the bloody swords, the members of the household behaved as though the incident had never happened. His status remained unchanged, in that he was not trusted to handle even a kitchen knife. Despite his years of association with Mara and her counsellors, the Surani mind adhered to tradition against logic, against feeling, and against even healthy growth. Patrick's obsession with escape held a certain commoner's wisdom, Kevin allowed. He smacked the bud off another flower, then another, and scowled at the row of raised stems that swayed unprotesting at his abuse. He had not checked up on his countrymen in far too long. His self-disgust deepened further when he realised he did not know the work roster. He would have to ask an overseer to find out which field they were assigned to. The stick remained clenched in white fingers as Kevin left the pleasant shade of Mara's gardens and marched through open sunlight in the meadows beyond. He heard the bright trill of her laughter at his back, and then imagined the sound over again as he walked to the distant acres of the Nidra field he had fenced with his companions so many years before. There, Patrick and the sun-browned crew of Midkemians crouched on their knees in the heat, pulling matasha weeds, which choked out the nutritious grass the Nidra required for fattening. Kevin tossed away his stick, vaulted the split-rail fence and jogged across the pasture to where Patrick hunkered down, twisting spiny stalks around his palm, then uprooting them with a jerk from the stubborn earth. The broad-shouldered former fighter had weathered to the colour of old leather under the hotter Surani sky. His eyes had developed a permanent squint. Without looking up, he said, Thought you might pay us a visit. Kevin knelt down at Patrick's side and companionably hauled up a weed. And why is that? You'll slit the skin on your fingers doing it that way, Patrick observed. Got to break the fibres of the stalks first, like this. He demonstrated, with hands welted with brown calluses. Then picked up his former train of thought. You usually tend to remember us when you've had a row with your lady friend. And what makes you think I've had a row? Unamused, Kevin tugged at another weed. Well... For one thing, you're here, old son. The older fighter sat back a moment and wiped sweat from his temple on his bare shoulder. For another, she's got a gentleman caller from the talk going around. At a shout from the other side of the field, Patrick bunched his shoulders. Slave master's expecting us to work, old son. 
he shuffled forward on his knees and grasped another stalk. Have you noticed, though, the plants here never stop looking wrong? Kevin ripped out a large matasha weed and inspected it. Nothing like this at home. The broad leaves flared out from willowy stalks, orange-tinged at the edges and veined in faint lavender. Patrick jerked his thumb at the pasture. But this grass, just like ours in Mikamia, well, most of it anyway. Timothy, Roy, Alfalfa, though the runts have odd names for them. He peered at Kevin. Do you find it strange, old son? Have you ever wondered how things could be so much alike, yet so different? Kevin paused and ruefully inspected a cut on the heel of his hand. It makes my head hurt sometimes. These people... Yes, there's more of a puzzle, Patrick interrupted. Sometimes the Shirani are cruel, and others tender as babes. They've got natures as tangled as goblins. Kevin blotted blood on his trousers and reached for another weed. Wreck your hands doing that. You're not used to work, Patrick chided. Then, in a lowered voice, he added, We've been laying about for a year since you got back, Kevin. Some of the boys are thinking it's better to leave you behind. Discomforted by runnels of sweat that soaked his shirt, Kevin sighed. You still thinking about escape? Patrick looked hard at his countryman. I'm a soldier boy. I'm not sure I'd rather die than grub around in the dirt, but I know I'd rather fight. Kevin tucked at his collar laces, exasperated. Fight whom? Whoever comes after us. Patrick hauled another weed. Anybody who tries to stop us. Kevin shrugged his shirt off over his shoulders. The hot sun burned on his back. I've talked to a few of the boys around here who were grey warriors before swearing loyalty to Mara. Those mountains aren't so friendly. The poor sods already living up there aren't eating well. Patrick scratched his beard. Well, I'll admit the kit got better since you put a word in, but it's still no banquet. Kevin grinned. When was it, you old fraud? The best meal you ever ate was in an alehouse in Yarbon. The reference to the past brought no smile, not even a counter-thrust of teasing. Patrick wrapped another tough stalk around his fist, yanked and tossed the uprooted plant aside. The leaves seemed to wilt within minutes under the Sirani sun, unlike the men who might waste away for years longing for the homes and the freedom they had lost. Kevin looked at the distant mountains, a soft blue outline against the alien green of the sky. He sighed. I know. His cut stung unmercifully as he reached for another weed. Some odd events happened in Kentasani last year. Patrick spat. There's always some nod going on. Kevin put a hand on his friend's shoulder. No, I mean something... <sighs> I don't know if I can tell you. It's a feeling. When all that trouble erupted at the Imperial Games, if you mean the barbarian magician who freed those slaves, that's done nothing to change our lot. Patrick moved ahead to the next patch of ground. That's not the point, Kevin protested, hooking his shirt and following. Slaves were freed in a culture that doesn't have the notion of manumission. From the word up river... Those men are just living in the Holy City, doing this and that, but counted free men. Patrick's hands paused on a weed stem. If a man was to slip free here and get up the Gaga Jin... No, Kevin said more sharply than he intended. That's not my thought. I don't want to live as a fugitive. I'd rather pursue the idea that what's been done once might be repeated. Are you allowed to carry a sword? Patrick asked bitterly. No, and there's my point. You won't see plain. You rescued the mistress fine and good, and when the crisis is over, it's back to being a slave. Touched on a sore spot, Kevin took out his temper on a weed, then cursed as he received another cut. Give it up, old son, Patrick said angrily. 
The runts are tough as their plants when it comes to given ground. Show them change and they pick suicide. Kevin stood up. But the great ones are outside the law. The warlord, even the emperor, cannot gainsay their will. Maybe now that a magician's freed slaves, a lord can go against tradition and do the same. But no matter what else, if you get yourself hanged for a runaway, you're dead. And that's not freedom by my way of thinking. Patrick let out a bitter laugh. That's truth. Well, I'll wait a bit. Though how long, I can't say. Satisfied with that answer, but left disgruntled by Patrick's blunt reiteration of other thorny facts, Kevin tossed his shirt over his shoulder. He gathered the wilting weeds into a bundle and flung them onto the pile by the fence. His cut hands burned, but his feelings stung more. His fellow Midkemians gave him barely a grunt of notice as he passed on his way from the meadow. In turn, he hardly noticed them, his mind absorbed by the memory of Mara's laughter in the garden where she sat with Hokanu. The heat of midday drove Mara and Hokanu from the garden to a little used sitting room in the estate house, one that had stayed unchanged since her mother's time. There, in an airy chamber with pastel pillows and gauze drapes, the couple sat down to a light lunch, cooled by a slave with a fan of shatterbird feathers. Hokanu had changed from full armour to a light robe that showed off his handsome build. To the fine bones and graceful carriage, time on the practice field had added firm fitness. He wore few rings and only a necklace of kokara shell, but the simplicity of his dress and ornament merely emphasised his natural elegance. He sipped his wine and nodded. Mm, exceptional, Lady Mara. You provide gracious hospitality. His dark eyes met hers, not playful or teasing as Kevin's might be, but deep with a mystery that Mara felt compelled to explore. Unwittingly, she found herself smiling. His features were beautiful, without being either delicate or overdrawn, and the way he looked her directly in the eye touched off a deep response. Intuitively, Mara sensed she could trust this Shinzawai son. The feeling was unique, even startling, after the endless political innuendos that complicated communication with others in her rank. Aware she had been staring and had forgotten to reply to his compliment, Mara hid a blush by sipping at her goblet. I'm glad the wine pleases you. I will confess that... I left the matter of choosing the vintage to my Hadonra. He has an unfailing instinct. Then I am flattered that he brought out your finest, Hokanu said smoothly. As he regarded her, he seemed to see past the way her hair was arranged and more than the cut of her robes. On an intuition akin to Arakasi's, he reached past nuance to touch her heart. You are a lady with an instinct for clear vision. Did you know I shared your distaste for caged birds? Caught by surprise, Mara laughed. How did you know? Hakanu twirled his wine glass. Your expression when you described Lady Isashani's sitting room in the Imperial Palace. Also, Jikan once mentioned a suitor had sent you a leebird. It lasted two weeks, he said, before you set it free. Unwittingly reminded of her piercing frustration concerning Kevin's dilemma, Mara strove not to frown. You are most observant. Something I said troubled you. Hokanu set aside his glass. He leaned forward on his cushion and laid a narrow hand on the table. I'd like to know. Mara made a gesture of frustration. Just a concept introduced by a barbarian. Their society is filled with fascinating concepts, Hakanu said, his rich, dark eyes still on her. At times, they make us seem like stubborn, backward children, entrenched in our ways to the point of blindness. 
you have made a study of them. Mara said, intrigued and openly showing as much before she thought to guard her face. Hakanu seemed not to care, for the subject fascinated him also. There was more to the Emperor's failed peace effort than our people understand. Then, as if regretting that mention of politics might sunder their moments of rapport, the Shinzawai heir brushed the matter aside. Forgive me. I did not mean to remind you of difficult times. My father understood that you had a beleaguered knight in the Imperial Palace. He said it was to the honour of the Akoma that you survived. Before Mara could wave the comment away, he gave her that direct look which unnervingly stripped away her reserve. He added, I should like very much to hear what happened from your own lips. And Mara saw his hand move slightly on the tabletop. With the uncanny perception she seemed to share with him, she knew he longed to take her in his arms. Tremors touched her as she imagined the firm feel of his warrior's body. He was more than attractive to her. He understood her with none of the cultural barriers or emotional raw edges that spiced her relationship with Kevin. Where the barbarian reacted to her dark Tsurani nature and brought her relief through humour, this man across from her would simply know, and his unstated promise to protect became a potent combination. Again, Mara realised she was staring, and that some sort of reply to his request was required if the emotional temper of their meeting was not to overturn into passion. I remember a lot of burst bird cages, she said with a forced attempt at lightness. Lord Hopara joined his forces with mine, and the attackers who stormed his apartment found no victims to hack up. They spent their fury on Isashani's lee-birds and a good deal of purple upholstery. The next day, the ladies' bird-catchers ran their legs off chasing fugitives. Disappointed to be diverted from the personal side of the issue, Hakanu's brows twitched into the faintest of frowns. His eyes had an exotic tilt, and the expression made him look haunted. Lady Mara, he said softly, and his intonation caught her like an ice-cold chill in the heat. I may be overbold in presenting myself in this fashion, but circumstances in the Empire have forced changes none of us could have anticipated even a few short months ago. Mara set down her wine to hide the slight shake in her hands. She knew, oh, she knew what he was leading up to, and the feelings that warred inside her were too wild a tangle to sort out. Lamely, she said, What do you mean? Hokanu read her confusion as plainly as if she had shouted. He leaned forward on his cushion for emphasis. My brother was lost upon the other side of the rift, and I am left to assume rulership from my father some day. Mara nodded, her own emotions twisted tighter by the grief she sensed inside him, left over from Kasumi's sudden loss. The boys had been raised as brothers, and Hokanu's pain ran deep. When I first met you, Hokanu overcame his inner sorrow, and his lips curled wryly in a smile. I will confess, lady, I felt regret when I first saw you. Startled into the release of sudden laughter, Mara said, You have an odd manner of making a compliment, Hokanu. His smile broadened, and his eyes lit in shared pleasure as he saw the flush on her face. I should rephrase that, lovely lady. My regret was particularly fierce, because the occasion happened to be your wedding. Mara's expression changed to bittersweet reflection. There was a great deal of regret involved with that marriage, Hokanu. And the thrill happened again, with the unspoken knowledge that he knew without her needing to explain. Mara. He said the word as gentle as a caress. We both owe a duty to our ancestors. 
I grew up knowing that my lot lay in improving the relationships of my family through marriage. I always assumed my father would match me with the daughter of some lord or another. But now... Mara finished his thought. Now you are heir to the rulership of an honoured house. Hokanu's relief was palpable. And other considerations are at play. Mara knew a surge of hope, mingled with aching disappointment, that perhaps she had misread him after all. He did care for her, and he knew how his presence affected her, and he was kindly, carefully trying to disengage his attention without hurting her feelings. I know that political considerations might interfere with the interests of your heart. She offered back in an attempt to smooth his difficulty. Mara, before, when I came to call upon you, I cherished the hope that you might petition my father, asking for me as a consort. His hesitancy cleared like clouds before sunlight, and the mischief in his eyes made him radiant. The role of ruling lady and second son forced that silence upon me. Now, as heir, I can propose a different arrangement. Mara's smile faded. He was not going to tell her politely that he could no longer pay her court. Instead, he was leading up to a proposal. Panicked, caught where she was vulnerable, and shoved hard against the thornier issue of how to resolve her future with Kevin, she fought for presence and poise. What have you in mind? Hokanu hesitated, which was very unlike him. He sensed her confusion and was puzzled as to its cause. That necessitated a change in wording, and his hand braced instinctively against the table edge, as though he expected a blow. I ask this informally, for if you say no, I would not wish a public rejection, but if you wish... I shall have my father's first adviser pay a formal call upon your first adviser to make arrangements for our meeting. He almost laughed, and his strong, direct nature reasserted itself. <laughs> I ramble. Marry me, Mara. Someday Ayaki will be lord of the Akoma, and your second son, our son, could wear the mantle of the Shinzawai. I should like nothing better than to have you by my side as lady, and know that two ancient houses will one day be ruled by brothers. Mara shut her eyes against a tide of confusion. As well as she knew Hokanu, as powerfully as she was drawn by his charm, the idea of marriage churned up her feelings like a storm. She had sensed that this moment was inevitable, and had falsely sought shelter behind a belief that Hakanu's elevation to airship might spare her, as political considerations forced him to seek a match with better connections. No amount of rational thought had prepared her for this reality. She felt Hokanu's eyes on her face, felt his unspoken sharing of the turbulences his words had aroused, and, in that graceful way that unerringly shattered her defences, he came to her rescue. I've surprised you. Apology coloured his tone. You must not feel discomforted. Let me withdraw and allow you time to think. He arose in consideration of her, every inch of him lordly. Lady, whatever you decide, do not fear for my feelings in the matter. I love you with all honour, but I also love you for yourself. I would cherish no minute that did not bring pleasure in my company. Seek your own happiness, Lady Mara. I am man enough to find my own. Speechless, gripping her hands together in a misery of pent-up emotion, Mara raised her eyes to find him gone. She had not heard his steps as he went. She had to look twice to make certain the sitting room was empty. She reached out with trembling fingers, caught up her wine glass and drained it. Then she stared at the empty goblet and the untouched plates of light lunch. 
Kevin's face mingled with Hokanu's in her memory until she wanted to howl her frustration at the walls. There was no choosing between them, none, and the quandary of love and honourable political necessity ripped at her like thorns. Dear gods, what a tangle, she murmured, and only belatedly realised she was no longer alone. In true and gallant solicitude, Hokanu had sent her adviser to comfort and steer her through the awkwardness of the moment. Still weak after her illness, Nikoya shook her head, indicating Mara should hold off speech. Come, the old woman said brusquely. Let's go back to your private quarters and out of these formal robes. When you are more comfortable and settled, we can talk. Mara allowed herself to be shepherded to her feet. She followed Nikoya's lead down corridors without seeing where she was going or noticing the floor beneath her feet. Someone has seen to Hakanu's needs, she said in a voice that sounded limp. Sarik has done so. Lujan will be organising some contests at arms among the warriors. Nikoya whipped open the screen to Mara's chambers and rallied half a score of maids and servants. Bathwater, she rapped out, and something light and comfortable for the mistress to put on afterwards. Mara stood with her arms woodenly outstretched as her attendants unfastened the wood peg and cord loop fasteners of her formal robe. This is impossible, she exclaimed. The time is all wrong. Nikoya clicked her tongue. The Shinzawai are an ancient family with honours to equal most, but their part in the aborted attempt to force peace upon the Empire. Bemused by this switch to hardcore politics, Mara stepped out of the heavy robe. She moved mechanically into the cool bath prepared by her servants and sat shivering in reaction as two maids sponged her back. What's the matter with me? Why can't I just tell him no and put the issue from my mind? Nakoya answered obliquely, Daughter, there is no sure way to rule the heart. My heart is not in this. Mara fired back with a sharpness that itself was a contradiction. What is Hokanu to me but a means to an end? The first adviser seated herself on a cushion and wrapped gnarled fingers around her knees. She said nothing, while Mara endured a bath she did not enjoy. She arose at the appropriate moment and stepped out of the water and stood with a scowl while her maids toweled her dry. Nakoya did not break silence until another maid arrived with a light lounging robe. Mistress, the Shinzawai have been among the most honourable families in the Empire in my memory and the memory of my father. The old Lord Shatai, Kamatsu's father, was war chief of the Kanazawai when a Keda lord last sat upon the warlord's throne and no one has ever heard of either Shinzawai lord breaking a bond. Their honour is unquestioned. Mara knew all this. As the maids tied her robe, she regarded her former nurse with bitten-back exasperation. But their position at the moment is questionable. Many resentments linger since the failed peace and the night of the bloody swords. Nakoya agreed. Many of the families left grieving insist that murder would never have happened had the Blue Wheel, and especially the Shinzawai, not been at the heart of the Emperor's plottings. But Mara did not need reminding that it was only because so many were injured and everyone was being cautious that no one had sought retribution upon the Shinzawai. To bind her family to them through a marriage would be to add names to her list of dangerous enemies. No, Mara decided, as Nakoya's obvious reasoning led her from mixed emotions to clear thought. The heart of the matter was another thing altogether. 
Hakanu was attractive enough. Her deep involvement with Kevin added painful confusion, yet she had never fooled herself into the false hope that love could replace a slave with a husband. Her turmoil stemmed from another truth, that she was loath to yield control of her life to any ruling lord. Buntakapi's brief tenure had left only ugly memories, but that was not all. Mara sighed and stared through the open screen into the garden. The day was drawing on, and long shadows striped the path between the Arkasi rows. The rich green land that had been her father's and her ancestors before his had prospered well over the years since a young girl came into an inheritance beyond her years and experience. In the light of her successes, Mara examined a deeper truth, altogether less tangled than any conflict in her life, past or present. After a long minute, she said to Nokoya, Thank you for your counsel. You may go now. As the old woman bowed and departed, Mara reflected. So many events in her life were the result of her being ruling lady. Yet the duties, the awesome responsibility, even the danger that came her way, these things were not the fearful burden they had appeared on the day she had left Lashima's temple. Since she had assumed the Akoma mantle, she had come to enjoy her power, to revel in pitting her wits against the machinations of the great game. These things gave her freedom to pursue new ideas. What would it be like to leave the decisions to others, she wondered. Could she be as content collecting leebirds, ornamenting sitting rooms, or matchmaking as other ladies were? Women held power in their own right, sometimes with impressive results. Could she do as Isashani of the Zakatekas and take as much satisfaction in by-play behind the scenes as she did now in the seat of unquestioned command? Mara sighed again. That moment, a shadow fell across the screen that led from the garden. I know what you're thinking, a familiar voice intruded from beyond. Mara glanced up to find Kevin watching her, a wry grin on his face. He voiced an opinion, as he always did, without waiting for her invitation. You're wondering what it would be like to take a rest and let this young warrior of the Shinzawai run things. Startled to laughter, Mara said, You monster! Kevin threw himself down next to her, flung back red-gold hair that was in sore need of trimming, and paused with his mouth inches away from hers. I'm right? She kissed him. Hokanu's charms she could resist, but this man was a poison in her blood. Yes, damn you! I'll tell you exactly what it would be like. Dull. Kevin made a sweeping gesture that wound up catching her into an embrace. He kissed her back. You love being in command. I never wished for the Akoma mantle, she responded in warning sharpness. I know, he said easily, not rising to her challenge. That doesn't change the fact that you love it. Mara allowed herself a self-indulgent grimace. Nobody asked your opinion. She had not denied his statement. To Kevin, that was as good as an admission he was right. As she leaned back, contented against his shoulder, he pursued his conclusion ruthlessly. The man you caught is no weakling. Once he was husband, he'd be in command, and, unless I misunderstand Surani tradition, you'd be forever denied rulership. Grinning evilly, Kevin asked, So, are you going to marry him? Mara reached up, grabbed two fistfuls of red beard and pulled teasingly. Fool! Before he could howl, she released him half laughing. I might. When his eyes widened, she added, But not yet. The political timing is wrong, and there remain a few things to attend first. Like what? asked Kevin, in sudden humorless concern, only partially aware that his banter had masked a gnawing uncertainty. 
Mara's face turned grim. Like the destruction of Tasayo of the Minwanabi? The table was festive. Paper lanterns shed arrows of light through pierced patterns and raised rich ruby highlights in the wine the servants had left with the meal. The plates and cutlery were the finest the closets could offer, yet neither Mara nor her guest cared to finish the last of the sweet cakes and sauce. Hokanu sat at ease on his cushions, but his attitude of relaxation was feigned. I understand, of course. His tone was mild, unsurprised, and utterly clean of resentment. Yet Mara knew him well enough to see the small, quiet interval he had taken to muster his poise in the moment that followed her refusal, for political considerations, of his informal offer of marriage. He was not distressed, at least not with the enraged bitterness Jiro had shown when she chose his brother, nor the kicked dog hurt Kevin exhibited in his dark moods, but he felt a genuine pain at being rejected. Not unexpectedly, his sadness made her ache. Please, she added, with less impassivity than she intended, you must know my heart. Hokanu glanced down at his hands, which were still and rested half-curled around his wine goblet. Impulsively, Mara wished she could reach across the table and take his long, fine fingers into her own. But that would be awkward, if not improper. She was not agreeing to become his wife. Yet she could not entirely hide her regret. I admire you more than you know. You are everything I could ask for in a father for my children. But we both rule. Our house would be an armed camp. Where would we live? Upon this estate surrounded by soldiers not loyal to you? On your father's estate, with soldiers not loyal to me? Can we ask men sworn to our family Natamis to obey those of another house, Hokanu? The sound of his name, as only she could say it, raised a bittersweet smile, and her words brought a surprised lift of his brows. Mara, I assumed you would come and live with me upon my father's estate, and that we would appoint someone you chose to act as regent for Ayaki until he came to his majority. Hokanu made a disparaging gesture, aimed entirely at himself. Lady... Forgive me for thoughtless presumption. I should have anticipated that you of all women would not react in the time-honoured customary fashion. His expression turned dry with irony. I have admired your free spirit. To make an ordinary wife of you would be like caging a leebird. I see that now. He was beautiful. "'spangled in lamplight, with his eyes deep as the forest pools sacred to priests. "'Mara drew a deep breath to steady herself. "'You assumed, Hakanu, but that was no grave fault. "'Before she realised she had indulged herself, "'she reached across the table and touched his hand. "'His skin was very warm, each tendon delineated clearly. All these problems would be solved if Tasayo of the Minwanabi did not loom like a sword over my neck. If you and your family had not stood at the heart of the Emperor's plan to force peace upon the High Council. If Hokanu's other hand moved and closed gently over hers. His expression shifted subtly toward not anger or pain, but rather deep interest. Go on. If we lived in a place... She hesitated, unsure how to phrase a concept largely inspired by Kevin. Where law ruled in deed as well as word. Where politics did not countenance murder. She paused and realised on the moment that his silence was a reflection of her own. That the hand upon her hand had tightened with shared resentment against the ingrained flaws in their culture she herself had reluctantly come to recognise. The easy rapport disturbed her, 
and to set it at a distance she focused only on words. If we lived at a time when we knew our children could grow without knives behind every door, then, Hokanu of the Shinzawai, I would be deeply honoured to become your wife. There is no man in the empire I would rather have as the father of my next child. She looked away from him, fearful that his presence would tempt her to further breaches in protocol. But, until the council is more settled, and things as we know them are different, a union between us would bring risk to both of our houses. Hokanu was silent. He caressed her hand as he released her and said nothing until she turned back to him, that he might face her squarely. You are wise beyond your years, Lady Mara. I cannot pretend I am not disappointed. I can only admire your staunchness. He tilted his head fractionally to one side. Your rare strength makes you all the more to be cherished. Mara found moisture in her eyes. Kanu, some daughter of another house will be a lucky woman. Okanu bowed at the compliment. Such a daughter must be more than lucky before she could displace my feelings for you. Before I go, may I at least know that you look favourably upon friendship with the Shinzawai? Assuredly, she said, giddy with relief that he had not been angry or let her rebuff displace courtesy. More than she realised, she had been afraid her refusal might turn him against her. I would cherish that as a privilege. Count it a gift, Hokanu said, one you are worthy of. He sipped the last swallow of his wine, then smoothly prepared to take his leave. Mara forestalled him as much to delay the unhappy moment of his leaving. If you would allow, I would beg a favour. He paused balanced in the instant of rising. His dark eyes searched her, honestly, without suspicion that she might use his weakness for her to gain her own ends, but in an intense desire to fathom her motives. Mara read his look and knew at heart how alike they were. Both of them had an instinct for the great game and the will to play the stakes fully. Hokanu said, What would you ask, Lady Mara? She strove to lighten her manner while weighing how to broach an awkward subject. It is my understanding that a great one calls frequently at your home. Hokanu nodded, his face now expressionless. This is true. Across a pained stillness, Mara added, I very much desire to have an informal talk with such a personage. If you could facilitate a meeting, I would count myself in your debt. Hokanu's eyes narrowed slightly, but he did not voice his curiosity about Mara's motives. I shall see what I can do. Then he did rise, briskly, and gave her a formal bow in farewell, along with graceful phrases. Mara rose also, saddened that the mood of intimacy had been broken. His charm was all on the surface now, and try though she might, she could not read deeper. When he was gone, she sat in the light of the paper lanterns, turning and turning her wine glass in her hands. She could not recall his last words, but only that he had masked his emotions all too well. The cushions across the table seemed something more than empty, and the night a bit more than dark. In time, Nakoya came, as Mara expected she might. The old woman's instincts were unerring. After a look at her mistress, the old woman sat down at her side. Daughter of my heart, you look troubled. Mara leaned against the older woman, allowing herself to be hugged as if she were a girl once again. Nakoya, I did as I must. Rejecting Hokanu's suit. But I am disturbed by a sadness that has no cause. I would not have thought I could love Kevin as deeply as I do, yet 
feel sorrow at declining Hokanu's proposal. Nikoya raised a hand and gently stroked Mara's cheek, as she had through painful years of growing. Dota, the heart can hold more than one. Each of these men has his place in it. Mara sighed, allowing herself a moment of comfort in the old woman's arms. Then she smiled ruefully. You always warned me that love was a tangle. I never understood until now just how much of one and how many were the thorns. At the sound of the gong, Mara stiffened. Kevin had just begun to slide his hand down her back, but warm flesh slid away and suddenly eluded his fingers. Left entangled in bedclothes, Kevin found himself alone. Belatedly, he realised that never before had he heard the tone that had roused her. Glancing up from the sleeping mat, he said, What is it? His sleepy question tangled with a flurry of activity as the door to Mara's quarters slid open and two maids hurried in with combs and pins. Others followed, flinging open the wardrobe, and within an instant the mistress was inundated with formal robes, dresses, and women who started to comb out the hair left must from the bed. Kevin frowned. Shaken rudely from a pleasant interlude, he realised his lady had spoken no word to order such an untimely invasion. "'What's going on?' he inquired, loudly enough that this time he was noticed. "'A great one comes!' Mara said impatiently, then followed with instructions for her maids on which jewellery she would wear with her formal gown. I want the iron necklace for this occasion, and also the jade tiara. At this hour? asked Kevin, heaving himself off the mat. He picked up his grey robe and wrapped it around himself. From the centre of the activity, Mara released a sigh of exasperation. Most days I would already have been an hour out of bed. Well, said Kevin, clearly the guilty party. He had done his best to detain her, and at first his efforts had been reciprocated willingly. Do forgive the inconvenience. His tone was light, but he was plainly confused by her sudden departure from his arms. Mara let the maids fuss over her pins and her sash. Great ones have no time to spare for vagaries. She seemed ready to add more, but at a second stroke of the gong, the softness that started to become a smile vanished. Enough! The Great One is here! The maids backed away and made their bows, while their mistress stood, satisfied that her hair was bound up simply but in neat fashion, with four pins holding the arrangement. The rare metal jewellery and jade tiara were enough to let this Great One know she did not take his coming lightly. As she thrust on her slippers and headed for the door, her slave reflexively began to follow. No, you may not come. Kevin began an immediate protest, and Mara said, Silence! If this magician decided you had slighted him in any fashion, he could order the death of every member of this house. I would be obliged to do as he bid, no matter what the cost. A great one's words are as law. Knowing this... I refuse to risk your unguarded tongue within earshot of him. She permitted no more argument, but hurried through the door and crossed the courtyard to another wing. There lay a small, five-sided room without furnishing or ornament, beyond a shatterbird inlaid in onyx in the floor. The chamber had not been used in her lifetime, but every household had a similar room or nook or alcove with a clear symbol set into the floor. Any magician in the Empire could focus his will upon the pattern of that house and call at whim. Such an arrival was traditionally announced by the gong tone, sent by magical means to the location where a great one intended to appear. A second chime signalled arrival, and that had occurred several minutes past. In the chamber, Mara found Nakoya, Kiyoke and Sarek already standing before a stern-looking man in a black robe. She bowed deeply as she reached the door. Great one, forgive my lack of promptness in greeting you. I was but half-dressed when you arrived. 
The man inclined his head, as if the matter held little consequence. He was of gaunt build and medium height, and, though the robe concealed details, something about his carriage seemed familiar. "'Through the agency of one for whom I have some affection, "'it has come to my attention that you desire to speak with me.' "'The voice clued her. "'Though older, this magician had the same rich intonation that Hakanu did. "'Mara's eyes opened slightly. "'This was none other than Fumita, the Shinzawai heir's blood father. "'Hokanu had taken her request very personally indeed.' and it would seem her hunch was correct that some tie to family yet remained between this member of the assembly and the Shinzawai. Yet Mara dared not speculate openly. If they chose, magicians were capable of knowing the minds of those in their presence. She could not disallow the part that magic had played in the downfall of Jingu of the Minwanabi. Politely, she said, Great one, I need the wisdom of one such as yourself to serve the Empire. The man nodded. Then we shall speak. Mara excused her advisers and led the way through a screen onto an adjacent porch furnished with low stone benches. As Fumita took a seat, Mara stole the moment to study him. His hair was deep brown, shot with the beginnings of grey. The face was clean-lined and angular, and the nose more aquiline than the sun's. The dark eyes were markedly similar, except that in the Great One the depths of mystery were veiled and unfathomable. He rested himself upon a stone bench. Mara chose a seat opposite, a narrow path separating them. "'What do you wish to discuss?' Fumita asked. "'A matter weighs upon me, Great One.' Mara began. She took a deep breath and searched for a proper beginning. Like many, I was in attendance at the Imperial Games. If the Great One had any feelings left over from that day, he kept them masked. His piercing attentiveness unnerved her worse than Hokanu's directness. He was not unapproachable, but neither did he warm into welcome. Yes, it is said that the Great One who was the centre of the disruption freed the competents who refused to fight. This is true. Non-committal still, Fumita waited for Mara to continue. He could not have made himself more plain had he spoken. She would have to plunge ahead on her own and risk the consequences. This is my concern, Mara said. If a great one may free slaves, then who else may? The emperor? The warlord? A ruling lord? The magician said nothing for some time. During an interval that felt as strange as the isolation a fish might feel in a pond, Mara was aware of the breeze across the porch and of a servant making the rounds of the estate house. Down the path, the broom strokes of a slave who was sweeping sounded preternaturally loud. These things were part of her world, yet somehow seemed sealed away as the eyes of the magician remained pinned unwaveringly upon her. When Fumita spoke at last, his tone had not altered. The words remained inflectionless and bitten off sharply. Mara of the Akoma, your question shall be raised in the assembly. Without further words, and before she could proffer reply, he reached into the pocket at his belt and removed a small metal object. Mara had no chance to express curiosity, even had she dared, before he ran his thumb across the surface of the talisman. The gesture seemed like one he had made many times. A faint buzzing suddenly surrounded him. Then the magician vanished. The stone bench stood empty, and an eddy of air teased the trappings of Mara's robe. Left open-mouthed and distinctly at a loss, Mara shivered slightly. She frowned as if the space where the magician had sat might answer her dissatisfaction. She had never tried dealing with a great one beyond that single encounter which had finalised Lord Jingu's demise. This was the first time she had tried an overture on her own initiative, 
and the aftermath left her unsettled. There was no fathoming the ways of the assembly. She shivered again and wished herself back in her blankets with Kevin. Chapter 21 Keeper of the Seal The barge docked. Seated on cushions beneath the canopy with a cup of fruit juice in her hand, Mara squinted against the morning sunlight reflected off the water. Rocked by the rhythm of the pole men as they expertly manoeuvred her craft through the press of commercial boats at the wharf, the lady recalled Nakoya's disapproval of her trip to Kentasani. Yet, looking over the traffic that jammed the dockside and counting the merchant barges at anchor waiting to unload, Mara judged Arakasi's assessment was the correct one. At least on the streets and public squares, the city had recovered from the chaos let loose upon it at the Imperial Games six months before. To Mara, this seemed an opportune time to return to the Holy City. Nakoya was right to suspect that Mara's motive, visiting a minor political opponent to change his alliance, was deeper, but Mara revealed her thoughts to no one. Once her barge tied up to the wharf, she surrendered her abandoned fruit juice to a servant, called for her litter, and assembled her honour guard. She had brought only twenty-five warriors in her retinue. Her stop was intended to be brief, and she was not worried about assassins. Both the assembly and the emperor were likely to look disfavourably on public disorder. Any killing by a tong in the emperor's city would bring a much deeper investigation than any family would risk at this time. Except for a minimum of servants and her boat crew, Mara had only Kevin and Arakasi in attendance. The heat was already stifling. As the Akoma guards began the chore of clearing traffic from the lady's intended path, Kevin pushed back damp hair from his brow. So, why did you really make this trip? Dressed in a finer robe than she usually chose for street travel, Mara looked between the curtains of her litter, which were cracked open, to admit the relief of the passing breeze. You asked Arakasi that scarcely an hour ago. And he told me the same lie, that we're going to pay a social call on Lord Kugan Chalt of the Ginecho. I don't believe it. Mara extended her fan through the curtains and tapped his wrist in reproof. Were you a free man? I would be obliged to challenge that statement. To accuse me of lying is to insult a coma honour. Kevin caught the fan, playfully disarmed her, and returned the item with an exaggerated flourish, in imitation of a Surani suitor of a lesser house paying court to a lady of higher station. You didn't lie exactly, he admitted, and grinned as Mara smothered a laugh at his clowning behind her now-opened fan. He paused a step, reminded of how dear she was to him. Then he doggedly pursued the subject. You just didn't tell what's on your mind. The litter-bearers turned a corner and swerved to avoid a stray dog being chased by street urchins. They were after the bone it had stolen and were moving too fast and chaotically for her soldiers to change their course. As always... Kevin noticed their poor clothes and evidence of sores and sickness upon them and felt sad. He only half heard Mara's explanation. Lord Kugan Chout was an important, if minor, ally of the Lord of the Akamchi and the Lord of the Inradaka. Those two held sway in a small faction allied firmly against her since her winning of the Chojar Queen from a hive near Inradaka lands. She allowed that a contact with the Ginecho would at least give her an opportunity to explain her side of the dispute, perhaps even to drive a wedge between the Ginecho and the two disaffected lords. House Ginecho took heavy losses with Almecho's fall, Mara qualified. They were heavily indebted to the Omechan and the warlord's two disgraces caused the debts all to come due much earlier than our lord of the Ginecho could have expected. He died, it is said, of the strain though others whisper suicide. Still others claim poison was set in his dish by an enemy. Whatever the reason, his young son, Gugan Chalt, has inherited his mantle, along with a heavy financial burden. I judge this an auspicious time for an overture. 
Kevin's lips thinned in annoyance. She said this though she knew he had been present when Arakasi allowed that Kuganchout's court was riddled through with cousins who were Ikamchi and Inradaka loyalists, a few of whom probably had orders to commit murder should the inexperienced boy act in any way to the detriment of his two allies. Kevin had commented that a few might be motivated to speed the young lord along to the halls of the Red God without any urging from Mara's two enemies. Nakoya warned Mara that entering Kuganchout's townhouse would be stepping into a nest of swamp rally. Mara, she berated, was deaf to good advice when larger issues were on her mind. As litter and bearers rounded another corner and sunlight fell through the curtains, Kevin became aware that the lady was looking at him. Too often he had the feeling she could read his thoughts from his face and this was one such time. The Ginecho would expect us to try to rearrange their alliance, she pointed out with mischievous gentleness. Ekanchi went to such trouble to buy the loyalty of so many members of Kuganchout's family, and Inradaka underwrote most of the expense. They would all be terribly disappointed if the Akoma failed to put in an appearance. We will go and give them what they want, which is belief in their own self-importance. Inradaka and Ekanchi must always be led to believe that their enmity is of some consequence. It keeps them from allying with my other enemies. Gods help us if they discover the truth, that the Akoma have gained enough standing that their minor plotting has no impact. Then they might brew worse mischief than they do already, just to attract attention, or do something really destructive, such as throwing their support to Tasayo. Kevin snorted out a laugh. You mean you're going to pat the little guy with a grudge on the head just to keep him from getting really irate in case he thinks you've forgotten he's got bones to pick so he doesn't get nasty and go out and find a bigger bone to pick? Inelegantly spoken, Mara said. But yes. Kevin swore in mid -Camion. Somewhat nettled, Mara twitched the curtains back. That's rude. Now, what do you mean? Her barbarian lover gave her a long look and shrugged. In polite language, your great game of the council ingests water from an infested swamp. One could say it quite often borders on the absurd. I was afraid you were going to say that. Mara leaned an elbow on her cushions and gazed at one of the huge stone temples that bordered both sides of the avenue. Kevin followed her glance, by now well enough first in the Surani pantheon to recognise the Temple of Lashima, goddess of wisdom. Here, he recalled, Mara had spent months in study in the hope of taking vows of service. The deaths of her father and brother had drastically changed that fate. As though her own reminiscence followed his into the past, Mara said, You know, I miss the quiet. Then she smiled. But nothing else, really. The temple priestesses are even more bound to tradition and ritual than the great houses are. Now I cannot imagine being happy with such a life. She tipped a wicked glance at Kevin. And certainly I would have missed out on some very enjoyable bed sport. Well, said Kevin, running irreverent eyes over the walls that surrounded the temple grounds. Maybe not, given luck, a length of stout rope and a determined man. He bent over, cupped her chin and kissed her as they walked along. I'm a very determined man. From the other side of the litter, Arakasi shot the couple a black look. You never will act the proper slave, Mara murmured. I suppose we shall have to look over the precedent set in the arena by the great one who was your countryman and seek a legal way to set you free. Kevin missed a step. That's why we're back in Kentasani. You're going to look up the fine points of the law and see what's changed since the games. He strode out, 
re-established position at Mara's side and grinned. Patrick might forget himself and kiss you. Mara made a face. That would certainly earn him a beating. The man never bathes. Shaking her head, she added, No, that's not my reason for being here. If we can find the time, we'll visit the Imperial Archives. But the Lord of Ginecho comes first. Life would be so dull without enemies, Kevin quipped. But this time, his lady did not rise to the bait. Beyond the precinct of the temples, the avenue narrowed, and traffic became too thick to allow for conversation. Kevin fought against the press of the heavy crowds, using his greater height to prevent his lady's litter from being jostled. He realised that his years of captivity had not been entirely unhappy ones. He might not love all aspects of Surani society, the misery of the poor would never cease to bother him, but given the chance to become a free man and stay at Mara's side, he would choose this alien world as home. His horizons had widened since he had fought in the Rift War. For him, a younger son, return to his father's estate at Zun would offer poor prospects, no substitute for the excitement he had found in foreign and exotic Suranuani. So caught up in his thoughts was he that when Mara's small retinue arrived at the Akoma townhouse, he did not raise his customary protest when the head servant there commanded him forthwith to unload the ladies' carry boxes and heft them up to her chambers. Midday passed and the heat lessened. Bathed and refreshed since her journey, Mara prepared for her visit to the Lord of the Ginecho. Kevin declined the chance to attend her, insisting he would be unable to keep a straight face through the proceedings. In fact, Mara knew him to be fascinated with the markets of the Holy City, and, in wistful reflection, she agreed that an afternoon of shopping with the head servant of the house was bound to be more interesting than exchanging stilted small talk and veiled insults with a seventeen-year-old boy whose eyes were still puffed from weeping over his father. She indulged Kevin's excuse and let him stay, and instead took Arakasi, unobtrusively clad as a servant. The Ginecho were too minor a house to warrant close observation by Arakasi's agents, and the spymaster himself desired the opportunity to pursue gossip with the house servants. The litter departed from the townhouse courtyard in the late afternoon, accompanied by twenty warriors, a suitable number to impress Lord Ginecho that his enmity was taken seriously. For quickness, the entourage held to the back streets, less packed with traffic. They passed through cool, tree-lined avenues lined by the garden courtyards of wealthy guild officials and merchants. Few folk noted their passage, and their only impediment was the occasional hand-pushed cart filled with vegetables that the servants of the very rich wheeled home. The soldiers stayed alert, though Arakasi held belief that no great house in the Empire would feel confident enough to attempt an assassination in public. Mara had always loved the side streets of the Holy City, with their long glades of flowering trees and their neatly swept stone cobbles. She enjoyed the wooden gates with their patterned lattices and their posts netted over with acacia and hibis vines. Although Kentasani was a river city, like Sulankur, by imperial edict, no dyers, tanneries or other crafts requiring unpleasant procedures had been permitted within the city walls. Unless one was downwind of the holding pens for the arena or the crowded markets in the central waterfront area, this was a city that smelled of flowers, spiced with the scents of temple incense as day closed and priests and priestesses of all the Surani deities began their night's devotions. The Yakoma bearers conveyed their burden from the side lanes and entered one of the many wide squares. Half lost in reflection brought on by the quiet of the hour, Mara almost missed Arakasi's hesitation. She looked over to see what had captured his attention. Across the square rose two gilded columns, framed by an arch and a span of smoothed slate. This was one of many message boards reserved for the word of the light of heaven. Although the messages were usually scribed in chalk and of a religious context, 
Today, a crew of Imperial Whites stood guard over the site. The event was unusual enough to draw notice. Closer inspection showed two plain-garbed craftsmen repairing the gilding on the frame, which had been damaged in last year's riots. Even the minute amounts of gold they used were too costly to risk thieves. This seemed to explain the presence of the Emperor's guards. But what to Arakasi's closer inspection were three dark-robed figures who stood at the board in process of affixing a scroll heavy with imperial ribbons and seals. Mara frowned, puzzled. Great ones from the Assembly of Magicians did not usually perform the errands of clerks. It's a proclamation, Arakasi mused, sharing his thoughts with his mistress. With permission, lady. I should like to see what it contains. Mara nodded her permission, diverted from her enjoyment of Kentasani's loveliness to considering the light of heaven. Imperial proclamations were a rarity, and the fact that one was being posted by great ones augured a momentous matter. It was no longer a topic of idle speculation that the current emperor was not acting the exaltedly remote figure his forebears had been. This light of heaven, Ichindar, had not only put his hand into the game, he had overturned it. Arakasi returned, slipping neatly between two bread sellers with shoulder yokes and laden baskets. As he arrived beside his mistress's litter, he said softly, My lady, the great ones announced to the empire that the magician Milamber has been cast out of the assembly. The document goes on to say that those slaves in the arena who were freed by his action are lawfully released from their masters, but no precedent may be seen in this. By imperial decree and by the will of heaven, Ichinda pronounces that no other who wears the slave's grey may change his status. For the good of the empire, for the sake of the order of society, and by divine will. All who are slaves must remain so until death. Mara showed no change in expression, but the delight went out of the day. Suddenly heavy-hearted, she motioned her bearers forward, then closed her curtains, as she did when she wanted privacy. Her hands laced tightly over a cushion, she did not know how she was going to tell Kevin, whose hopes had risen so dizzyingly after her careless reference that morning. Until recently, she had not considered his slavery to be an issue of importance. As a coma property, he was guaranteed food and housing and a measure of public standing by right of the honour of her house. As a free man, he would have no position, even in the eyes of a beggar. Any Surani in the street might spit on him without fear of retribution. Much as Mara might love him, she had not always understood his pride, so different from Surani pride, for he was safer as a slave in her house than as a clanless barbarian freeman. Anyone who spent time at the docks in Jamar would see the occasional renegade Thuril or dwarf from Distari and their misery and know this was true. But... This much she had come to grudgingly understand. If he remained a slave, in some manner at some time, she must lose him. The Knight of the Bloody Swords had shown her beyond doubt that he was a warrior. He deserved freedom to further his honour. Since then, she had felt uncomfortable with the concept that he should finish his days as her property. Her views had changed. She understood that his Midkemian code of conduct, alien as it was, had its own intrinsic honour. No longer could she regard him as disgraced for failing to take his life rather than be captured by an enemy, as a Sirani warrior would have done, or for hiding his rank to avoid summary execution. Troubled to discover that her plans to give him happiness were permanently dashed, Mara stayed withdrawn throughout her visit to the Ganecha. She performed the proper social display expected of her, but afterwards she would have been hard put to recall a word of the conversation or recite a detail of young Lord Kuganchult's appearance. If Arakasi noted that she seemed distracted 
as the litter wended its way homeward through Kentasani's torch-lit streets, he said nothing. He provided his hand with the skill of a man assigned such duties lifelong as she got out of the litter in her courtyard and disappeared unobtrusively at her dismissal. Mara called for a light supper and for once did not ask for Kevin's company. She sat in solitude in the study overlooking the courtyard, picking at her meal and staring at the shadow patterns the flowering shrubs threw onto the screen. From the kitchen she could hear laughter and Kevin's boisterous voice describing some escapade concerning a jiggerbird seller in the markets. He was in high humour, and the other servants were enjoying his performance with the enthusiasm of bystanders at a street entertainment. But for Mara tonight, Kevin's laughter only cut. She pushed aside her barely-tasted plate with a sigh and asked a servant to bring wine. She sipped and let the night deepen without calling for lamps. Her mind and her memory circled endlessly, reviewing the leading questions she had asked of the Great One, Fumita. His reticence stung her even yet. Over and over she pondered his chilly reception, and she wondered, now that it was absolutely beyond hope to change, whether the edict against freeing slaves had been prompted by her inquiries. She could never know for certain. That was the painful part. If she had more wisely kept her own counsel, Kevin's chance of freedom might not have been destroyed. Mara sighed and waved for removal of her supper tray. She retired early, though her mind churned, and when Kevin came, she feigned sleep. His touches and his tenderness could not break through her dark thoughts, and she feared to risk bringing him into her confidence. When at last he fell into contented slumber by her side, she felt no better. All night she tossed and sorted words. Hours passed and she still didn't know what to say. She gazed at his profile, lit softly golden by the screen-filtered light of the courtyard lanterns. The scar he had gained from the overseer at the slave market had nearly faded away over the years. All that remained was a fine crease over his cheekbone, such as a warrior might gain from a sword cut. The blue eyes, with their laughing depths, were closed, and in sleep his face showed abiding peace. Mara ached to touch him, and instead wound up blinking back tears. Angered by her shameful softness, she rolled over and stared at the wall, only to find herself turning back, studying his profile, and biting her lip not to weep. Dawn came, and she was exhausted. She arose before Kevin, tense and miserable in a cold sweat. She called for maids to bathe and dress her, and when her beloved roused with his sleepy questions, she covered her reticence by seeming brusque. I have a most important errand to do this morning. She tilted her head away, ostensibly to help the maid who was arranging her hair, but in fact to hide her puffy eyes before cosmetics could disguise the evidence of her unhappiness. You may come or not as you wish. Stung by her coldness, Kevin paused in the act of stretching. He looked at her. She could feel his gaze on her back and did not have to see to be sure of his reproach. I'll come, of course, he said slowly. Then... Chagrined that his tone held an edge that reflected her own, he added, At least the antics of jiggerbird sellers will need to improve a great deal before I'll be drawn from your charms. The conciliatory tone of the comment was not lost on her. She cursed the fact he held such power over her, and that even such a small remark could feel like a rebuke. He stood up. Never quite as silent as a Surani warrior, but as strongly confident, he stepped over to her and slipped his arms around her shoulders. You are my favourite little bird in the Empire, he murmured. Beautifully soft, and your singing is the joy of my heart. He moved away with a sly quip that caused one of her maids an unseemly fit of giggles. If he had noticed the lady was stiff in his arms, 
he attributed it to the pins that the maid was using to fasten the long, looping twists of her hair. The elaborate coiffure should have warned him. Built to a height that indicated a Surani intention to impress and fastened with dozens of fine jade and diamond pins, Mara's headdress was crowned and glorified by a feathered tiara set with abalone. We're going to the Imperial Palace, Kevin demanded, when he tore his eyes away long enough to notice that Arakasi was among the honour guard, dressed as a clerk. The senior strike leader was wearing his ceremonial armour and his most imposing plumes. His spear and helm were streamered, and since the ribbons would not hold up to prolonged street wear, not to mention a fight, somebody important had to be the reason behind all the pomp. We're going to pay a visit to an official of the Emperor, Mara explained, her tone brittle. She let Arakasi hand her into the litter. He was better at the task than the strike leader, who was fine enough with a sword, but clumsy when it came to managing a lady in high-soled sandals. Eight layers of overrobes and a headdress that would have outmatched any King of the Isles coronation crown by a factor of ten. You look like the confection on a wedding cake, Kevin observed. This personage is important? At last he won a smile from her. Though, with her face painted and thyser powdered, the expression was predictably stiff. He thinks he is important. When one goes asking for favours, the difference becomes moot. Mindful of her finery, Mara settled back on her cushions. Close the curtains, please, she instructed Arakasi. As the bearers raised the litter poles and started off, a nonplussed Kevin fell into stride. He presumed that Mara wanted privacy to discourage gawkers and to preserve her elaborate costume from dust. His cheerful mood held through a long, traffic-harried trek to the Imperial Palace, and not even the elaborate protocols of the various gate and doorkeepers put him off. Once he had become accustomed to the grand weight of ceremony that attended all matters within the Empire, he had discovered the purpose behind such manners. No official however minor, was ever rudely interrupted by someone from the lower ranks. Ruling lords or ladies were not caught unprepared by a visitor. The Surani attention to ceremony ensured, according to rank, that all things happened in due course, and that the proper papers or clothing or refreshments would all be in place the moment the caller at last crossed the threshold. The keeper of the Imperial Seal was well prepared when his secretary finally let Mara and her retinue into the audience chamber. The cushions had been plumped since the last petitioner had departed. A fresh tray of fruit and juices sat upon the low side table, and the official himself had his robe on, his weighty collar and signet of office adjusted and straight, and his fleshy anatomy arranged with dignity. A middle-aged man, the keeper of the imperial seal, had a florid face, a mouth all but lost amid multiple chins, and hooded, darting eyes that could probably name the coin worth of every jewel in Mara's costume at a glance. He also liked sweets, as evidenced by the Kelgia leaves piled in his refuse basket. The gummy confection, made from an extract of tree sap, had rimmed his teeth and his tongue a faint red-orange, and his bow was perfunctory, owing to his bulk and his equal-sized sense of self-importance. The chamber smelled of fat man's sweat and old wax, by which Kevin deduced that the screens were probably stuck shut. Holding a satchel of inks, pens and parchments for Arakasi's needs, he braced himself for a boring wait as Mara began the phrases of greeting. The official used this interval to open a drawer in his lap table and unwrap a kelgir, as if the task were a sacred ritual. He popped the sweet in his mouth, sucked noisily, and then condescended to reply. I am well. His voice was deep and too loud. He cleared his throat carefully twice. Lady Mara of the Acoma. He sucked, considered then added, I trust you are well. 
Mara inclined her head. The official shifted his weight on his cushions, and the floor creaked ponderously. He shifted his candy with a click of teeth to the other bulging cheek. What brings you to my office this fine morning, Lady Mara? Kevin heard her reply as a murmur, but could not make out single words. The official's jaws stopped working on his treat. He cleared his throat three times very deliberately. His fingers drummed on his knee, leaving white spots in the flesh that the hem of his robe did not cover. Then he frowned, his eyebrows snarling together over his baby round nose. That's, um, that's a most unusual request, Lady Mara. The lady elaborated, and hearing her mention midkemia, Kevin pricked up his ears. The Lady of the Acoma finished most clearly. It is a whim. She shrugged in a manner that Kevin recognised as purely feminine and calculated to disarm. I would be pleased. The Keeper of the Imperial Seal shifted again. His frown became uncomfortable. Mara said something. I know the rift is closed. The official blurted, startled into biting down hard on his sweet. He looked briefly as if he had cracked a tooth. You're asking on this. A seemingly worthless concession is odd. Most odd. He cleared his throat and said, Most odd, again, as though he liked the sound of the words. Kevin discovered himself leaning forward and realised he had better not. A slave in this land must not be caught taking an interest in the affairs of his betters. Mara spoke again, maddeningly too low to be heard. The official scratched his chin, obviously stymied. Can I do that? It is written so, as a point of law, Mara returned. She beckoned to Arakasi, who strode forward and bowed behind her shoulder. My clerk will be pleased to explain. The keeper of the Imperial Seal crunched the last of his candy, looking anxious. He waved as if Arakasi were of little more consequence than a slave. The spymaster reached into a pocket in his smock and withdrew a document. He slipped the ribbon, unrolled the scroll with brisk industry, and read a passage copied from a book, which held that the keeper of the Imperial Seal could use his discretion and assign those dispositions concerning trade and guild rights and authorise limited collection of minor taxes upon goods or services that were deemed too small to bother the Imperial Council with. Well, the huge man rearranged himself and began unwrapping another Kelgir suite. The matter you ask for is certainly a petty one, of no merit for discussion by the council. He paused and turned the candy over and over between his fingers, as if he expected to find insects. But, if I may guess, no man in my position has initiated any sort of private dispensation for hundreds of generations. Exalted sir, Arakasi ventured. I point out, that the law has not changed. He bowed again and backstepped to stand beside Kevin, a clear hint that he expected to collect his writing utensils and commence setting up a document. What's she asking for? Kevin questioned as softly as he could. Shh! Arakasi gestured for the slave to be silent, while Mara added another point in favour of her argument, and the official across from her became distinctly more flummoxed. Kevin observed and deduced that the keeper of the Imperial Seal was a bureaucrat with a sanctimonious devotion to order. With the obstinacy typical of his kind in every country, he was going to refuse Mara's request, not because her demand was unreasonable, but because it was unusual and outside the method of paperwork and filing he was bound by habit to follow. Arakasi seemed to sense an imminent rejection also, because his pose grew quietly more taut. 
Kevin stared at the floor and feigned unconcern, but in a low whisper to Arakasi he said, Why don't you suggest that Mara try a bribe? The spymaster twitched no muscle, his sole evidence of surprise the interval before his response. Brilliant, he whispered back. Is that what you people do with reluctant officials in mid -Kemia? Kevin returned a barely perceptible nod, and one corner of his mouth turned up. Usually it works. Besides, I'd bet Mara's jewels that that's what he's waiting for. But Arakasi had already moved forward to tap his lady discreetly on the arm. He spoke into her ear swiftly before the Keeper of the Imperial Seal could finish his snack and end deliberation. Mara was gifted with the knack for thinking on her feet. As the fat man across the lap desk from her drew a ponderous breath to frame his answer, she interrupted. Exalted sir, I realise such a request would require effort on your part to ensure that you were acting within the dictates of your office. And as you are under no obligation to do so simply because I ask... I would be pleased to recompense your time and industry, say, a hundred centuries of metal and three thumb-sized emeralds, if you would undertake the needed inquiry to resolve the issue properly. The Keeper of the Imperial Seals swallowed his Kelgia ball whole. His eyes bulged out. Lady, you are too generous. He did not belabour the issue. After all, her request was ludicrously useless. He had even most honourably emphasised that the rift connecting Midkemia to Kelewan was closed. But if Mara wished to be eccentric, the Emperor and the High Council certainly should not be bothered to consider such a worthless point of trade. Transparently content with his reasoning, and already greedy for his gift, the official motioned to Arakasi. My duty requires I research such tasks, but I shall be happy to take your gifts and, uh, I, uh, pass them along to the temples as devotion. He smiled. Now that I've had a moment to ponder, I am certain your interpretation is the correct one. <laughs> Fetch your pens and parchments. We shall draw up the agreement directly. Imperial documents in Saranuani were never short-order items. Kevin shifted from foot to foot while the closed chamber grew more stifling. Arakasi and the Keeper of the Imperial Seal argued endlessly and amicably over wording. While slaves came and went with braziers, pots of various colours of wax and spools of ribbon. Afternoon had come before the document proving Mara's dispensation had been recorded under the Imperial Seal. Another interval elapsed while the ink dried, and the captain of her honour guard sent a warrior to the townhouse to fetch back the centis and emeralds. While they waited, the fat man chewed Kelgir and discoursed on the poor quality of this season's dyed feathers. He had purchased an indigo robe, which had proceeded to rot into dust. The merchants think nothing of selling second-quality goods since the riots, he lamented, while his own clerk was sent for just to knot the official ribbons that tied the parchment into a scroll. The fabric of our clothing is going to ruin, the keeper of the imperial seal ended sadly. Some say that the order in the empire will sour next. Not with the assembly of magicians guaranteeing order, Arakasi interjected. He moved fast enough to intercept the parchment before the official could wave it about as emphasis to expound a further point. Blessedly fast after that, Kevin was handed the satchel of scribes' implements, the document safely inside. Mara arose and bowed, and as her party took their leave of this sweltering chamber, the keeper of the Imperial Seal could be heard bellowing loudly for his servant. There are no more Kelgia candies in my jar. Where is our efficiency these days? The clothes dyers are lazy cheats. 
The merchants sell defective goods, and now my own servants think they can ignore my needs and not be punished. We are coming to ruin in this empire, and who besides me seems to care? Mara did not linger in Kentasani after her visit to the keeper of the Imperial Seal, but boarded her barge for the return voyage to Sulankur and home that afternoon. The weather continued hot, sultry even for Kelowan, and as often happened during travel by river, Mara kept to her quarters by herself. She spent long hours in conference with Arakasi, or reading scrolls her factors had sent her from the markets in the Holy City. The rest of the time she stared at the water, deep in thought, and not much noticing the stream of passing traffic on the river. Kevin amused himself joking with the pole men or playing at dice with the off-duty warriors from the ladies' honour guard. As a slave, he could not legally keep his winnings, which was well from the standpoint of the losers, who claimed he had ungodly runs of luck. The barge docked without event in Sulankur, and Mara's retinue regrouped. Her goods and carry boxes were dispatched to a warehouse to head home with the next inbound caravan while the lady transferred to her litter. She had dinner in a traveller's hostelry in one of the fashionable districts of the city, then set off for home at twilight, her warriors carrying lanterns to light the way. Tired from the sun, Kevin had spent the interval in the city napping with the litter-bearers rather than seeking street gossip from the beggars who were unfailingly surly because he was a foreigner and a slave. Since the visit to Kentasani, events and chance circumstance had conspired to keep Kevin from private time with the lady. He did not take this amiss. She wore the mantle of the Akoma, and her responsibilities did not always leave her accessible. Usually this suited Kevin's independent turn of mind. He had moments when he preferred solitude or jokes in the company of men. Still, Curiosity impelled him to know what Mara had transacted with the keeper of the Imperial Seal. The parchment that granted her concession of rights had stayed rolled up in Mara's personal chest of papers. She had not left that box in Sulankur with her other baggage, but had kept it in her litter at her feet the whole way home. Ayaki's boisterous greeting prevented Kevin's finding out where the box was taken. But Mara must have ordered it locked away first thing, for by the time she finished scolding servants for allowing her son to be up so late, Kevin realised the box was gone. The bearers had already vanished in the direction of the stall's shed, and Jikan was nowhere to be found. Wise enough to know that information could not be wheedled out of Arakasi, Kevin waited through the hour while Mara caught Nakoya up on the news over cups of chochar and a late snack. He was waiting for her in the bedchamber when, exhausted by travel, she at last came in to retire. He realised the moment he embraced her that something was wrong. Her lips were cool on his, and her smile was forced. He was on the point of asking what it was when she clapped for servants to bring bath water. What followed distracted him completely. After passion had cooled... He lay on the bed cushions, with the screens cracked open and a copper flood of moonlight slashing a square across the floor. He noticed that the woman in his arms was still not relaxed. In retrospect, he realised their lovemaking had been hurried, not at all the slow, languorous spiral into ecstasy that Mara was inclined to prefer. Her responses to his touches had carried a buried sense of desperation that Kevin had almost failed to notice. He reached out and gently stroked the hair away from her temple. Is something the matter? Mara rolled over. Her features stayed shadowy, but Kevin could feel her gazing at his face. I am tired from the journey she said, but the words were studied. Kevin caught her wrists and pulled her warmly against him. You know I love you. But she buried her head in his shoulder and refused the invitation to talk. Attempting an innocuous approach, Kevin cupped her chin in his hand. 
You have something of importance up your sleeve. What was that secret dispensation you bribed from the keeper of the Imperial Seal, anyway? Mara answered with surprising pique. You must not expect my confidence in all matters. No. Kevin sat up, unsure of the source of her antagonism, and stung just enough not to handle it without rancour. Do I mean that little to you? You mean a great deal to me. Mara said at once. Fear made her voice cold, but in the dark he noticed only her tone. She drew away from him and sat up with her arms around her knees and her hands tightly clasped. You mean everything. Then, tell me what agreement you made in Kentasani. Kevin swept back a fallen lock of hair in a gesture so habitual it made her ache. I know it concerns Midkemia. Arakasi did not tell you that. Mara accused, still snapping. No, I overheard. Kevin's admission revealed he felt no shame, which angered her. Mara released a pent breath. Only my spy master and I know the contents of that document. That is according to my wishes. Now convinced she was hiding something and fearful that it might be a matter detrimental to his people, Kevin tried to pressure her. You said I meant everything. Against the square of moonlight, Mara was perfectly still. Her profile went hard, expressionless, and thoroughly infuriatingly Surani. She said nothing. Unaware that she was caught up in personal conflict that had little to do with the subject, Kevin reached for her. Have we no trust between us after this many years of intimacy? His voice was persuasive enough to wound. Still, she could have withstood him if he had not reached out and stroked her shoulder with all of his tenderness. Mara, if you are frightened of something, can't I know? She flung away from him, which was totally unexpected and painful in a way that took his breath. Of what would I be afraid? Her words were harsh, and he had no means to guess that he had hit upon exactly the point that troubled her. She was afraid of the power he had over her and of the tangle he had made of her emotions. Coldly, self-defensively, she reacted with the one thing she knew beyond doubt would distance him. You are a slave, she said with icy, bitten clarity. It is not for a slave to suppose what I fear or do not fear. Angry himself and beyond thought, Kevin let his words take on a sharp edge. Is that all I am to you? A slave to be numbered among your things? Am I of no more account than a needrable or a scullion? He shook his head and tried valiantly through his pain to soften his voice. I thought, after Dastari and a certain night in Kentasani, that I had earned some worth in your eyes. He felt a tremble invade his middle and hardened himself against the emotion her people deplored. I killed men for you, lady. Unlike yours, my people do not lightly take the lives of others. His pride caught her heart and twisted. In a moment she would be crying, and in a desperate attempt to contain her own hurt, Mara held herself in grim control. As if she faced her direst enemy, not her most beloved companion, she said, You forget yourself. You forget that your life could have been forfeit for daring to set hand to a sword. You are a slave, like other slaves, and to remind you of your station, it would be best if you left my chamber and spent the remainder of this night with your fellows in the slave quarters. Kevin sat motionless with astonishment. Go, Mara said, not shouting, but with all the finality of an executioner. That is an order. Kevin arose, lordly in his fury. He snatched his breeches from the chest by the bed cushions, but did not bother to dress. Naked, 
tall and prideful, he said, I have all but deserted my companions in sharing my love with their enemy. They might be barbarians and slaves, but they are not ones to cast aside loyalty. It will be a pleasure, he finished, and he spun and left without giving her a bow. Mara sat stone stiff. She did not cry until long after he had departed. By then he was knocking on the lintel of the hut where Patrick lived, politely requesting admittance. Have? Uh, a sleepy voice responded. That you, old son? Kevin stepped across the threshold, then cursed when he recalled the slave huts had no lanterns. He crouched in the dark and sat on the clammy dirt floor. Damn, Patrick muttered. He sat up on the poor pallet that served him as bed, chair and table. It is you. Did you have to come calling in the middle of the bloody night? You know we have to be in the fields before dawn. There was more than accusation in his fellow Midkemian's tone. Having already made one mistake concerning another's feelings that night and sobered by that into sensitivity, Kevin chose tact. Something wrong, old friend? Patrick sighed and ran a hand over his bald head. You can bet on that. Very wrong. And I'm glad you didn't wait until tomorrow to come, really. I suppose you heard about Jake and Douglas. Kevin drew a careful breath. No, he said gently. What's to hear? They were hanged for trying to escape. Patrick leaned forward, distressed and bitter. We heard about the Imperial Decree from a tradesman passing by. You weren't here to dissuade them. God, I tried. They pretended to listen, then sought to bolt the next night. Kioke, the old fox, knows our ways well enough by now that he guessed somebody might attempt to run for the hills. He had warriors waiting for our boys and both of them dead before dawn. Kevin felt a sting as an insect sampled his calf. He slapped it away with a fury he withheld from his voice. Carefully, weighing this news from the beginning, he said, You mentioned an imperial decree. What was it? You didn't hear. Patrick laughed incredulously with a heavy underlying sarcasm. You were in the holy city, in the company of God's almighty nobility, and you didn't hear. I didn't hear, Kevin snapped. Now will you kindly tell me? Patrick paused, scratched at a scab on his knee, and sighed. Damn me, but you're telling the truth at that. That's maybe not surprising, seeing as slaves mean no more than needrables to the runts of this accursed land. Damn it, tell me, Patrick. If there's been an imperial decree concerning slaves, I want to know about it. Simply this, said the bald man, who over the years had nearly become a stranger that the slaves freed from the arena by that Midkemian magician Melember were a freak. melember has been tossed out of the assembly for what everyone says was not doing his duty by the Empire. He's an outlaw for fair reasons, they say, and has a death price on his head. And the Emperor has set his hand and sealed to a document posted in every city that no other slaves ever can be freed. That does tend to wreck the ope you held out to us, old son. Poor Jake and Douglas lost their stomach for waiting, and there are others as impatient that won't hang on here much longer. With a bitter note, he added, They were so ruined by the word, I believe they knew they were going to be caught and didn't care. He sighed. It's hard to think how all these years we've been open, one way or another we'd get home. I guess the prospect of doing this slave work every day until we're dead. A silence developed as Kevin absorbed the implications of the news his countrymen had related. Patrick caught up in his thinking and realised that his two dead companions had not been the reason for Kevin's sudden visit. You had a fight with her, he accused abruptly. Kevin nodded ruefully 
his lover's feelings less raw since he had learned of Milamba's disgrace. Mara's odd reticence since Kentasani at least had an obvious cause. Upon sober reflection in a clammy hut full of stinging insects, he saw he had been a fool to let his fur get ruffled. She had never been a woman given to hysterics, and indeed she must feel as frightened of losing him as he was of being parted from her. If he could not, by her orders, return to mend matters until morning, at least he could give the difficulties of his countrymen long overdue consideration. I had a bit of a tough night, Kevin admitted ruefully, but that's no reason to lose hope. Damn you, man! The rift is closed, Patrick interjected. That means no return for us, and our only chance is an outlaw's life in the mountains. No. Bitten by another insect, Kevin slapped his breeches and politely asked for a place on the pallet. Patrick grudgingly moved over. The rift is closed now, very true. The blankets were rough, and Kevin wondered which was the more evil of two irritants, his companion's bedclothes or the bugs. The mattress was sweat damp and lumpy, no fit place for a man to spend his nights. Kevin sighed, torn inside between his love for Mara and his responsibility as the only Lord's son with a chance to find help for his countrymen. As always, he sought comfort in humour. Rather than rail over Surani injustice, he regaled Patrick with a jocular account of Mara's visit to the Keeper of the Imperial Seal. He managed to coax a dry laugh from Patrick when he got to the part about the bribe, but the central issue did not pass unnoticed. You don't know what was in that dispensation, the bald man pointed out. It may have nothing whatever to do with us, or even slavery at all. Probably not, Kevin confessed then said quickly, but that's not the issue. A sceptical quiet followed. The pallet shifted as Patrick sat back against the wall. What is the issue then, old son? I'm waiting. She negotiated for some concession that had to do with Midcamia. Kevin added, as though the conclusion were plain. When Patrick failed to catch on, he qualified, obviously... Our lady believes that some day the rift will be reopened. And that's supposed to keep the boys living in vermin and putting up with being beaten? Patrick asked. Damn you, Kevin. You're too much the optimist. All that silk and woman flesh have gone straight to your head. You know these runts have a history going back thousands of years. They make plans for the next fifty generations and consider them important in this lifetime. Kevin did not gainsay this but gestured in honest entreaty. Patrick, talk to the men. Make them hope. I don't want to see them hanged one by one by Mara's warriors while I'm working for a way to send them home. Patrick grumbled something unintelligible that had the ring of swear words. Dawn light filtered through the shack's single window and the tramp of feet from the barracks signalled a changing patrol. I've got to get up, old son, Patrick said morosely. If I'm not on time for grub, it's a long day's work with an empty belly. On impulse, Kevin touched his companion's hand. Trust me, old friend, for just a little bit longer. When I lose hope, I'll tell you, and I promise you this, I am not going to die as a slave. If I give the word, I'll lead the break for the mountains and the outlaw's life. Patrick eyed him closely in the lightning gloom. You mean that, he admitted, surprise showing through. But it's going to be hard convincing the boys. They're angry about Douglas and Jake. Then don't let them join Douglas and Jake, Kevin said forcefully. And he rose and stepped through the door. Well aware that Jikan would be pleased to set him to work... Kevin crossed the estate grounds between the slave quarters and the main house by a roundabout route through the gardens. Dew drenched his bare feet and dampened the bottoms of his breeches. Occasionally he passed one of Kiyoke's sentries. They did not trouble him. Since the campaign in Dastari, and especially since the Night of the Assassins, word of his martial prowess had circulated in the barracks. 
Mara's warriors might not acknowledge him openly, but they did in their way grant him a wordless respect. They no longer questioned his loyalty. If the guards by the door to Mara's chambers had overheard the argument in the night, they gave no sign as Kevin stepped through the Akasi hedge and sauntered down the path. As if he were a ghost, they ignored him when he cracked the screen and let himself back in. Light fell like pearl over a disarranged mass of cushions. Mara lay sprawled in their midst, her arms hugging a snarl of twisted sheets and her hair in tangles from tossing. She might not have been gnawed on by insects, but she appeared to have had an unpleasant a night as he had. Even while she dreamed, her forehead was troubled by a frown. Her profile, her small, clenched fingers, and the curve of one visible breast melted the last of Kevin's annoyance. He could not stay mad at her. Perhaps that was the worst of his faults. He slipped out of his damp britches. Aware that his skin was cold and angrily red from his scratching, he reclined on the edge of the cushions and tucked a fold of blanket around his chilly feet. Then, waiting for circulation to restore him to warmth, he looked at the lady he loved. Her nearness took the sting out of slavery, almost made him forget who he was, the rank he had been born to, all that he had lost, and all of the problems of his countrymen. Too well he understood their peril if the thin hope he had dangled before Patrick proved to be only a hangman's noose. Then Mara flinched and cried softly in her dream, and concern for her overrode all else. Kevin reached out with warm hands. He straightened the sheets in tangle between her knees and freed one of her wrists from an imprisoning loop of black hair. Then he gathered her to him and tenderly kissed her awake. She must have worn herself out with crying, for she roused slowly and her eyes were puffy and red. He had caught her off guard and she relaxed enjoyably against him. Then memory returned and she stiffened with the beginnings of outrage. I ordered you to leave, she said angrily. Kevin tipped his head sideways round the screen. Until morning, he answered equably. Morning's here, I came back. She opened her mouth to say more. Gently but fast, he set his finger over her lips. I still love you. She moved in protest against him, stronger than she appeared. He had to be firm to keep hold of her. Aware if he kissed her she might explode, he settled for laying his lips against her ear. The hair at her temples was damp, perhaps from tears. Softly, he said, I heard from Patrick about the imperial decree concerning slavery. That she had not told him herself stung yet, but he laid it aside. If I leave you, it won't be now. You're not angry with me? she asked, and at long last the uncertainty showed through. I was. Kevin kissed her, felt her starting to warm against him. If you had spoken to me, I might not have acted like such an oaf. Oaf? The word became tremulous as Kevin's hands made headway under the sheets. Karagabuj, Kevin translated, choosing the term for a mythical, misformed race of giants that inhabited mountain caves in Surani children's tales, creatures who were comically maladroit and constantly creating their own downfall. You're that anyway. You're so tall, Mara teased. Relief had left her giddy, and the fact he had forgiven her flung her headlong into passion. Well then, if that's the case, a Karagabouge doesn't ask permission to rape and pillage. He caught her closer, rolled her across his chest, and sighed into the spill of her hair that streamed across his face. Within a few minutes, both of them had forgotten which was the slave and which the master, for they were both inseparably one. Chapter 22 Tumult Months passed. The rainy season returned. The fields turned green with new growth, and the trumpeting call of Nidra bulls heralded yet another breeding season. The day began like many another, 
with Mara and Jikan in conference over slates of chalked figures, trying to determine the most profitable crops to plant for the fall markets. Then, at mid-morning, they were interrupted by word that a bonded runner from the commercial guild of messengers raced toward the Acoma estate house. Running, Mara inquired. She continued to check her strings of notations on huat yields in a new property recently purchased in Ambelina. Yes, mistress, running, said the guard. The affirmation did not surprise her. The warrior who brought her word was breathless still from hurrying himself to carry the news. Mara gestured for Jikan to conclude the year's assessment without her. Then, stiff in the knees from sitting, she arose and picked a path through precarious piles of slates to reach the screen that led to the corridor. She arrived at the front door in time to see the stocky messenger round the last curve from the outer pasture road. He was not walking briskly or trotting, but running as fast as possible on an errand of obvious urgency. I wonder what it can be, she asked herself aloud. Recently arrived at her shoulder, Sarik typically answered with a question. Trouble, mistress, or why else should a man be hurrying in mud? The lady of the Acoma cast a wry smile at her adviser, who seemed not to miss his former place in the barracks as a warrior. His dry, sarcastic wit differed from his cousin Lujan's flirtatious humour. Sarik's insistent tendency to know the why of things might have slowed his advancement as a soldier, yet that quality made him a natural talent in his new post. Blind obedience was not a virtue in an adviser. Already he had proven his worth. For over six months the Empire had been quiet under the iron grip of Aksantuka. Since Mara's visit to the Holy City to see the Keeper of the Seal, Imperial Whites had intervened three times in what should otherwise have been a dispute between neighbouring nobles. Aksantuka's justification was that the Empire needed stability. But Sarik had sourly noted that somehow the new warlord always managed to tip the scales in favour of those who had supported his rise to power. Repayment of political debts was common currency in the game of the council, but involving imperial whites in what amounted to border quibbles was excessive and showed an enthusiasm for bloodshed that rivalled the Minwanabi. The Akoma benefited by default, since Tasayo had been forced to assume a posture of quiet patience. As the warlord's most powerful rival, the Minwanabi lord needed no adviser to predict how Aksantuka might react should his family find itself overextended. The man who wore the white and gold ruled as ruthlessly as his predecessor, but even more unpredictably. Even on his near-impregnable estate, Tasayo dared take nothing for granted. The guild runner reached the steps, rousing Mara from reverie. Glistening with sweat and clad only in a loincloth and an armband bearing his guild's insignia, he bowed. Lady of the Acoma, Mara said, I am she. Who sends a message? No one, lady. The runner straightened from his obeisance and flipped back sweat-damp hair. For the good of the Empire, my guild sends word to all ruling lords and ladies. For the good of the Empire? With that phrase, the runner indicated his guild had thought this matter of grave enough importance that they acted without recompense. Concerned now, Mara asked, What has occurred? The messenger seemed not to mind that her request came without any offer of refreshment. Lady, the Empire stands imperiled. The gods have turned their anger upon us. The renegade magician, the former great one, Milimba, has returned. Mara sensed a stir of movement behind her and knew that Kevin had joined her. In a note of rising excitement, the Midkemian said, Then the rift is opened once more. As your slave observes, my lady, the runner answered, looking only at Mara. More. The warlord sought to capture this magician, using allies in the assembly. There is no clear account of what occurred, save that a battle was fought in the palace between the Imperial Whites and an army led by Kamatsu of the Shinzawai. 
The air seemed suddenly to lose brightness. Mara clutched her robe around her shoulders, unaware that her knuckles had gone white. With a calm she did not feel, for there could be no doubt that Hokanu would have marched beside his father, she prompted, A battle in the palace. Yes, mistress. Unaware of her personal discomfort, the messenger seemed to relish his dark news. To this end, the warlord was pronounced traitor and has been put to dishonourable death. Mara's eyes widened. Dishonourable death could only mean hanging. Only two powers in the Empire could order such an execution, and Aksantuka had allies among the magicians. The Emperor... Barely able to restrain his excitement, the messenger confirmed, Yes, lady, the light of heaven condemned the warlord, and now himself suspends the right of any lord to sit upon the white and gold throne. In the shocked interval that followed, Mara did little but try to order her reeling thoughts. The Emperor, condemning the Warlord. The event stunned, breaking as it did all former tradition and precedence. Even in times of gravest threat, no light of heaven had dared to act as did Ichindar. The messenger summed up, Mistress, the High Council is dissolved and will not assemble without the Emperor's command. Mara struggled to show no surprise. Is there more? The messenger crossed his arms and bowed. Nothing in common knowledge, but no doubt official word should follow. Then visit the kitchen and eat, Mara invited. I have been remiss in my courtesy and would invite you to replenish your strength before you make your next call. My lady is generous, but I must depart by your leave. Mara waved the young man on his way. As he hurried down the road at a run, she bent a keen look at Sarek. Get Arakasi back here as soon as possible. Her urgency needed no explanation, for if the runner's news was accurate, this was far and away the most momentous event ever to occur in her lifetime. Now the rules of the great game were forever altered, and until such day as the light of heaven changed his mind... He was the absolute power in the Empire. Unless, Mara thought, with a twist of irony like Kevin's own, someone decided otherwise by killing him. It took nearly two weeks to recall Arakasi, given the circuitous methods he insisted upon. Throughout the delay, Mara fretted, while rumours ran rampant through the Empire. Contrary to expectation, there came no official tidings of the upheaval surrounding Aksang Tukar's execution. Yet the days dawned damp and humid, and the afternoons brought fine drizzle and showers, as they did each year at this season. Plots and speculation abounded, but the Emperor indisputably remained alive and in power in Kentasani. Word held that eight of his slaves had died of various exotic poisons left in dishes of food, and that three cooks and two imperial chambermaids had been hanged for connected acts of treason. Commerce went on, but uneasily, as if in the calm before a storm. The oppressive weather made even fidgeting uncomfortable. Mara spent restless hours at her writing desk, penning notes to her various allies. Only missives sent to Jiro of the Anasati remained unanswered, which came as no surprise. Mara sighed and reached for another parchment, then checked the next name on her chalk slate. She dipped her nib and the soft scratch of her pen wore away yet another afternoon. Kevin tended to wilt in the heavy, moist air of the wet season. Less volatile than Mara when it came to intangible matters, he lay dozing upon a mat in the corner of her study, lulled by the soft tap of rain from the eaves or by the scrape of Mara's pen. Into the grey-green gloom that lingered from yet another shower came a shadow. Mara started upright, her breath stopped in her throat. Her movement roused Kevin, who scrambled up on a fighter's reflex, his big hands grasping for a sword that was not there. 
Then the Midkemian relaxed with a self-deprecating chuckle. Gosh, man, you gave me a fright. Arakasi stepped in from the rain, a heavy black robe slapping around his calves. His sandals were sodden and slicked with bits of grass, which meant he had come in by way of the Nidra pastures. Mara subsided in relief. You took long enough to get here. The spymaster bowed, a silvery fringe of droplets falling off his hood and running down his aquiline nose. Mistress, I was very far afield when your recall reached me. Mara clapped for her maid. Towels, she demanded, and a dry robe at once. She motioned for her spymaster to sit and help himself to a cup of chocha from the tray at her side. Arakasi poured himself a steaming drink, then bent a keen gaze on his mistress. Lady, I ask that you not tell anyone I am back. I slipped past your guards and took pains not to be seen. Which explained the pasture grass caught in his sandals, but not the reason behind it. When Arakasi did not elaborate on his own initiative, Mara was forced to make inquiry. Her spymaster twisted the fine porcelain cup in his hands in uncharacteristic agitation. He frowned, thought, and ignored the towels and dry clothing left for him by the maid. Still in his black and still dripping, he said, My informants. Something may be amiss. The possibility exists. We have been compromised. Mara raised her eyebrows and, with unerring intuition, tracked his thought to a long past event. The ambush set for Kiyoki. Arakasi nodded. I think the late Lord Desio let our man escape at the time to lull me into believing our other agents in the Minwanabi household were undetected. If so, then the promotion of one of my men to Tassayel's personal service is suspect. Mara finished as his words trailed off. She waved her hand in dismissal. Deal with that problem as you wish. If you think a Minwanabi spy may have insinuated himself upon my lands, dig him out. At this moment, I wish to know what actually happened in Kentasani. Arakasi sipped at his chocha. For an interval, he seemed reluctant to leave the subject of a possible breach in his network. But, as Kevin had settled back in his corner, and as Mara seemed rarely out of patience, the spymaster turned to the requested subject. Much occurred, but little was public. Arakasi put down his cup so softly the china made no sound. I lost an agent in the fighting. Mara did not know the man who had died and never would, but he was an Akoma servant. She bowed her head in respect, as she might at the word that one of her warriors had lost his life in her service. Arakasi shrugged with none of his usual lightness. The man was simply at the wrong place. When the fighting started, he was killed by a stray arrow, but the loss was regrettable. Candidates for posts in the Imperial Palace are carefully screened, and he will be very difficult to replace. The spymaster was taking the loss personally, Mara realised, and despite her wish that he would address the matter directly, his lapse was unusual enough that she waited for him to resume of his own accord. Arakasi tucked folded hands under the cuffs of his robe and seemed to come back to himself. Briskly, he said, In any event, the magician Milamber, though banished from the ranks of the Great Ones, has returned by way of a rift. Where is this rift? Kevin interjected, suddenly not half so sleepy as he appeared. Mara frowned at him, 
but it was Arakasi's look of withering scorn that caused the Midkemian to fall silent. I do not know yet. The spy master conceded pointedly to his mistress. Milemba was taken captive in the city of Ontuset by two magicians who served Aksantuka. He, two companions from his homeworld and another great one, were taken under guard to the Imperial Palace. Mara interrupted. The warlord took a great one prisoner. It could be argued that the two great ones restrained one of their fellows. Arakasi corrected dryly. About the warlord, little is known, though speculation abounds. At a guess... Aksantuka was not content to wear the white and gold. He may have been harbouring greater ambitions. Murder the Emperor, Mara cut in. There were rumours that someone tried poison. Half of such hearsay is true. Arakasi tapped his fingers and water puddled from his sleeves onto the polished wooden floor. Ichinda gave that reason for the execution, and since one of Aksantuka's pet great ones turned in his loyalties and brought testimony, who can doubt the truth of the issue? Mara's eyes opened at that. A great one denounced him. More. Warming to his subject at last, Arakasi qualified, Two great ones. Brothers lent their aid to this warlord as they had to his uncle. Mara nodded. She remembered the pair well, as they had been instrumental in proving her innocence in the tangle of conflicting accusations that had culminated in the ruin of Jingo of the Minwanabi. Arakasi continued. Brother turned against brother, with one great one now dead, and the other publicly denouncing all who conspired against Ichinda. At the moment, no one moves in the great game for fear of retribution. But, for our own part, I judge this a time for caution. If Tasayo believes himself to be the most powerful among the lords of the Empire, he may choose to strike. Mara held up her hand for silence while she thought. After a moment, filled with the sound of rain dripping from the eaves, she said, No, not now. Tasayo is too clever to attempt to steal a march when so many swords are unsheathed. Who commands the garrison at the Imperial Palace? Kamatsu of the Shinzawai, Arakasi replied. He acts as the Emperor's force commander, though he wears the armour of a Kanazawai war chief, not the Imperial White. Mara's brow furrowed as she weighed political ramifications. So, for the moment, we may surmise that the alliance for war is done, with the war party shattered as well, since only the Minwanabi dominate that faction. She tapped her chin with a finger, then said, we can assume Jiro of the Anasati will distance himself from both the Omechan and Tasayo, and that the Anasati and other families of Clan Ionani will turn firmly back into the fold of the Imperial Party. No, the Blue Wheel may not be the most powerful faction, but they sit at the Emperor's right hand, and at this juncture that counts for a great deal. Arakasi added, As for the council, two attempts by Minwanabi to call a formal session have been openly rebuked by Ichinda. The light of heaven reiterates his command that the high council is dissolved until he decides to recall it. Mara was silent a long time. I know there is more to this than treason, she concluded at length. Something else is at play. We have had attempts upon warlord and emperor before, but neither ever resulted in suspension of the High Council. Maybe this emperor has more brains or more ambition than his predecessors, Kevin offered from his corner. I'd stake my guess that he desires absolute rule. Mara shook her head. 
to take over by these methods would court revolution. If Ichinda truly desired power to turn the council to his bidding, he would make them his dogs. The imperial court can do many things, but it cannot govern the empire. Our system is not like yours, Kevin, with both ruling lords and their servants all subject to a king. She made a frustrated gesture that showed such concepts were alien to her still. The great freedom, Kevin recited. The law that clearly shows the relationship of each man to his master and his servant, so that no one can suffer unjust treatment. A polite fiction, I am certain, Mara interjected. In any event, that's not what I was speaking of. We do not have the system that allows for replacing a corrupt lord with a noble one. If a lord falls, his estate falls with him, and if enough of our number fall, the empire itself must fail. Kevin shoved back sleep-tousled hair. You're saying the empire doesn't have the infrastructure to withstand so widespread a change? Surani nobles are too spoiled and self-indulgent to administer their own lands unless they're allowed also to be absolute dictators. They won't do it just because the emperor tells them. Mara found Kevin's comments rankling. No, what I'm saying is that if the light of heaven thinks to turn a body of rulers into no more than clerks by whim, he'll learn that ordering a thing is not the same as doing it or seeing that others get it done. Kevin set his back against the wall and nonchalantly inspected his fingernails, which had dirt beneath the rims. I can't argue that with you. Uncertain why he should choose this moment to be difficult, Mara directed her attention to Arakasi. I think we need to go to Kentasani. Suddenly still, a shape cut from shadow in his dark cloak, the spymaster said, Mysteries. That may be dangerous. When hasn't it been? Kevin questioned with a bite of sarcasm. Mara waved a hand to silence him without even looking in his direction. I must chance that the Emperor would have no argument with a meeting of Clan Hadama in the council chambers. And if some members of the Jade Eye Party are also in the city at the same time, and we choose to dine... But the social byplays of politics held no interest for Arakasi this day. These are matters to discuss with your Hadonra and first advisor, mistress. He interjected with the slightest trace of sharpness. I must return to my agents and ensure that you are safe. Caught up in her own thoughts, Mara missed his abnormal abruptness. Do so she said in vague reference to words she had interpreted only by surface meaning. But I will expect you at my quarters in the Holy City in one month's time. Your will, mistress. Arakasi bowed with no trace of hesitation. As unobtrusively as he had entered, he slipped through the screen and vanished into the silvery afternoon drizzle. Still deep in thought, Mara allowed him time enough to leave unseen. Then she clapped for her runner and sent for her advisers. The rain held almost everyone indoors, and within a few moments Nakoya, Kiyoke and Sarek entered. Lujan arrived last, smelling of the oils used to preserve laminated armour. He had been in the barracks instructing young recruits, and his sandals added to the puddles left by Arakasi's black cloak. Without preamble, Mara said, Nakoya... Send messages to all the ruling lords of the Jade Eye Party, informing them that one month from this day we shall be in residence at our town house in the Holy City. The Akoma would be pleased to host each at a lunch or dinner, according to rank, of course. Almost without hesitation, she added, Send word to all members of Clan Hadama that a meeting will be held in the High Council Hall in six weeks' time. Nakoya paused in the act of straightening a drooping hairpin. Mistress, many of the Hadama clan were allied with Aksantuka. They will have little inclination to return so soon to Kentasani, despite your request. 
Mara turned a hard glance toward her first adviser. Then make it clear this is not a request. It is a demand. On the point of argument, Nikoya gauged the look in her mistress's eyes. She reconsidered, nodded once, and, with poor grace, said, Your will, mistress. From his corner upon the sleeping mat in Mara's study, Kevin regarded the evening's exchanges with a growing sense of disquiet. Something in Mara had changed, he intuited, though he could not put his finger on precisely what. Certain only that a distance had grown up between them, despite his best efforts at patience, he regarded the cold, remote look on the face of his lady and decided... Whatever the resolve behind her thoughts, this time he was unsure that he wanted any part of knowing it. The game was no game, not in any sense he could understand. And by now, familiar enough with the politics of Saranuani, he could sense when events led to danger. Changes, he had learned, did not occur in this land except through bloodshed, and the fall of yet another warlord promised the direst of trouble. The rain beat on the roof tree, and darkness fell, and, though the air remained every bit as humid and close as before, Kevin found he had lost all inclination to sleep. The storm passed, and while clouds on the horizon proclaimed the approach of showers later, the day blazed brilliantly. Mara stooped in the hot sun, her bearing erect and her expression unreadable. Lined up before her on the expanse of the practice field stood her entire garrison, every fighting man wearing a coma colours. The only absent warriors were those assigned to far holdings in distant cities and the current patrol on duty along the perimeter of the estate itself. At her right stood Nakoya, looking tiny under the weight of a formal robe. Her diminutive height was emphasised by the wand tipped with a fan of chattretail feathers, official token of her office as first adviser. Behind her and to the left stood Kiyoki, Sarik and Lujan, also wearing formal garb. The lacquered dress armour, the jewels and the shell inlay on the officer's staves glittered blindingly in the morning light. Squinting against the sunlight scintillating on polished armour, Kevin regarded the scene from inside the house, his vantage point a window seat in the large hall where Mara held court. Ayaki stood with his elbows propped on the cushion by the Midkemian's knees. Behind the young master, with a pot of wax and a polishing cloth dangling forgotten from his hands, stood the elderly house slave, Mintai, who was assigned this chamber's upkeep. The old man enjoyed the free moment that such ceremony brought, this being one of the rare times he could lapse into idleness without fear of reprimand. Mara had started off giving awards and promotions, then had gone on to accept the oath of loyalty of an even dozen young warriors called to a coma service. Once the new recruits completed their final bows and stepped back to take places in the ranks, she addressed her army as a whole. Now have the Akoma grown in strength to match their honour. Kenji, Sujara. As the officers who were named stepped forward, Mara accepted two tall green-dyed plumes from Kiyoke. These men are elevated to the rank of force leader, she announced to her companies, and as the two men bowed before her, she affixed the badges of their new rank to their helms. Kevin dug Ayaki in the ribs. What's a force leader? I thought I knew all of your ranks. Tasayo of the Minwanabi has four of them, the boy said unhelpfully. The Midkemian's blue eyes fixed in turn upon the house slave, and, flattered to be consulted as an authority, Mintai flourished his polishing rag toward the expanse of Mara's army. It is an assignment made sometimes when a force is too large for one commander. These will now be sub-officers to Force Commander Lujan, and each will command a company. A puzzled look crossed his face. This must mean she is dividing the army. 
Kevin waited for Mintai to qualify, then belatedly realised, when no explanation followed, that the old man must be a bit simple. What's that mean? he prompted. He received a Sirani shrug. Perhaps the mistress wishes to call more soldiers to her service. So we can beat Tasayo, Ayaki broke in. He made a noise in his throat that was his idea of the sound a man might make while dying, then grinned brightly. Kevin poked the boy in the ribs again, and the sound effects dissolved into laughter. How many men exactly are in a company? he demanded of Mintai. The old slave repeated his shrug. Many? It is all to a lord's liking. There is no fixed rule of quantity. But Kevin's curiosity was only whetted by vagueness. Well, then how many men answer to the patrol leader? <laughs> a patrol, obviously, barbarian. Mintai showed signs of wanting to return to his polishing. The outworlder might be his lady's lover, but he was due no respect for asking silly questions. Predictably, the barbarian missed the cues that his interest had become a bother. Well, let me ask in a different way. How many men usually in a patrol? Mintai pursed his lips and refused to answer. But now Ayaki was eager to show off. Usually a dozen, sometimes twenty, never less than eight. That a nine-year-old could keep such a nonsensical system straight was just another anomaly on this crazy world. Kevin scratched his head and tried to make order out of chaos. About ten, say. Now, uh, how many patrol leaders does a strike leader command? Sometimes five, other times as many as ten to each company, Ayaki declared. You don't need to shout like you're on a battlefield. Kevin reprimanded and tried, despite several retaliatory pokes in his own ribs, to figure in his head. So each strike leader can command as few as 40 men and as many as 200. He blinked as he looked back into the hot sun where the newly promoted officers arose and resumed their places. Then how many strike leaders do you need before you split your forces like this? Ayaki was laughing too hard to answer. Mintai tired of the window and scooped a dollop of wax onto his polishing cloth. As if the floorboards might vanish from under his feet for lack of attention, he knelt and began vigorously to rub. I don't know. How many men does our lady command now? I think from the extra help in the kitchen this last two years, it must be close to two thousand. We have twenty or twenty-two strike leaders, or so I heard Kenji boasting. Now let me do my work before my back gets whipped. The threat was pretense. Mintai was a household fixture, and too well liked by the overseer to receive much more than a scolding. Kevin fended off Ayaki's boisterous play and calculated. Most of the garrison rotated, spending part of the month in barracks near the house so they could be with wives and children. The rest were housed in small huts near various points along the perimeter of the estate or were out protecting caravans or river barges bearing a coma goods to distant markets. It would be hard to judge precisely, but the slave's estimate could be accurate. Mara might well command as many as 2,000 warriors. Kevin whistled low in appreciation. From gossip, he knew how small a garrison she had inherited when she first assumed her ruler's mantle, something like 35 men. Now her forces were growing to rival those of the very strongest of families in the empire. A pity, he thought, that the location of her estate was so poorly suited for defence. But the disquieting thought followed naturally that perhaps the lady did not amass her military might for protection only. A cloud crossed the sun, harbinger of the first afternoon shower. The ceremony on the practice field was ending, square after square of green-armoured warriors facing about and marching at Lujan's command. Mara and her advisers made their way toward the estate house. 
Suddenly anxious to meet her, Kevin suggested that Ayaki go to the kitchen and bother the cooks, who were making fresh thyser bread by the smell riding the breeze. The perpetually hungry boy needed little persuasion, and, by taking shortcuts through the courtyards, Kevin managed to be waiting for the lady as she entered her private quarters. He preempted one of the maids and helped her out of her heavy robe. She allowed him, still and silent, and less responsive than usual to his touch. Keeping his tone light, Kevin said, Do we marshal for war, my lady? Mara smiled without humour. Perhaps, if my clansmen show sense, we do not. But if they prove recalcitrant, I need this show of force. It will not take long for word to travel the river that the Akoma garrison has grown to the point of needing two force leaders. She shared a heavy collection of jade bangles and dropped them into an open coffer. A set of matching hairpins followed with a chiming cascade of sound as each was tossed in with the rest. No one need know our companies are fewer than before. The empty robe was surrendered to the maids to freshen and hang. Kevin regarded his lady's naked back and sighed as she covered herself with a light indoor lounging robe. The game continues. Always? Mara knotted her sash, ending any hopes of an interlude on her sleeping mat. Unaware that her lover entertained the idea of intimacy, she added, The Emperor may have suspended the council, but the game always goes on except that it was no game at all, Kevin concluded inwardly, not when armies entered the picture. Despite his recent decision not to become entangled in politics, he could not help but wonder what course his lady considered this time. Shadows painted the Imperial Palace in shades of rose, orange and deep charcoal blue as the first sun of the morning breasted the horizon. The city along the riverfront and in the poorer sections was already awake and busy, but the halls of the powerful rang only with the footfalls of servants and one patrol of warriors armoured in a coma green. On this, the day Mara had appointed for the meeting of Clan Hadama, she wished to be first into the council hall. The proceedings she had in mind must not go amiss, or her demands upon the clan would do nothing but gain her more enemies. Lujan and a hand-picked escort of twenty men escorted Mara to the inner circle of the council, but at the point where they would normally be asked to stand and wait, the Lady of the Akoma continued to walk. After a brief hesitation, Lujan signalled to his warriors to maintain ranks. They followed their mistress down to the lower level of the chamber, and, if they were startled that the Lady passed by her usual chair, they showed no sign. In his pose as her body slave, Kevin raised one eyebrow, then chuckled to himself as he guessed his lady's intention. Mara crossed the open floor on the lowest level, then mounted the raised dais reserved for the warlord during council sessions, or for the clan war chief during gatherings. By now, the upper dome was golden with new sunlight. Mara sat upon the elaborate ivory-inlaid throne and composed herself. Kevin stood close behind, ready to answer her needs, and, as if her action had required neither courage nor audacity, her warriors arrayed themselves in a semicircle behind her position. Kevin regarded the ranks of vacant seats from his place on the central dais. As the hall was empty but for Akoma soldiers, he spoke freely. Some folks are going to have their bowels in an uproar before this day is done, lady. But Mara had already assumed the air of superiority that accompanied the throne where she sat. She said nothing. She waited in her formal pose for close to three hours until the arrival of the least-ranked members of Clan Hadama. The Lord of the Jinguai was the first to step into the council hall, his guard in yellow and red armour trimmed black at his back. By then, the sun had risen high enough that slanting shafts lapped over the central dais. 
anyone who entered could not miss the lady on the throne in her sparkling jewels and flowing ceremonial robes. The old man gave one surprised glance and precipitately halted. He hesitated, then smiled in genuine amusement and proceeded to his place near the back of the hall. Kevin whispered, Well, there's one who's ready to watch the show. Mara moved her decorative fan in a manner that meant he should keep his thoughts to himself. Her face remained impassive as alabaster beneath layers of thyser powder makeup. All her nerves and excitement were invisibly pent inside. Within the hour, another five lords arrived. Most simply moved to their allotted place after one look in Mara's direction. Two others conferred briefly, exchanged subdued gestures, then went on to their chairs. Noon brought in a delegation of a half-dozen lords, with them one who numbered among the most powerful of families in Clan Hadama. Upon crossing the upper threshold, this lord signalled to the rest, and as one body the group came to the centre of the hall. By now, the sun shone down upon the gold and ivory throne, lighting Mara like the statue of a goddess in a temple niche. Before the war chief's chair, the lords paused. Rather than take seats, they clustered together, muttering among themselves. At length, one who wore deep blue moved to address the motionless woman on the throne. My lady of the comma, Mara interrupted him. You have something to say to me, my lord of the Potapara. The man seemed about to bridle. Like a bird in full plumage in his finery, he puffed out his chest, then measured the lady on the dais. Her gaze did not waver, and the soldiers at her back stayed statue still. Yet, in the culture of Suranuani, such brazen lack of reaction became an emphatic statement. The lord cleared his throat. Are you well? Lady. Mara smiled at his polite capitulation. I am indeed, my lord. Are you well? The man in blue acquiesced, then nonchalantly returned to conversation with his fellows. Kevin spoke sotto voce. One down. No, Mara corrected, hiding relief behind a flutter of her fan. Six down. The lord who greeted me ranks above the others, two of whom are his vassals. The other three are sworn allies, and since they are still speaking to one another, all will defer to his choice. The victory was telling, for as more lords entered, they saw that one of the more powerful families had accepted Mara's position ahead of them. Plainly unwilling to challenge her popularity, they gave her greeting and assumed their places with varying degrees of enthusiasm. Then the formally acknowledged war chief, Lord Benshai of the Chekawara, swept into the hall, his colourful robes billowing like sails around his voluminous body. Deep in conversation with one of his advisers, and entrenched in his own self-importance, he was halfway down the stair to the lower floor before he noticed the figure who occupied his accustomed throne. He stopped dead for the briefest moment, his eyes widening in his dark face. Then... He gestured to his garrulous adviser to be silent and moved his bulk, the remaining ten steps at surprising speed, to confront the Lady of the Acoma. Kevin restrained his comment, for Mara's tactic was now plain. Despite the fact that early arrivals were for lesser-ranked rulers, anyone on the floor below who stood looking up at the person in the seat of primacy was set at a disadvantage. Lady Mara! began the lord of the Chekawara. Mara cut him off. I am well, my lord. Are you well? Several lesser nobles in the clan smothered smiles. Mara's answer to a question not asked lent the impression the war chief of the clan had conceded her position as superior to his own. The lord Benshai spluttered and strove to recover. That's not what... Mara interrupted again. That's not what, my lord. Forgive me, I assumed you were being mannerly. But a man accustomed to power could not long be put off by adept verbiage. In a tone of ringing authority, Lord Benshai called, Lady, you'll sit upon my dais. 
the Lady of the Acoma returned her most penetrating gaze. In a voice of equal command that none in the chamber could miss hearing, she pronounced, I think not, my lord. Lord Benshai of the Chekawara drew himself up to his full height. Ivory ornaments rattled at his wrists and neck as he bristled. How dare you! Silence! Mara demanded, and the rest in the room obeyed. Their compliance was not lost on Lord Benshai. He twisted his short neck and glared at the lords who had failed in their support of him. Pride alone kept his posture from wilting. Not just to the Lord of the Chekawara, but to all in the gathering, Mara announced, The time has come for plain speaking, kinsmen. Now profound stillness fell over the vast hall. Terms relating to blood ties were rarely used in public, for Surani set great store upon relationships. Any claim of kinship, however vague, was considered both important and personal. Although all in the clan shared blood ties in the far distant past, the relationships had grown tenuous with time and were never stressed lest implications of debt or honour be implied. As if the Lord of the Chekawara did not stand nonplussed at the foot of the dais, Mara continued to address the lords in the galleries. By fate's ruling, you are members of a clan long considered steeped in honour. As many in the hall murmured agreement, Mara's tone punched through. But lacking power! Voices fell silent. My father was considered among those most noble lords in the empire. Again, several rulers in the hall concurred. Yet, when his daughter faced powerful enemies alone, not one kinsman sought to lend even token support. No one spoke as Mara surveyed the galleries. I understand as well as any of you why this is so, she said. Yet I also feel that political reasons are insufficient justification. After all, she qualified in bitter inflections, conscience does not trouble us. Such is the Surani way we tell ourselves. If a young girl is killed and an honourable family's natami is turned downward in the dirt, who can argue it is not the will of the gods? Mara searched each face in the room, looking for adverse reaction. In the instant before the boldest rulers could raise their voice in protest, she cried, I say it is not the gods' will! Her words rang across the galleries, and the near-to-unseemly emotion that coloured them held every lord in his chair. I, Mara of the Akoma, I, who forced the lord of the Anasati to give quarter, and I, who destroyed Jingu of the Minwanabi under his ancestral roof, I, who have moulded the Akoma into the mightiest house in Clan Adama, I say that we make our own destiny and seek out our own place upon the wheel. Who here says not? A stir greeted this concept, and several lords moved, as if made uncomfortable by what sounded like blasphemy. One ruler toward the rear called out, Ready! Your voice dangerous thoughts! We live in dangerous times, Mara shot back. It is time for radical thinking. A general, if reluctant, agreement followed. Low-pitched grumbles deepened to a buzz of animated discussion, cut short by the Lord of the Chekawara, who barely contained his rage at being forgotten where he stood. He shouted across the general noise, What do you propose beyond usurping my office, Lady Mara? Jewels blazing in the sunlight that fell from the dome, Mara removed a document scroll from the depths of her sleeve. Now Kevin had to fight against his desire to express admiration at her timing. 
Show them the carrot, he whispered to himself. In the brightness of the light, the yellow and white ribbons that denoted a writ from the keeper of the imperial seal could not be mistaken. Aware she had drawn every eye in the chamber, Mara regarded the gathering with imperious composure. I have here, under official seal, an exclusive trading option granted to the Akoma. Trading option? With whom? And for what? came various queries from the galleries. Only Lord Benshai seemed unimpressed. He stood like a mountain and glowered. Did you hold a writ from the hand of the light of heaven himself? I would not bow to you, lady. Lujan slapped a hand loudly on the grip of his sword, clear warning that no insult to his lady would be tolerated. The Chekawara warriors bristled likewise, and, aware of how real was the threat of bloodshed, Kevin sweated beneath his robes and longed for a knife to his hand. Yet, as though the tautness of her warriors were nothing more than posturing, Mara read the document aloud to the gathering. The chamber grew still as a tomb. I hold the key to wealth, my lords, she concluded. I have exclusive rights to these goods, both import to and export from the world of Mitkemia. A hush descended. Into a profound stillness, Mara said, You realise how the wholesale importation of any of these listed items, in particular those of metal, would affect your wealth? The silence in the council hall took on a strained quality. A few lords conferred in whispers with advisers, while the ones in the highest ranking seats slowly turned pale. The Lord of the Chekawara sent swift signal to his warriors to relax their battle-ready posture. Better than any, he realised that Mara had him beaten. Had she tried force or called upon political allies, her position might yet be in question. But, as she had strength enough to equal if not best him, and now the certain power to undermine the finances of every family in the clan, not a lord present would dare to support their former war chief. A look of baffled fury on his dark face, Lord Benshai sought furiously for means to back down without disgrace. Around him, his fellow rulers of the Hadama clan seemed too self-absorbed by their own predicament to relish his defeat. One in the front balcony called out, Lady, are you offering participation? Mara answered guardedly, Perhaps I may be willing to establish trading consortiums and allow others to participate. Those of you who prove yourselves my kinsmen in deed as well as word. Many looked askance at this suggestion, and by the flurry of movement as the advisers present leaned over to whisper to their lords, the idea was not taken with enthusiasm. The lord of the Chekawara saw his opening. In a voice well practised at persuasion, he said, Mara, your proposition is well and good, but we have seen nothing to suggest trading with the barbarians is feasible. Even should you hold exclusive rights from the Emperor. Besides, he added with a wave a father might use to reprimand a wayward girl, these things change, don't they? Mara heard Kevin murmur, now show them the stick. She had to struggle not to laugh. The Lord of the Chekawara exhibited a confidence that, in another moment, was going to make him seem regrettably pompous. Choosing her tone carefully, Mara said, My Lord, understand this. When I leave this hall, I shall know those who number among my friends and those who stand apart. She directed a meaningful glance around the hall and tempered her lines with restrained patience. I have proven myself a dozen times over since becoming ruling lady. A thoughtful pause made the most of the general murmurs of agreement from the galleries. Mara resumed. 
Those who doubt me may stand aside and face whatever comes to them, firm in the knowledge they can rely upon their own wit and resources. Those who accept my call for clan unity and cast their lot with mine shall have the Akoma beside them to face whatever dangers may arise. For my lords, if anyone believes the great game can be ended because the light of heaven so commands, let that man remove himself from power and seek out a temple to pray for mercy. For that man is a fool, and only by the God's indulgence will he and his family survive the days to come. I offer a better choice, she cried in the loudest voice she had employed so far. You may continue as you have done, a small clan empty of promise, or you may rekindle the fire that our ancestors once used to light their way. Tassio of the Minwanabi will fall or I will fall. If I fail, she looked directly at Lord Chekawara. Do you think Tassayo will not plunge our empire into civil war? What family is strong enough to stop him with the Omechan in disgrace? She sat back and quietened her tone so that all in the galleries had to lean forward to attend her. But if I succeed, then one of the five great families will vanish. Another family must rise to fill that seat. Most would assume the Anasati would claim the honour, or perhaps the Shinzawai. This is yet to be written. I say the prize might also fall to the Akoma. The clan of the Ascendant family will rise in standing, and those who are kinsmen of that ruling lord will number among the mighty. She waved the document. And the wealthy! The old lord of the Jinguai had not moved from his seat throughout the entire proceedings, but now he stood. His back might be stooped with age, but his tones were firm as he called, Mara! I name Mara of the Akoma, my war chief! Another lord joined his call, followed by a chorus of others from the upper galleries. Suddenly many were shouting, and, in consternation, Lord Benshai of the Chekawara realised that the majority of the clan were upon their feet hailing Mara. At last, as the commotion began to subside, the Lady of the Akoma regarded the former war chief. Benshai, surrender the staff. The Lord of the Chekawara looked sour. He hesitated an almost imprudent interval, then held out the short wooden staff with ceremonial carvings that marked the rank of war chief. As Mara accepted the token of office, he gave a shallow, stiff bow and backed to the first seat next to the dais, the position reserved for the second most powerful lord in the clan. Others reorganised themselves accordingly down to the chair that had formerly been Mara's, while those of lesser rank remained undisturbed. With clan order readjusted, Mara waved a hand to indicate the gathering. All of you shall be counted loyal and faithful friends. From this moment forward, let it be known that the Hadama is again a clan in both name and deed. For, kinsmen, trying times are coming. Days to make the night of the bloody sword seem a mild disturbance unless we undertake plans to prevent such a pass. I call upon Clan Honor. With those formal words, a shock ran through the room. Lords exclaimed aloud in surprise and consternation, for by her choice of phrasing, Mara proclaimed beyond recall that whatever came next impacted upon not only the honour of the Akoma, but that of the entire clan. No lord would dare such a move in a capricious or trivial way, for the invocation bound every family within the clan to stand with the Akoma. 
Should any war chief embroil clans in conflict, the stability of the empire could be overturned. The point did not have to be reiterated that to threaten social continuity would invite intervention by the Great Ones. More than the wrath of the Emperor, or even the vengeance of the gods, the Sirani feared the assembly of magicians, those whose words were as law. Yet Mara allayed the worst fear, that she might use a call to clan honour for her own ends. The first duty of clan Hadama is to serve the Empire. In a flurry of relief, all in the room cried out, Yes! To serve the Empire! I tell you this. All that I undertake from this day forward is not for the glory of the Akoma, but to serve the Empire. You, my brave and loyal kinsmen, have cast your lot with mine. Know by my word that no matter what may come, I act for the good of all. Like a change in tide, the undercurrent of conversation faltered. Mara placed Clan Hadama under a dreadful burden for which those ritual words, good of the empire, she committed her clan to a course that could end only in victory or in utter destruction. Yet, before the mutters could swell into cohesive protest, Mara swept on. From this day, all party affiliations outside the clan are ended, save those with the blue wheel and jade eye. Several lords nodded in approval, while others, whose political interests lay elsewhere, scowled their displeasure. Yet no one spoke out. All ties with factions outside the clan must be made known to me, Mara demanded. I shall not force any of you to act dishonourably or forget vows, but in the days to come, some of us will find that former friends become the most bitter of foes. She took a breath, as if waiting for a challenge. Look around this room, my lords. These are your family, upon whom you may depend. The ancient ties of blood have today been renewed. Any man no matter how highly placed, who raises a hand against even the least of my kinsmen raises his hand against me. Our clan heritage has fallen to disunity for generations, no more. For whosoever strikes at my kinsman strikes at me. My army has been divided, my lords and fully one half of my warriors under a newly promoted force leader stand ready to answer should you call. She let that sink in, then added, And when the coming dark days have passed, it is my intention to meet again in this room and to see no absent faces among us. For as a mother Shatra bird brings food to her young and spreads her wings to shelter them, so shall I be to you one who feeds her family and protects them. Most of the lords in the hall stood at this, and the ones least in rank and strength cheered in appreciation of Mara's vow. Even the most powerful who had been displaced were forced to look upon their new war chief with respect. And... If the lord of the Chekawara's dark face held other than admiration for the woman who had replaced his primacy in the clan, he hid his sour feelings as he stood and applauded her brave words. Only Kevin observed with a man's perception, and he did not miss the flash of bitterness in Lord Benshai's eyes. Although the Midkemian himself felt warmed that his lady had dared to turn his influence upon her thinking into public policy, he wondered with concern whether she had yet again won many new allies at the price of creating another mortal foe. The Keeper of the Imperial Seal paused with a Kelgia candy halfway raised to his mouth. Caught at a loss, he visibly sagged when he saw who called upon him. 
He shoved his bulk from his cushions with a suppressed grunt of effort and adjusted his robes around his girth. Mm, my lady of the coma, what a surprise! Glancing at the apologetic servant who stood behind Mara, the keeper understood that Mara and her not inconsiderable entourage had simply swept past the usual maze of servants, depriving the keeper of the news an important visitor was approaching. The candy was suddenly an embarrassment. The keeper of the Imperial Seal dropped it hastily back into the bowl, though it was unwrapped already and beginning to melt in the heat. He wiped his sticky palm on his sash, since the robe he was wearing had inconveniently short sleeves. Then he extended his palm to his visitor. Mara took the proffered hand and let the man lead her to a seat before his writing desk. As the official stowed his bulk on his cushions, he wheezed, Are you well? I am well, my lord keeper, she replied with the faintest hint of deference. Mm, word holds that you have risen to primacy in your clan. The keeper of the Imperial Seal wasted no time retrieving his suite. Much honour to you, I think. Mara inclined her head as if accepting a compliment. Around a softening mouthful of candy, the official said, To what do I owe the honour of this visit? I think you know, Webara. By the shift to first-name usage, Mara indicated her demand that she be treated with all honour due her rise in station. She removed a roll of parchment from her sleeve. I hold a warrant under Imperial Seal for trading concessions, and now I require my claim to be made public. Webara forced a friendly smile and shrugged. Mara, <laughs> you may do anything you wish. His reciprocal use of her first name showed that he claimed still to hold position in power equal to hers. You may employ runners of the Commercial Guild of Messengers to carry word of your exclusive trading rights to the far corners of the Empire, for all it matters. Taken aback, Mara fought not to show surprise. I assumed that, when the time was appropriate, the Imperial messengers would undertake the duty of posting such notices. Well, they would do so, if I directed them. Wabara inspected his robe over his navel and removed a flake of Kelgia leaf that had stuck itself to the fabric. Mm, however, as the rifts are not under Imperial control, I am not concerned with who uses them. Mara bit back outrage. What is this? I hold exclusive trading rights. Wibara gave a long-suffering sigh. Mara, let me be blunt. You hold trading rights with the barbarian world, while it can be argued that no one else is entitled to import the commodities you have licensed. Still, you hold no monopoly on the use of a rift on another's lands. Neither of the two rifts is under imperial jurisdiction. Who controls them? Despite her best efforts, Mara's query came out acerbic. She blotted sweating hands, worried now, for yesterday's bold advancement had been based upon her use of her licence to control certain Midkemian imports. Like many officials whose post held hollow forms that brought pomp but poor prestige, Webara sensed at once that he had the upper hand. He sucked on his sweet and twined his fingers across his ample stomach. The first rift is upon the lands of a man named Netoha of the Chichimechas, near the city of Ontoset. His self-satisfied manner informed more plainly than words that this man might be difficult to convince when it came to granting access for trade purposes. Where is the second rift? Mara asked through a stab of annoyance. Webara returned an unctuous smile. Mm, the other rift is located to the north, somewhere within the city of the magicians. 
He smacked his lips as the last of his candy dissolved. In sugary tones, he added to the unnecessary, It is controlled by the assembly, of course. The man's patronising scorn galled as deeply as insult. Mara arose without the grace of any courtesies. Certain the keeper of the imperial seal was gloating at her frustration, she swept from the chamber without a word or a single glance back. The chuckle that followed her departure into the corridor went unheard. Plunged into furious thought, Mara frowned. Her escort of warriors fell into step behind her without the benefit of any signal. Their mistress was too preoccupied with her own mistake to attend to such details. She had made an assumption and paid. Acting on power she did not entirely have, she had presumed that the reopened rift would be under imperial control, as the last had been. Then her warrant would have given her undisputed access. But the magicians were far too capricious and powerful a body to approach, and this Netoha might certainly prove intractable. Mara uttered one of Kevin's favourite curses under her breath. Whoever Lord Netoha was, or whomever he held as allies, she was going to set Arakasi to the task of sounding his strengths and weaknesses. She had to gain access to a rift. Her newly won position as clan warchief depended upon this, and if she was thwarted in her needs, her house was set on perilous ground, both militarily and financially. If she was frustrated, Mara forced herself to keep breathing evenly, to walk as though nothing were troubling her. Tasayo must not find out, or she begged swift ruin, not only for herself, but for all of Clan Hadama as well. Arakasi reported back within the hour of Mara's return to her townhouse. Agitated still over her dilemma concerning trade concessions, the Lady of the Akoma immediately summoned the spy master into her presence in the garden courtyard. There, surrounded by perfectly groomed flower beds and the songs of fountains that did not soothe, Mara asked point blank for information concerning the man Netoha, upon whose estate the secondary rift of the barbarian world was reputed to lie. As if her need had been anticipated, perhaps because of her desire to free Kevin, Arakasi had an astonishing supply of ready facts. He completed his bow, his secretive features more than usually impassive. The magic gate is not located upon Netoha's lands by chance. He was the Hodonra of the renegade magician Milember, who resided there before his expulsion from the assembly. My inquiries established that the man had been a servant or hedonra of the previous owner of that luckless property. Arakasi paused at this. The Sirani superstition held against occupying residences or employing the servants of those fallen from power. When a lord or a family lost favour with the gods, his goods, his lands and his staff were believed to be accursed along with him. Yet Millember had been a barbarian, no doubt ignorant of such points, and ill luck had dogged him also. Arakasi shrugged Surani fashion. But while both Netoha's masters have fallen upon ill fortune, his cause seems on the rise. Through some distant relation, he was able to claim kinship with the Chichimechas who needed capital at the time. An arrangement was made. Now Netoha of the Chichimechas is fourth in line for succession to the ruling lordship of a tiny house and is in good standing with the Hunsan clan. Mara resisted an urge to rise and pace the flagstone walkway. Clan Hunsan is radical in its thinking. Nothing they do would come as a surprise. Arakasi rounded off his report. Little else is common knowledge save that Netoha's wife is a former slave. Mara raised her eyebrows, diverted from her troubles by interest. But her spymaster's explanation dashed any hope she might hold for Kevin's benefit. Milamba freed all the slaves upon his estate before leaving Kelewan, Arakasi said. As his status had yet to be called into doubt at the time, 
the act became as law. Even without slaves, Netoha has turned his small holdings to profit. Given his industry, he is a man who will likely continue to rise. He might some day become a powerful lord. Mara seized upon the one point that mattered. Then he could be open to a commercial transaction concerning this rift. Perhaps. Arakasi's mood stayed guarded. There is something else, mistress. A great deal is not clear to me beyond the certainty that something vastly beyond the ordinary is in play. The renegade magician's return has sparked much activity, all of it clandestine. There are disturbed patterns running through imperial circles, high officials in long conferences with scholars sworn to secrecy, and a lot of close-mouthed, nervous correspondence carried back and forth by the light of heaven's personal messengers, none of it written, and all of it bonded by suicide oath according to court gossip. I shall endeavour to penetrate and discover the heart of this, but as the assembly is involved... He shrugged again, to indicate the effort might not bear fruit. Too concerned for her own difficulties, Mara forewent curiosity over the affairs of great ones. She dismissed her spymaster with uncharacteristic abruptness, then called for a scribe, her intent being to send messages to Lord Netoha and to Fumita of the Assembly, offering generous terms for use of the rift gate into Midkemia. Once her missives were dispatched by the Guild of Messengers, Kentasani held little to retain her. Mara opted for a swift return home, as much to avoid inopportune contact with other members of her clan as to assuage a sudden longing to spend time with Ayaki. The boy was growing so fast. He was halfway to becoming a man, she realised. She must speak to Kiyoki soon about selecting a warrior to teach him weapon craft, with his tenth birthday scarcely a half year off. The return barge trip down the Gagajin passed without incident, but upon arrival at the border of her own estates, Mara's worry lessened as she felt something of the familiar calm that came from the knowledge of being home. And yet, for the first time in her life, she felt gnawed from within by a sense of something missing. She pondered why as her bearers took her litter up the road to the estate house. Yet the cause eluded her until the moment she set foot in her own front dooryard and accepted greetings from Nujan, Kiyoke and Nakoya. The house seemed suddenly insignificant. Mara felt a passing sadness that she no longer looked upon the home of her father as the grand and wonderful place it had seemed throughout her childhood. As ruling lady and clan war chief, she now saw only a spread of land that was difficult to defend and a dwelling that was comfortably appointed but lacking the grand presence and state guest suites needful to a ruler of her status. For a moment, Mara entertained the bitter thought that her most hated enemy should thrive in a place that was both the most defensible location in the Empire and the most beautiful. As Mara crossed the threshold, Kevin, in his customary place behind her, Nakoya pursued. Nettled that the mistress had returned only perfunctory salutations, the old woman nearly abandoned composure. What has overcome you, Mara? Are you bereft of wits? The reprimand stung the lady out of her thought. She spun to face her adviser, her frown an open warning. What do you mean? This assumption of the war chief's staff. Nakoya wagged her finger, much as she did in her days as a children's nurse. Why didn't you discuss your intentions before you acted? Mara stood firmly, her arms folded. The idea never occurred to me until I was halfway to Kentasani. When I left, I thought I could convince the clan to do as I asked. But upon the river, I had time to think. I wish you had put the time to better use... The Akoma first advisor cut in. Nakoya! Mara's eyes flashed rage. I will not be scolded like a girl. What do you object to? 
The first adviser bowed precisely to the correct degree, which meant she was not cowed. In tones near to scorn, she said, I beg your pardon, lady, but since you have compelled Khan Hadama to recognise your primacy, you have also forced public notice that you are now a power to be contended with. Caught off guard, Mara tried to wave the matter off. Nothing has changed, save... Nakoya put her old hands firmly upon Mara's shoulders and looked her mistress in the eyes. Much has changed. Before, you were seen as a resourceful girl who could escape traps and strengthen her house and defend herself. Even after Jingu's death, the mighty of the empire could cast your success off as luck. But now, by making others relinquish honours, you announce to the world that you are a threat. Tasayo must act, and he must do so soon. The longer he waits, the more his allies and vassals will come to doubt his resolve. Before, he might remain content to wait for a clear opportunity. Now, he must do something. You have made him desperate. Mara felt a sudden current of cold. With certainty, she knew Nakoya was correct in her appraisal. Made nervous as fresh worries tangled with others arising from her trade difficulties, she closed her eyes a moment. You are right. Smiling thinly in chagrin, she regained her poise and added, I have acted precipitately and... Well, the best that can be done is to hold counsel with my staff as soon as I have refreshed myself. We must... Make plans. Nakoya nodded grumpy approval. As Kevin escorted Mara to her quarters, the old woman fretted, not only because Mara acted without thought, but also because she looked tired, truly bone-tired. As many years as Nakoya had served, she had never known the daughter of her heart to appear so worn. The Akoma first adviser sighed and shook her head. The Akoma ministers could meet and talk all they liked. Plans might be made and acted upon, but truly, what could be done to ensure Akoma's security and prosperity that had not been tried already? Feeling her age and the ache in every joint that suffered from arthritis, the old woman shuffled slowly down the corridor. Every day since the Lord Sezu had died and left his holdings to his daughter, Nakoya had known fear that her beloved Mara might become a casualty of the great game. Yet the lady had proven herself a capable, cunning player. Why, then, should the fear be worse today? Or was it just an aged woman's bones protesting a life of long service? Nakoya shivered, though the afternoon was warm. At every step she took, she seemed to feel the earth of her own grave beneath the soles of her feet. Word returned from Ontoset. Mara read the message twice, a stormy frown on her face. Restraining a vicious urge to tear something, she hurled the parchment onto her writing desk. The move was entirely unexpected, but Netoha had refused her very generous fees for the use of the rift on his lands. It makes no sense, Mara exploded aloud, and in the corner of her study, Arakasi raised one eyebrow. Dressed as a gardener, the spy master contemplated the edge of the small sickle he had been using to prune kakali bushes. He still insisted on keeping his return to the estate a secret, for his suspicions concerning Tasayo's penetration of Mara's security were far from laid to rest. The mistress might not wish to talk the matter through, her mind being diverted by other things, but Arakasi had his own worries. He currently spent as much time investigating servants and slaves upon the Akoma estates as he did conducting the business his mistress required of him. 
Only Nikoya knew of his concerns, as the old woman was above suspicion. Arakasi tested the edge on the laminated tool with his finger and assumed a posture that would appear to an onlooker as if the lady berated a servant for carelessness. Mistress, I have discovered little about this man, Netoha. His motives are not public. He must have cogent reasons for refusing your offer. Obviously, he cannot do business across the rift himself because of your trading rights. Yet, I cannot tell you what his reasons may be. Mara tugged at a tight hairpin in frustration. Her message to Fumita of the assembly had been returned unopened, so her last recourse to gain her trade concessions was this Netoha. Although Arakasi did not care to be pressured, she said, Can you get someone close to the Chichimechas to discover what these reasons may be? I can but attempt to, lady. Trying hard not to look harried, Arakasi added, It is unlikely we shall learn anything new, but I can have someone exchange gossip with the house and field servants. Netoha's workers are largely barbarians. Mara broke in. Mitkemians! Arakasi nodded. The renegade magician Milamba freed all his countrymen before leaving, and this Netoha employs them as workers. I would say from reports out of Ontuset that they do well enough as farmers. In any event, these are likely to be more garrulous than our own slaves, so getting information shouldn't prove difficult, if, that is, they know anything worth hearing. Aware of Nakoya's taut stillness at her elbow, Ma returned to the next issue at hand. What of Minwanabi? Arakasi's hand stilled on the sickle. I worry, mistress, precisely because I have nothing to report. Tasayo conducts the business of his household much as you do your own, but with nothing that I would account extraordinarily significant. The spymaster exchanged glances with Mara's first adviser. This goes against expectations. Upon hearing of your rise to the primacy of the clan, Tasayo should have been moved to act at once, but instead... Arakasi glanced about, then said... One other thing. The Minuanabi have begun a primitive spy network and are attempting to insinuate agents into several locations throughout the Empire. They are not hard to spot, since in Como, the Minuanabi first advisor proceeds in a heavy-handed manner. I have men watching his men and am reasonably certain we can infiltrate his ring soon. That will give us a secondary access to his household and affairs, and, when this is accomplished, I shall feel reassured. Yet I dare not proceed too quickly. The whole operation may be an elaborate ploy to draw us out. And yet, Mara sensed, that would not be Tasayo's style. The subtleties in his nature tended toward cruelty and his tactics to military violence. Involved in deep thoughts once again, she absently waved dismissal to her spymaster. She did not notice him leaving, and had forgotten the coyer was in the room until the old woman spoke. I feel a chill in my bones, daughter. Mara started slightly. What worries you, Nakoya? Minwanabi plots. You rely too much on Arakasi's informants. They may be well placed, but they are not everywhere. They are not at Tasayo's side when he squats or when he lies atop his wife, and you must believe that this is a man who plots murder even while relieving himself or taking a woman to his bed. Mara found nothing humorous in the images, 
the Nicoya spoke truth. Arakasi's agents might have ferreted out nothing overtly threatening toward her house, but the reports were disturbing nonetheless. Tasayo ruled his household with a wayward, cunning viciousness. His abuses were those that tormented the mind and heart, and yet, where a sworn enemy was concerned, Mara knew there was no blood in the empire he would rather spill than her own and her young son Ayaki's. Chapter 23 Sortie The year passed. Distracted with worry over continuing trade difficulties and Tasayo's apparent lack of activity, Mara waited as the rainy season came and went. Nidra calves were weaned from their mothers and the little bulls charged around the meadow. When they were sufficiently grown, the herdsmen picked out those that were gelded and those that were to be used for breeding. Crops were planted and harvested and an uncertain peace held sway. Days slipped by without any resolution to Mara's uncertainty. A thousand responses to a thousand possible assaults were discussed and discarded, and no Minwanabi threat materialised. A thousand moves in the game of the council were planned, but the Emperor did not relent in his edict against the High Council. Seated in her study in the cooler hours of early morning and clad in a loose, short robe, Mara studied the slates and parchments Jikan had left for her. Since her frustrating setback in Kentasani, Akoma fortunes were improving. Her assumption of the position of clan war chief had precipitated no disasters. Gradually, the herds were recovering from the outlays made necessary from the Dastari campaign. The silk trade at last was flourishing. Although Nakoya seized every opportunity to nag that her mistress was neglecting the matter of marriage, Mara refused to be moved. With Tasayo consolidating his power as the lord of the Minwanabi, even someone from a family as favourably placed these days as was Hokanu's would be foolish to agree to a union until the issue between Minwanabi and Akoma had been decided. Except for Zakatekas and, less dependably, Anasati, alliances with the Akoma had become tentative. Mara sighed and pushed back a fallen lock of hair. Not yet strong enough to initiate the first overture, she had grown practised at waiting. A soft tap at the screen disturbed her. Mara gestured for the servant hovering beyond the door to enter. He bowed. My lady, there is a bonded messenger awaiting you in the antechamber. Send him in. Mara had enjoyed two hours of quiet contemplation since dawn, and now that the inevitable interruption had occurred, she was anxious to know the news. The courier brought before her was dusty from the road and clad in a tunic of bleached cloth, tagged on the sleeves with the badge of a guild from Pesh. Since Mara had no dealings with any family from that city, this piqued her interest. You may sit, she allowed as the courier completed his bow. He carried no documents. The message he brought would be oral, guaranteed by his life oath of silence. Mara waved for a servant to bring Jamach juice in case the man's throat was dry from travel. He inclined his head when the refreshment arrived and gratefully took a long swallow. I bring greeting to the Akoma from the Lord Zaltepo of the Hanku. The messenger paused for another sip, politely allowing the lady an interval to call to mind what she knew of this lord's house, clan and political affiliations. Mara needed the time, since the Hanker were a minor house that had never previously dealt with the Akoma. They were of the Nimboni, a clan so tiny that it regularly associated with other larger clans, which other clans it was allied with at present Mara didn't recall. Arakasi would know. He might also confirm whether Zaltepo had renewed his participation in the Yellow Flower Party since the demise of the Alliance for War. The Yellow Flower Party had no ties with the Minwanabi, but had occasionally supported common interests with them before Almecho wore the white and gold, and the changes effected by his successor, Aksantuka, had disrupted the old alliances. 
The Yellow Flower Party currently fended for itself, and the Nimboni quite likely inclined to favour the Kanazawa clan. Perhaps this was an overture in that direction. Mara sighed over this season's unrecognisable snarl of politics. Without Arakasi's network, she would be floundering, relying upon guesswork and not leading her clan decisively through the moil. The messenger finished his drink and politely awaited her attention. At a wave from Mara, he resumed, The Lord of the Hanker formally requests that you consider an alliance with his house. If you would judge the matter to be in a coma interests, Lord Zaltepo asks for a meeting to discuss his proposal. A house slave unobtrusively removed the emptied juice cup. Mara used the interval to formulate a swift decision. I am flattered by the offer from the Lord of the Hankur, and will reply through one of my own couriers. This was politely non-committal and not unusual, since a ruler near Sulankur would be unfamiliar with the guild of another city. Conscious of security, Mara intended to hire from a known guild, but to dismiss this courier without thanks was to insinuate mistrust, if not to imply dishonour. The lady sent her runner to summon Sarik. By now familiar with the duties of a second advisor, he would accompany the guild messenger to a distant chamber and see him occupied with banalities until the heat passed and the man could politely be dismissed. Financial reports no longer gripped Mara's attention. Throughout the morning, she pondered the hanker's unexpected overture without assuming what their motive might be. Lord Zaltepo might earnestly desire an alliance, and this must not be treated lightly. Since Mara's public rise to the office of clan war chief, it could be but the first of many such approaches. To ignore this would be folly. Far more dangerous, he might be puppet for some other better-known enemy who used him to disguise another plot against her. She waited until the courier's departure before dispatching Arakasi to make inquiries. After supper, she called counsel. Weary of the stifling stillness of her study, with screens and drapes drawn closed, she decided that a meeting in the garden courtyard adjacent to her quarters, under the light of lanterns, would be more comfortable. The garden had a single entrance, securely guarded. Settled on cushions under the tree beside the fountain, Mara regretted her preoccupation with security. For an envious moment, she once again recalled Tassayo's estate, a beautiful building on spacious grounds, fortified by steep hills and the naturally defensible valley with its lake and narrow tributary. Unlike other nobles situated in the low country, the Minwanabi lord need not vigilantly keep guard over broad acres of borders. He required only sentries in watchtowers on his hilltops and patrols stationed at key points along the perimeter of his estates. Where the Akoma required five full companies of a hundred warriors each dedicated to the main estate to optimally maintain its defences, a goal still unrealised after over a decade of carefully building her resources, the Minwanabi could do better with as few as two hundred soldiers guarding twice the land. That lower cost of security for the home estate provided Tasayo with resources for political mischief that Mara lacked, despite her rapidly expanding financial empire. Mara regarded her circle of advisers, larger than before, with younger faces added and older ones the more aged by contrast. Nakoya became more wrinkled and hunched with each passing month. Kiyoke could not sit quite so erect, yet he remained a stickler for appearances. He kept his good leg crossed over his stump and his crutch painstakingly out of view. For all his care, Mara could never quite accustom herself to the sight of him in house robes instead of armour. For formal meetings of her council, no servants were present, but in the role of body slave, Kevin sat beside and behind her, surreptitiously playing with her hair, which she had let down from its pins. Then there was Jikan, with his hands dusty from chalk, and Sarik, young, eager and shrewd around the eyes where Lujan was deceptively carefree. 
her spymaster had not yet returned from the docks of Selenkur, where he had gone to meet the contact who carried intelligence from Pesh. Since Arakasi's word would bear heaviest influence, Mara began before his arrival to lend time to hear her other advisers. Nikoya opened. Lady Mara, you know nothing of these upstart hunkers. They are not an old family. They share none of your interests politically, and I worry they may be the glove for an enemy's hand. The first adviser's views had grown increasingly cautious of late. The Lady of the Acoma was unsure if this resulted from Mara's rise to the clan war chief's office or from a fear of Tassayo that was deepening with age. Increasingly, Mara looked to Sarek for a more balanced weighing of risk and gain. Though barely out of his twenties, the soldier-turned-counsellor was quick-witted, sly and often sarcastic in his advice. His overt playfulness seemed at odds with the deeper, barbed cynicism, but his observations were consistently astute. Nakoya's reasoning is sound. He opened his eyes boldly on Mara and his hands running over and over a lacquered bracelet on his wrist as though he tested the edge of a blade. He gave a soldier's shrug. But I would add that we know too little about the Lord of the Hankur. If he acts in good faith, we would offend if we refuse to hear his case. Even if we could afford to affront this little house, we do not wish the Acoma to gain a reputation for being unapproachable. We might politely reject his alliance after hearing his cause, and no offence will be given. Sarek tipped his head slightly and ended with his customary question, But can we afford to refuse him without inquiring what his motives may be? A telling point. Mara conceded. Kiyoke? Her advisor for war reached to straighten a helmet no longer there and ended by scratching thinning hair. I should look closely at the arrangements proposed for your conference. The Lord could have an assassin waiting or an ambush where he wishes to meet with you and under what conditions will tell us much. That the force commander did not question the necessity for a parley was not lost on Mara. Lujan, from his days as a grey warrior, gave a new perspective. The Hankur are regarded as mavericks by the powerful houses of Pesh. I was acquainted with the cousin of one of my sub-officers' wives, who served Zaltepo as patrol leader. The Hankur lord was said to be a man who seldom shared his confidences, and did so only upon occasions of mutual advantage. That they are a new house has been said, but the rise of the family is due to their powerful business interests in the south. Jikan followed Lu Jan's lead and widened the picture. The Hanko have an interest in Cho Cha La. Being weak at one time, they were mercilessly exploited by the guilds. Lord Zaltepo's father tired of losing his profits. When he came to power, he hired in his own bean grinders and reinvested his Chochala profits back into that enterprise. His son has continued to broaden the business, and now they are, if not dominant, a major factor in the southern markets. He boasts a thriving trade and processes crops from other growers. It is possible he desires an arrangement that will bring the beans of our Toscalora vassal into his drying sheds. In Pesh? Mara straightened, interrupting Kevin's attentions. Why should Lord Jiddu risk the mould and damp of shipping his crops by sea, or the expense of an overland caravan? For profit, Jikan speculated in his inevitably neat fashion. The soil and the climate are wrong for Chochala that far down the peninsula. Even the Hankur's inferior beans yield high revenues there. Most growers grind their crops close to home to save the weight of shipping the husks. But 
The bean keeps better in its unshelled form, and the Hankur spice grinders could get luxury prices for any chochala they could process in what now is idle time between seasons. And they effectively remove a potential rival from the local market. Eventually, such a relationship might provide an entrance for their goods into the heartland of the empire. Then why not approach Lord Jidu? Mara argued. Jikan spread placating hands. Lady, you may have allowed the Lord of the Tuscalora his rights to negotiate his finances, but among the merchants and factors in the cities, you are spoken of as his overlord. They cannot conceive any ruler being as open-handed in policy as you have been. Therefore, word in the markets says you are in control. Jitu would protest, Mara objected. Now Nakoya leaned forward. My lady, he does not dare. He has his man's pride. It rankles him to have been bested by a woman. Lord Jiddu would rather avoid being the object of more street gossip than turn to you with complaint. The discussion of this point continued in depth, with Kevin listening raptly. The Midkemian was silent not so much out of deference as fascination with the intricacy of Surani politics. Lately, if he contributed an opinion, it was less from ignorant impulse and more out of insight lent by an alien viewpoint. Mara weighed the counsel of her advisers and tried to avoid the looming distraction of how much she was going to miss her barbarian when she finally faced her neglected responsibility and chose a suitable husband. Unsettled as the current politics became, she cherished this moment, surrounded by people who cared for her and the soft familiar warmth of the summer night. Lantern light fell kindly over the faces of Kiyoki and Nakoya, softening the lines of adversity. It caught Sarik's eyes in a moment of fired enthusiasm, and it hid the weariness in Jikan's posture. Not a day passed that the Hadonra failed to visit the remotest field on the estate. Since Dostari, he visited the city every morning, leaving before sunrise and returning before mid-morning, enduring two hours of travel to gain earliest word of trade fluctuations from his factors. Few opportunities escaped his diligence, but Mara wished adversities would ease, that she need not lean so heavily on his resources. Jikan had taught her much in the intricate world of finance, and her other advisers had rescued the Akoma from disasters invited by her inexperience in her first days of leadership. Silently, she thanked Lashima for the guidance of good people. With her pledge to Clan Hadama binding her and the Minwanabi blood feud against her, she dared not contemplate the loss of any one of those present. The talk at last wound down. Mara reviewed the major points, a pensive frown on her face. It looks as though I should send a message to Lord Zaltepo, setting a meeting that will most favour my safety. Jikan, could you arrange to rent one of the guild halls in Sulanque? But a dry voice interrupted before the Hadonra could answer. My lady, with all due respect... A public place might not be the best of choices. Unnoticed, quiet as shadow, Arakasi had slipped into the garden. As he bowed, Kiyoke's lips stiffened. Annoyed with himself for missing the moment when the guards at the entry granted a newcomer entrance, the old warrior would never admit his hearing was growing less acute. Arakasi bowed, his face veiled by the loose cloth of a priest's cowl. He waited in his distinctively quiet manner for Mara's leave, then added, I should warn at once that this request by Lord Zaltepo is known to the Minwanabi. My sources indicate that Tasayo is personally intent upon finding out where a meeting between my lady and the Hankur might take place. If a guild hall is rented, 
I fear there may be spies in the walls, and if there are presently no niches for unfriendly parties to eavesdrop, you can presume such would be constructed in time for our mistress's conference. Tasayo is that persistent when he wants a thing. The spymaster hesitated, as if his own words were distasteful to him. My source was emphatic, much more so than usual. Tasayo wants knowledge of this meeting quite badly. Mara's fingers tightened on her cuffs. By this I conclude that the Hanker's interests go against those of our enemies. It lends weight to the notion that the Hanker's desire for alliance is valid. But Arakasi did not seem entirely settled. Too many unanswered questions remain. Expansion of the Hanker's spice enterprise seems a motive, but that is speculation. Also, there's a vague rumour that the Nimboni have been approached by Clan Shonshoni. The spymaster's manner betrayed disquiet. There are things here that are too clear, given how much is unseen. You worry? I, lady. Something in his... He shook his head. Perhaps I've grown wary of too much information gained easily. He shrugged. Not having kept a close watch upon the Hanker, it's not unreasonable that their affairs would escape my notice. I urge caution, though, in the extreme. Meet with Lord Zaltepo somewhere easily defended, if not here, upon your estates, if not on home ground, then somewhere close at hand where we keep an advantage. Mara weighed the advice. You speak wisely, as always. Caution must be exercised. No opportunity for advantage can be wasted, however slight. I'll meet with Lord Zaltepo not in a guild hall, but in that glen in the mountains where Lujan's band once made their camp. It is not upon a coma soil, yet we have the advantage should any trouble arise. Arakasi looked dusty and gaunt after his hurried trip to town. Mara dismissed him to seek refreshment, and the rest of her advisers disbanded, talking among themselves. Once outside the garden, all would be silent concerning the subject of Lord Zaltepo. Kevin alone remained seated. He slid his arms around Mara's waist and buried his cheek in her hair. What do you say to a special sort of counsel between the two of us? Mara turned her face to be kissed. Kevin's hair glowed russet in the lantern light, and his hands well knew where to touch. As his lips closed over hers, Mara prepared to surrender her worries for the night. My lady! snapped Nakoya's acerbic voice. Unwanted as a state visitor, the first adviser lingered in the courtyard. Stop your foolishness and hear warning! Mara disengaged from Kevin's embrace. Her eyes were bright, her hair slightly mussed, and her temper short. Speak, mother of my heart, but do not presume upon my patience. Lately, her first adviser seemed to seize upon every opportunity to insinuate the folly of Kevin's presence. Though Mara understood that the old woman's persistence stemmed from care, tonight she was determined to enjoy the few moments she had left with the man she loved. However kindly meant, Nakoya's concern was not welcome. The first adviser did not lecture about her inopportune choice of bedmate, but crossed her wrinkled arms and stood firmly. You rely far too much on those spies of Arakasis. Mara's gaze darkened. They have never failed me. They have never dealt directly with Tasayo. Nikoya waved a stern finger. Remember the silk caravans? Desio discovered one of Arakasi's agents, and ill came of that. His cousin will not be so stupid. He will not be lulled into thinking he has no watchers in his house. But 
unlike Desio, Tasayo will not be led by hate on discovery his security was compromised. He would spare his traitor, even nurture the man, and await his moment to exploit. A breeze swayed the lantern. Netted by a moving play of shadows, Mara gestured her irritation. Do you suggest we should rent the public guild hall? Depend upon the security provided by clanless man. Nikoya pinched her sleeves as the errant wind flapped her robe. I say no such thing, except to beseech you to beware. Arakasi is very good, the best of men who work in secret I have ever heard of in my years of serving this house. But his former master of the Tuskai was ruined despite his spying. Remember that. Informants can be helpful, but they are never infallible. All tools can break or be turned into weapons. Mara stiffened, acutely feeling the chill as Kevin's warmth drew away. Old Mother... Your warnings are heard. I thank you for your counsel. Nikoya knew better than to persist. She bowed in deep disapproval, then turned and limped out of the garden. She's right, you know, the old nag, Kevin murmured fondly. Mara spun and snapped at him. You too! Does every evening have to be filled with warnings and fear? She tossed her dark hair aching inside more than she would ever put into words. Though Kevin perhaps thought better of it, he indulged her whim and gathered her close. He kissed the hardness out of her, and on the cushions in the flicker of a breeze-tossed lantern he made her forget the enemies who sought her life and the utter ending of her family. Within three weeks, high summer set in. The grasses lost the last green that lingered from the rainy season. Mara stepped out of the estate house into the misty pre-dawn gloom. Her litter awaited, surrounded by a picked guard of thirty warriors, led this day by Kenji, who needed the field experience. For her journey to meet with the Lord of the Hankur, she planned to be in the mountains before the heat of midday, and, at Arakasi's suggestion, she kept her escort light for speed and secrecy. Her adviser for war had insisted on seeing her off, since Nakoya was no longer up to rising in early morning. Yet no adviser waited in the dooryard as Mara made her appearance, Kevin following at the proper pace behind her shoulder, but ever mindful of propriety. The old codger must have slept late, the barbarian said lightly. I should take the chance to get back at him for the time he kicked me awake with his war sandals on. I heard that! called a voice well-trained from the drill field. Kiyoke emerged from the ranks of Mara's bodyguard, a craggy silhouette incongruously propped on a crutch. He paused to speak emphatic instructions to Kenji, to snap at a man for sloppy posture, then, plainly reluctant to leave the warriors, he shot a disparaging glance at Kevin and assumed his post before Mara's litter. My lady! He bowed with well-practised balance and replaced his crutch beneath his shoulder. Then he looked intently at his mistress, as if he marshalled words instead of troops. His voice dropped, so that the soldiers would not overhear. Daughter of my heart, I feel uneasy about this trip. The fact that Lord Saltepo sent speech in the mouth of a messenger rather than written above his family chop has suspicious overtones. Mara frowned. They are a small family with few ties. If I were to decline alliance and that parchment with their personal chop should fall into Tasayo's hands, what do you think would become of them? The Minuanabi have obliterated other families for far less cause. She bit her lip. No, I think Arakasi is right, and that Tasayo finally sees that much of what we have done has been built upon financial gain, and now he must counter further Akoma expansion. Kiyoke raised his hand, as if he had begun to scratch his chin and then thought better of it. 
Instead, he took Mara's wrist and gently settled her into the litter. Go with the good God's grace, my lady. He stepped back as Mara waved for the bearers to lift her litter. Then Kenji gave the command to march and the small cortege started forward. As Kevin moved to fall into step beside his mistress, Kiyoke caught his elbow in a grip still calloused and strong. Protect her, he said, an urgency in his tone that Kevin had never heard before. Let no harm come to her, or I'll kick you with more than my battle sandals. Kevin grinned insouciantly. Kiyoki, old friend, if harm comes to Mara, you'll have to settle for kicking my corpse, because by then I'll already be dead. The advisor for war nodded, allowing that this was true. He released the slave and turned quickly away while Mara's escort and bearers marched into the mist. Kevin hastened to catch up, looking often over his shoulder. Far less the foreigner than he once was, the Midkemian would have sworn that the crafty old warrior had something pressing on his mind. By the time the rising sun burned the mist off the valleys, Mara and her honour guard were deep in the forest that covered the foothills of the Kayamaka Mountains. Before the day's traffic of caravans began and out of sight of early couriers, they turned off the main road, striking down a narrow trail that threaded ever deeper into the wilds. Daylight was not strong here and the mist lingered, lending a gloom to the wood and the drip of wet trees. Already the damp heat was oppressive. Strike leader Kenji motioned his small column of warriors to halt for a short break and to allow a change of bearers for Mara's litter. The escort was too small to include a water boy. The slaves carried crocs from the spring by the roadside, helped by Kevin, who felt sorry for their plight. Mara was not a heavy load to carry, but this day her haste was great and the bearers, just relieved from duty, were sweat-drenched and panting. Crock in hand, Kevin knelt at the verge of a still, mossy pool fed by a spring from a fissure in the rocks. Intrigued by the alien orange moss that clothed the banks and by the iridescent flash of fish that darted through aqua strands of weed, he only half heard Strike Leader Kenji say to Mara that the scout who held back to watch the trail for followers was slow to report. We shall delay to see if he arrives, the officer decided. If he does not come within a minute, I suggest we slip into the cover of the trees until a man can be sent to investigate. Kevin grinned to himself and bent to fill his basin. The scout in question was Juratu, a quick-witted, lively man who liked his pleasures. He had kept late hours gambling with friends the night before. If he had drunk half as much wine as Barrack's rumour claimed, he'd likely be found moving at less than anticipated speed, slowed by a grandfather of hangovers. One of the soldiers said as much to Kenji, then added that this was the haunt of grey warriors, and perhaps Juratu had paused to observe their movements. Another dryly suggested he might be bartering with them for a wineskin. Kevin indulged in a chuckle. Had the lady herself not been present, such an antic would certainly be within Juratu's reputation. Thinking of Grey Warriors and his few Midkemian companions who had escaped and taken refuge in these forests, Kevin peered through the trees as he rose. The mist was lifting. Pale spears of sunlight fell through the canopy of branches. Had Kevin not been half-expectantly looking for the chance-met shape of a man, he would have missed the movement. The brief flickering sight of a face through the leaves, there and then hastily gone. The nose had been narrow and hooked, and the helm was not Juratu's. Kevin's hands tautened over the crock and water spilled, wetting his knuckles in a flood. He dared not cry out or even run, lest he reveal that the hidden watcher had been seen. Sweating, more than a little shaky in the knees, Kevin turned his back on the spring. In imitation of a slave's listless shuffle, he made his way step by nerve-racked step back to Mara's caravan. The skin between his shoulder blades itched, as if at any moment he expected the terrible stab of an arrow. 
The dozen steps that separated him from Kenji and Mara's litter seemed to take an eternity. Kevin forced his feet to walk sedately while his thoughts raced. The litter curtains were cracked open, with Mara on the verge of leaning out to address Kenji. Fear shot like a bolt through Kevin's nerves. He pinched the water crock in a death grip and inwardly willed the woman to lean back out of sight in the shadow of her litter. Being Mara, she did not. She shoved the curtains wider, looked up at her strike leader and opened her mouth to speak. Feeling danger like a breaking wave at his back, Kevin acted. He tripped hard on a rock and flung the contents of his water crock over the lady and her officer. He followed up this clumsiness by crashing full length into the litter. His mistress's cry of surprise and outrage became smothered under his chest as he forced her down and back deep into the cushions, safe behind the protection of his body as he flipped the litter on its side, turning it into a breastwork. His action came none too soon. Even as Kevin disentangled himself from the silk curtains, enemy arrows began to fall. They sang out of air, smacking through dirt and armour with an evil, flat sound like the blows of punitive hands. Kenji was first to fall. He went down screaming orders while arrows hammered and hammered the underside slats of the spilled litter, raised now before Mara like a barricade. It's an ambush! Kevin snarled in her ear while she beat with her fists to try to tear from his embrace. Keep still! An arrow whacked through a cushion and rammed a groove through the dirt. Mara saw and instantly went still. She listened, stricken, to the shouting as those warriors left alive to heed their dying officer's call to rally threw themselves in a heap on top of the litter, their bodies her living shield. The situation was desperate. The arrows crashed down in a rain, and the flimsy underpinnings of the litter bounced and splintered with the impact. Kevin tried to see out and caught a raking slash across his shoulder. He cursed, ducked back, and, in a rush, peeled off his slave's robe. Two of the warriors nearest Mara were dying, wounded as they dived to her defence. Now the cold hiss of shafts was replaced by the rattle of swordplay as ambushers charged from the forest in a wave and engaged the tatters of her guard still left standing. Quick! Kevin snapped. He held out his robe. Bundle my lady into this! Her fancy clothes make too clear a target! One of the bearers threw back a look of uncertainty. Just do it! Kevin shouted. Her honour is dust if she's dead! More warriors charged from the cover of the wood. Mara's few survivors closed in a ragged ring around the litter. They were too few, a pitiful dyke against an avalanche of foes. Kevin abandoned further argument, for a swordsman charged out of the melee with a lowered blade to take him in the back. Kevin snatched up a fallen weapon and snapped off a length of curtain that he wrapped around his arm to serve as a shield. Then he spun at bay and prepared to kill until he died. At home, on the Akoma estate, Ayaki scowled blackly at Nakoya. His face turned red and his fists clenched, and she and two slaves and a nurse all prepared for a warrior-sized tantrum. I won't wear that, Ayaki shouted. It has orange, and that is the colour worn by Mimwanabi. Nakoya regarded the garment at hand, a silk robe fastened with shell buttons that might, with imagination, be called orange. The real reason behind the argument was that Ayaki preferred to wear no robe at all in the heat and humidity of high summer. That he was too well born to charge about naked as a slave child through the hallways made no impression on nine-year-old priorities. But Nakoya had years of experience at managing high-spirited Akoma children. She caught Ayaki's stiff shoulders and gave him a shake. Young warrior, you will wear the robes you are given and deport yourself like the lord you will be when you are grown. If you do less, you will spend the morning scrubbing dirty plates with the scullions. Ayaki's eyes widened. You'd never dare! I am not a servant or slave! Then stop acting like one and dress like a noble! 
Nikoya closed a puffed, arthritic hand over Ayaki's wrist and hauled him firmly across the chamber to the servant who waited with the robe. Even stiff and sore, she still had a grip like iron. Ayaki stopped struggling, shoved his bunched fist into a waiting sleeve, then stood scowling and rubbing at the red mark where the skin on his wrist had pulled. Now the other hand, Nakoya snapped. No more nonsense! Ayaki's dark look lifted and he grinned. No more nonsense, he agreed in one of his instant shifts of mood. He submitted his other hand to the servant, and presently the offending robe was settled over his shoulders. His smile widened until he showed his missing front teeth, and he deliberately reached up and jerked off the first shell button. The robe is all right, he announced defiantly, but I will wear no orange. Demon! Nakoya swore under her breath. She was definitely too tired to manhandle willful little boys. She settled for smacking his cheek, which shocked him into a loud shriek of rage. The yell was loud enough to defeat thought, and the servants winced. The guards in the corridor were distracted and did not hear the soft footfall as a black-clothed figure leapt on silent feet through the screen. Suddenly, the servant standing nearest reeled aside with a knife in his back. He fell without a cry. Even as the assassin's shadow sliced across the sunlight, the second servant toppled with a cut throat. Nakoya felt the thud as the corpse struck the wooden floor. Instinctively attuned to danger, she reached down and caught the Akoma heir, who still howled, and flung him headlong into the corner. He landed rolling amid bed mat and cushions still in mourning disarray. The first advisor called for the guards, but her voice was aged and weak. Her warning went unheard. Ayaki screamed now in blind rage, intent on disentangling himself from his bedclothes. Only Nakoya saw his peril and the servants bleeding out their lives on the nursery floor. Demon! she said again, but this time to the black-clothed figure of the Tong assassin. He had pulled another knife from his belt and a cord looped the fingers of his left hand. His face was hidden behind a black gauze call. His fists were gloved. Nothing showed but his eyes as he stalked to take his victim, the boy who was Mara's heir. Only Nakoya stood in his way. Already the knife rose for a throw to cut her down. No! Nakoya flung forward as the knife left his hand. She made a dive for his left wrist and the cord held ready for Ayaki's throat. The blade flashed over the first advisor's head and thunked in the plaster wall. The assassin cursed and sidestepped, but Nakoya caught his garrote. Her nails tore through thin leather, raked his knuckles like claws and twisted in a death grip on the cord. You won't! She called again for guards, but her thin voice was not equal to the task. The assassin wasted no time in wrestling. His eyes narrowed in contempt, and his right hand closed on a wooden handle and drew the next knife in line on his belt. He seemed perversely delighted as he drove the point deep between the old woman's ribs. Nakoya's lips curled back from her teeth with the pain. She hung on. Die! Old woman! The assassin gave the knife a vicious twist. Nakoya shuddered. An agonised cry escaped her, but her hands tightened harder on the cord. He will not be killed in dishonour! She wrung out. Behind her, Ayaki's cries died. He saw the knife in the wall above his head, and then the blood that snaked across the floorboards. One of the fallen servants still quivered in his death throes. Paralysed with terror, an orange shell button still clenched in one fist, Ayaki bit back a whimper. The assassin, he decided, must be Tasayo. With that realisation, the courage that was his father's reasserted itself in force. Attack! he shouted. Attack! and with his head filled with visions of warriors, he scrambled from his pillows and beat upon the intruder's thigh. The Tong took no notice. He shoved the knife deeper into Nakoya. Blood ran hot over his hand, soaking his glove as he jerked his garrote from her grip. 
She crumpled quickly, fell over into Ayaki and pinned the boy under her dying weight. The good gods curse upon you, she croaked hoarsely at the tong. Her strength inexorably ebbed. Ayaki wriggled free. The assassin grabbed at the boy and tripped. Nakoya had caught his ankle, but her life was fading fast. The assassin recovered instantly, stamped on her wrist and yanked free. Across the chamber, through failing vision, the old woman saw the guards had finally reacted. They charged through the nursery doorway, their armour shining unbearably in bright sunlight. With drawn swords they ran bellowing battle cries across the chamber toward the tong. Behind her, the assassin pounced. Little Ayaki howled wrathfully. Nakoya struggled to raise her cheek from a puddle of pooling blood. She could not see but only hear the scuffle of Ayaki's bare feet drumming on the floorboards. Her vision went dark and her dying thought was recognition. The cord was still tangled in her fingers. She had done nothing more than force the assassin to use his knives. A boy who died honourably by the blade would still be dead. Ay, Aki, she murmured, and then heartbrokenly, Mara, as darkness took her. Kevin lunged, thrust, and cleared his sword. An enemy fell screaming at his feet. He leapt over the thrashing, gut-wounded man and met another. Somewhere in the fray, he had picked up a foe's shield and it had saved his life. He had taken another cut in his left shoulder and a glancing slash across the ribs. His movements were hampered by the sting. Blood flowed over his bare skin and soaked soggily into his loincloth. Every movement hurt. The enemy swordsman exchanged three strokes with him before realising he fought a slave. He snarled an oath and dodged past. Kevin stabbed him unceremoniously from behind. Die for Surani honour, the barbarian cried savagely. Gods, please let the runts keep being stupid. Let them keep underestimating his war skills, that Mara might stay alive. But there were too many. Enemies kept sallying from the trees. As Kevin whirled to stave off another attacker, he realised the Akoma were more than just surrounded. Their circle was breached. Foes charged through and started hacking at the bodies that lay across the litter, which sheltered Mara. The Midkemian screamed like a banshee and ran a man through. He abandoned his blade in the corpse, snatched up another from the ground. In the same unbroken movement, he kicked over the fallen litter. The wooden frame hammered down, driving enemy soldiers into a scattered rush back. Then the litter thumped to a rest, with Mara and her shield of dying bodyguards fenced underneath. Kevin charged over the barrier. Back, you pig-licking dogs! He added obscenities in Sirani and hurtled over the wreckage. His blood-streaked, near-naked body and berserker's howl startled the lead ranks into hesitation. He landed on an arrow, felt the sting of its four-bladed head cut his heel and cursed again in Yarbon dialect. May Chirikamu eat your heart for breakfast, he ended, and then the swords came at him. He could not parry so many, nor could he wonder if his use of the litter for a ram had injured Mara. He only understood he would die here and was not pleased with the prospect. A sword sliced his shin. He stumbled, fell, rolled. The air above his head became bisected by weapons driving to impale him. They narrowly bit earth. He felt the disturbed dirt strike his shoulders. He unlimbered his shield and rolled hard over again, bringing it upward in a vicious blow to the groin of a man who moved too slowly. Kevin's body wedged at last under the canted litter. His searching fingers encountered a fallen shield. He twisted, scraping against wood, and came up with the shield in front. His palms stung as enemy blows rained down, momentarily thwarted. Gods! 
this can't last. His curses now sounded suspiciously like crying. And the swords hammered his shield incessantly. They split toughened nidrahide and wood and left him clutching splinters. Very far off, perhaps in the wood, he heard shouting and the clatter of more fighting. Damn them! Damn them! He loosed a bitter laugh. We're defeated! And still they want to butcher us! The sword sliced air with a whine and bit flesh. A black-haired head tumbled in a bouncing roll among the bedclothes. Still, the Akoma guard kept yelling, and before the assassin fell, he had slashed the body three times. The corpse collapsed in a ruck of sodden fabric and shuddered convulsively amid the cushions. Spattered with the blood of the tong and crying in wild-eyed terror, Ayaki wormed out from under the corpse. A gash on his young neck bled freely, and he threw himself mindlessly against the wall in an attempt to escape from stark terror. Fetch Kiyoki! cried the warrior, with the dripping sword, to the other who bent over the body of Nikoya. There may be other assassins! The slap of running sandals sounded outside the screen as armed warriors rushed through the courtyard garden. Drawn by the disturbance, they saw the puddled blood and corpses through the screen, and almost instantly a second strike leader arrived, giving fast orders for a ground search while detailing six men to surround the Akoma air. A moment later, Jikan appeared, his composure vanishing as he saw the carnage on the nursery floor. He shoved his load of slates into the hands of the stupefied slave who followed him and, in a typical haste, threaded a path through a room suddenly filled with armed men. Beyond a wall of sticky cushions crouched the Akoma heir, pounding the wall with bruised fists and screaming, Mimwanabi! 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 The warriors who gathered to help seemed unwilling to touch him. Ayaki, come here. It's over, Jikan said firmly. The little one appeared not to hear. Mara's Hadonra reached out anyway. He ignored the child's flinch from his touch, extracted the traumatised boy from the mess and bundled him against robes that smelt like chalk instead of slaughter. Let's get him out of here, he instructed the nearest warrior. Get the healer. He's injured. Looking at the motionless form of Nakoya and the two nurses, he left. And somebody find out if he has a nurse left alive. The blows on the shield redoubled. Kevin yanked one hand away from the rim an instant before losing a finger. He was dimly aware of a heave of movement in the bodies behind his hip, as one of the mortally injured warriors he leaned on thrust a dagger handle into his palm. Defend our lady, croaked a voice. She is alive. Kevin rejected the defeated realisation that she could not remain so much longer. Naked and bleeding and half-crazed with battle fury, he accepted the blade reached under the rim of the shield and stabbed an enemy foot. The knife was promptly lost as the skewered enemy jerked with a scream of rage. Happy dancing! wished the barbarian, turned drunken with blood loss and adrenaline. He took a moment to notice that the blows on the shield had stopped. Hands in green lacquered gauntlets caught the rim a moment later and strongly lifted the battered wreckage away. Kevin peered up, blinking against the sun. Through vision that danced with dizziness, he made out an officer's plume and the face of the Akoma force commander. Relief overturned his sense of humour. Thank the gods you're here, he said. We found ourselves in a sticky situation. Lujan regarded Kevin's bloodied hands and the dripping gash on his forearm. Happy! Dancing? he quoted, puzzled. Later, Kevin muttered. I'll explain everything later. He turned awkwardly against the pain of his bleeding side and cursed bilingually. He felt sick and the sun was too bright. 
Where is our lady? Lu Jan demanded sharply now and taut with worry. Kevin blinked bemusedly at the overturned litter. A coma dead lay crushed like so many impaled beetles underneath. Light of heaven, not under there. Lu Jiang called another order that to Kevin's ears sounded like noise. Then many hands were reaching down and dragging his battered body out from under the splinters. Don't, Kevin protested weakly. I want to know if Mara... Words were hard. The air burned his lungs. Still protesting, he was pushed supine on the ground and darkness closed over his ears just before the shouts of amazed discovery from the warriors who righted the litter. They sorted the tangle of dead and injured and found a blood-stained, crumpled figure who was not conscious but had no wound beyond a purple bruise on her head. Mara was laid on the soft, dry moss by the spring. Surrounded by a hundred soldiers, her head pillowed in Lu Jan's lap, she roused as a rag that dripped icy water bathed the lump on her brow. Kyoki, she murmured as her eyes first flickered open. No, her force commander answered gently. Lu Jan, mistress, but Kyoki was the one who sent me here. He thought you might uh, run into trouble. Mara stirred, faintly reproving. He is not your commander, but my adviser for war. Lujan stroked the hair from his mistress's face and gave her his most insolent smile. Old habits die hard. When my old commander says jump, I jump. Mara shifted painfully. She seemed battered and sore in a hundred places. I should have listened. Her eyes clouded. Kevin, she said. Where is he? Lujan inclined his head toward his field healer, who crouched over a second figure lying on the moss. He survived in a loincloth without armour and with a hero's complement of wounds. Aye, what a warrior that man is. Wounds? Mara shoved up in distress, and Lujan required a surprising amount of strength to keep her quiet. Lady, be still. He will live, though he'll have a pretty set of scars. He might limp, and he will be a long time regaining full use of his left hand. The muscles were badly slashed. Brave Kevin. Mara's voice shook. He saved me. My foolishness. Almost killed him. Her force commander touched her again, almost tenderly. It is a pity the man is a slave, he commiserated. Such courage deserves only the highest honour. The air suddenly hurt to breathe. Mara turned her face into Lujan's shoulder and shivered. Perhaps she wept, soundless in misery. If she did, the officer who comforted her would never expose her shame. Somehow he understood that her agony did not stem from her narrow escape in the glen alone, and his abiding love and devotion would never permit him to acknowledge his lady had betrayed herself in a moment of public weakness. The surrounding soldiers quickly found tasks to occupy themselves, allowing Mara her moment of release. The Lady of the Acoma wept for Kevin, whose bold spirit had captured hers and whose actions had finally made her understand beyond denial that he was not and never would be a slave. She would have to set him free, and that could not be done within the borders of the Empire of Suranuani. To give him his due, to acknowledge him as a man, she was going to lose him forever. Following through that realisation was going to be the hardest thing she had ever undertaken. Regrouping from the ambush in the forest took the better part of the day. The bodies of the slain warriors had to be gathered up onto makeshift litters for rites and cremation at home. The enemy dead were left as food for jagoonas and other carrion-eaters. 
Lujan sent out scouts who returned from the appointed place of rendezvous with reports that the hunker were nowhere in evidence. Mara took this news badly. That her proposed meeting with Lord Zaltepo was unequivocally fiction and more probably a Minwanabi plot. She fretted, too tired to keep still even in the heat, and worried now for more than Kevin's hurts. Tessao does not strike just once, she complained to Lujan as the gloom of twilight fell around the firelit encampment of warriors. Though our wounded will suffer for being moved, we must return home tonight. Her force commander did not argue the necessity, but strode off and mustered his warriors and efficiently made arrangements to depart. Battle-weary and bandaged, the three survivors from Mara's original guard were given places of honour at the head of the march. Kevin and two litter-born wounded were carried next, and after them the honourably slain. Mara insisted on staying afoot. Her bearers lived, but with their trained ability to manage burdens without jostling, they were assigned to carry the injured. The Lady of the Acoma walked beside her unconscious body slave. Kevin had been given a draught for his pain that had left him deeply asleep. She held his unbandaged hand and alternated between aching sorrow and fury. She had not heeded warnings that Tassayo might have compromised Arakasi's network. She had seen only her growing power, had been lured into thinking that because she was now clan war chief, it was her natural due that lesser families should clamour for her favour. Nikoya had cautioned her. Kiyoke had most pointedly avoided a confrontation with her, precisely that he could be free to forestall the disaster of the trap she had foolishly conceded to Tassayo. Twenty-seven good warriors from her honour guard were dead. Lujan had lost another twelve in the course of her rescue, and Kevin might never walk again without a limp. The price was far too high. Mara clenched her hand, then belatedly relaxed her grip. She squeezed only Kevin, who had stood as staunchly as any of her warriors. She did not feel the stones under her feet or notice the occasional hand on her elbow as Lujan steadied her over the gullies. She barely noticed the coming and going of the scout patrols as they repeatedly swept the surrounding woods for enemies. She thought only upon the shame of her own false pride, and she wondered over and over what she would say to Arakasi. The moon set, the darkness under the trees matched the darkness in Mara's heart as she marched numbly, dwelling long and hard on recriminations until she reached the borders of her estate. Another patrol of soldiers awaited her there, armed and carrying torches. Mara was weary enough that it took her a moment to realise the anomaly of this added company's presence. Lujan was speaking with the patrol leader, and as she heard Ayaki's name, a chill washed over her fright, jolting her alert. She pushed away from Kevin's litter and hurried to her force commander's side. What has happened to my son? Lujan caught her shoulders firmly. He is alive, my lady. That reassurance did not blunt the edge of Mara's urgency. Even in the wind-caught flicker of the torchlight, the reporting patrol leader's face showed strain. Terrified that the disaster that had overtaken her might not have been confined to the glen, Mara demanded, Has there been an attack upon my house? My lady, an assassin was sent, the patrol leader tersely bowed. Trained by Kiyoke to be concise, he delivered the news like a battle report. Ayaki suffered a minor cut, but is otherwise unharmed. Two nurses died and Nakoya, first adviser, was killed in the child's defence. The estate grounds have been searched, with no sign of other enemies found. The assassin apparently stolen alone. Kiyoke reinforced all border patrols and sent us to bolster your escort. But Mara heard none of the details, past knowledge that Ayaki had suffered hurt, and that Nakoya, who had been a mother to her since childhood, was dead. Her knees felt weak, and her mind was shocked past thinking. She did not feel the arm that Lujan slipped under her elbow to steady her. 
She heard but did not comprehend the words her force commander said to the patrol leader, dispatching a runner to fetch a replacement litter. Nakoya was dead and Ayaki injured. She needed Kevin's arms around her and the comfort of his love through this nightmare, but he lay bandaged in a litter unconscious from a healing draught. Mara stumbled forward. The night felt bitterly desolate. Trouble seemed to roost unseen in the dark, and the road through her own prayer gate seemed menacing with unnamed danger. I must go home, she said blankly. Lady, we shall take you there with all haste. Lujan snapped orders to his company, and the patrol integrated with the guard already surrounding the lady and her wounded and dead. Then, without awaiting the runner's return with the litter, the warriors marched for the estate house. Mara hurried in a numb haze of disbelief. Nakoya was dead. That fact seemed incomprehensible. The lady felt she ought to be crying. Instead, she could not see past placing one stumbling foot in front of the other. She was aware of the patrol leader giving the details of the assassin's raid to Lujan, but inside her head she could hear only Nakoya's voice scolding and scolding her for folly, vanity and headstrong actions. Ayaki had been injured. Her heart cried out in outrage, anger and grief that one so little should ever be threatened by the machinations of the great game. She thought blasphemies. Kevin was right. Deaths for political gains were a senseless, cruel waste. Her sense of family honour warred outright with her pain. How narrowly Tassayo had missed ending the Akoma line in the passage of a single day. Kiyoke's wisdom, Nakoya's courage, a slave's disregard of propriety, those had been all that stood between her house and total destruction. Almost, Minwanabi had fulfilled his blood oath to Turakamu. Chills chased over Mara's flesh. She remembered the rain of arrows that had hissed over her head, even as Kevin's weight had knocked her down out of the way. She hurried faster and did not protest when the litter at last arrived and Lujan caught her up in his arms and bundled her inside without pause to break his stride. These bearer slaves were fresh, Mara signalled Lujan to appoint an honour guard and let the other soldiers escorting the wounded and dead proceed more slowly. Distraught beyond restraint, she screamed for the slaves to sprint the last quarter mile to the lighted hall of the estate house. Kiyoki met her there, grim and wearing armour from the waist up. He had donned his old helm, shorn of plumes, and his sword was strapped to his side, prepared for the worst if word came back that his mistress had been killed in the forest. Mara stumbled out of her litter before Lujan could catch her hand. She flung herself into the arms of the old warrior and, with her cheek against his hard breastplate, she fought to hold back tears. Kiyoke stood staunch on his crutch and his free hand stroked her hair. Mara Ani, he said in his deep voice, using the diminutive as a father might address a beloved daughter. Nakoya died most bravely. She will be sung into the halls of Turakamo with all of the honours of a warrior and make proud the Akoma name. Mara repressed a deep, shuddering sob. My son, she gasped, how is he? Over her bent head, the adviser for war and Lujan exchanged a quick look. Needing no words, the force commander gently took Mara's elbow and eased her weight off Kiyoke. We shall go at once to see Ayaki, the older adviser said. He pointedly did not ask after her crumpled appearance or the evidence of bloodstains on her robe. Your son sleeps, attended by Jikan. The cut on his neck was attended to promptly, but he lost a lot of blood. He will be well enough in time, but you should know we could not stop his crying. He has had a terrible shock. Mara froze, resisting all attempts to lead her away. Kevin, she said frantically, I want him put to my chambers and tended there. Lady, Lujan said firmly, 
I already presume to give orders to that end. He caught her more firmly around the waist and propelled her into the corridor that led to her chambers. Someone thoughtful, probably Jikan, had ordered every lamp lit, so no step she took was in shadow. Again, the eyes of Force Commander and Advisor for War met. Kiyoke knew that Mara's party had suffered ambush. He was impatient to hear the details. Lujan nodded in wordless indication that he would relate the event, but out of Mara's hearing. She had grief enough in her heart, without being made to endure a repetition of the day's unpleasantness. They reached her private apartments. The screens were opened wide and attended by a dozen armed warriors. Inside, half lost in a sea of cushions, a small figure lay with white bandages wrapped around his neck. Someone sat with him. Mara did not look to see whom, but pulled herself out of Lujan's hold and fell to her knees by her child. She touched him, transparently surprised by his warmth. Then... Tenderly, cautious of his hurts, she gathered him into her arms. She wept then, beyond all control, and her tears rinsed Ayaki's cheek. Her officers averted their faces in staunch disregard of her shame, and the person sitting on the cushions tactfully rose to leave. Mara glanced through brimming eyes and identified Jikan. Stay, she said shakily, or of you stay. I don't want to be here alone. For a very long time the lanterns burned while she sat and rocked her young son. Later in the night, after Kevin had been placed on a mat by Ayaki's side, Mara ordered the lights put out. She dismissed Kiyoke, Jikan and Lujan to their long-deserved rest and, guarded by a relief watch of warriors at every entrance to the house, she sat in silent vigil over her loved ones. She thought and saw too clearly where selfishness had steered her near to ruin. Her arrogant assumption of the clan war chief's seat now seemed the act of an idiot. She did not undress for bed, though the healer who came periodically to check on his two charges begged her to take a draught to bring rest. Her eyes stung unpleasantly from crying, and she did not wish the oblivion of sleep. Guilt weighed upon her heart, and too many thoughts upon her mind. At dawn, she gathered her courage, rose stiffly from her cushions, and left the room and her loved ones. Alone, watched only by her guarding soldiers, she moved like a waif through darkened corridors to the nursery, where the body of the woman who had raised her had been laid out on a bier of honour. Nikoya's bloody robes had been changed for rich silks bordered by a coma green. Her wrinkled old hands lay at peace by her sides, sheathed in soft leather gloves to hide the cruel cuts from the assassin's cord and the knife that had slain her rested on her breast as badge of homage to Turakamu that she had died a warrior's death. Her face, nested in silver-white hair, seemed more peaceful than it ever had in sleep. Cares and arthritis and hairpins that never stayed straight could not trouble her now. Her loyal years of service were over. Mara felt fresh tears spring under her swollen eyelids, mother of my heart, she murmured. She sank to the cushions beside the dead woman and gathered up one cold hand. She fought and steadied her voice. Nakoya, know your name shall be honoured with the ancestors of the Akoma, and your ashes shall be spread inside the walls of the sacred glade within the garden of the Natami. No, the blood you spilled today was a coma blood, and that you are as family and kin. Here Mara paused as her breath caught. She raised her face in the grey light coming through the screens and looked out into the mist that clothed the lands of her people. Mother of my heart, she resumed, shamefully unsteady. I did not listen to you. I was selfish and arrogant and careless, and the gods took your life for my folly. But hear me. I can still learn. 
Your wisdom lives yet in my heart, and on the morrow, when your ashes are delivered to the gods, I will swear this promise. I will send the barbarian Kevin away, and write a betrothal contract to Shinzawai asking for marriage with Hokanu. These things I will do before the season turns, wise one, and to my sorrow, to the end of my days, I will regret that I chose not to heed while you were alive at my side. Mara gently laid the withered hand back at the dead woman's side. Not enough did I tell you this, Nakoya. I loved you well, mother of my heart. She ended. And I thank you for the life of my son. Chapter 24 Breakthrough The drums stilled. Silence fell over the grounds of the Acoma estate for the first time since the funeral rites three days passed. The priests of Turakamu, summoned for the occasion, packed their clay masks and departed in single-file procession. Only the red bunting on the front doorposts remained as a visible reminder of the recently departed. But, to Mara, the estate house would never again seem the secure haven she recalled from her childhood. She was not alone in her disquiet. Ayaki cried himself to sleep at nights. Kevin rested beside him, a strange, ghostly figure in white bandages, who cheered him when he could with stories, called servants to light lanterns when the boy lay trembling in the dark, and calmed him when he woke up distraught from nightmares. Mara sat often at the boy's bedside, quiet or speaking desultorily with Kevin. She tried to ignore the twelve warriors who stood guard at each window and door. Now she could not pass even the shadows beneath the shrubs in her gardens without looking sideways for assassins. After an exhaustive search, Lujan's trackers had discovered the dead assassin's trail onto her estate. The killer had taken time to complete his infiltration, here spending a night in a tree, and there leaving a depression under a hedge where he had lain for hours, waiting motionless for a break between patrols or a servant to pass. Plainly, Tassayo of the Minwanabi had reversed his tactics since the Night of the Bloody Swords. Where numbers and sheer force had failed before, his most recent attempt had been furtive, involving just a single man. Lujan did not have soldiers enough to beat every bush and vine and fence row daily to search for lurking intruders. The Acoma sentries had not been the least bit lax, Simply, the estate lands were too wide and too open to be maintained in flawless security. Nakoya and a patrol of brave warriors were ashes, but aching failure lingered in Mara's mind. A week passed before she steadied enough to ask for Arakasi. The hour was late evening, and Mara sat in her study beside a nearly untouched supper tray. Her request for the spy master's presence had been carried by her little runner slave, who was now bowed until his forehead touched the wax floor. Lady, he said, still prone, your spy master is not here. Jikan regrets to inform you that he left your lands within the hour after the attack upon your person and son. He told no one of his destination, nor did he give a date for his return. Seated on her cushions under the hot lamplight, Mara stayed motionless for so long that the slave boy began to tremble. She stared at the painted murals commissioned by her last husband, Buntakapi, the ones that depicted bloody battle scenes in rioting brilliance. From the rapt look on Mara's face, she appeared to be seeing them for the first time. It was most unlike the mistress not to notice her slave boy's discomfort, for she was fond of him and patted him often on the head when he rendered quick service. Lady, he offered timorously when minutes passed and his knees began to ache. Mara stirred and came back to herself. She realised the moon stood well up in the sky beyond the screen and the wicks burned low in her oil lamps. You may retire, she bade with a sigh. The boy scurried from the room in grateful haste. 
Mara continued as she was, while servants entered and removed the untouched dishes. But she waved away the maids who expected her to retire and stayed toying with a dry quill pen, a blank parchment sheet spread before her. Hours passed and she did not write. Night insects sang in the garden beyond the screens and the relief watch changed guard at midnight. It simply was not conceivable that Arakasi was a traitor. And yet, in low words, members of her household suggested so. Mara twisted the pen, anguished. She had delayed any formal summons, hoping the man would present himself and prove beyond any question he had no part in Tasayo's attempt on her house. Kiyoke had stayed close-mouthed on the subject, and the usually outspoken Sarik was reluctant to speak. Even Jikan took care not to linger for a chat after his reports on estate finance. Mara tossed the quill pen aside and massaged her temples with her fingers. It was most painfully plain that Arakasi could be suspect. Were he to turn coat, her danger was multiplied. Over the years, he had been entrusted with her household's deepest secrets. There was no aspect of her affairs that he did not know intimately. And he detested the Minwanabi as she did. Or did he? Mara sweated in torment. If his desire for revenge had been an act, what better ploy to gain her confidence than to revile the same enemy that had ruined her father and brother? Arakasi, who was so gifted at changing roles and guises, he was a consummate actor, easily capable of feigning passionate hatred. Mara closed her eyes and recalled conversations between herself and Arakasi over the years. The man couldn't have betrayed her. Could he? She sighed, indulging herself in that simple release in the privacy of her quarters. She was certain in her heart that Arakasi couldn't be a Minwanabi agent. The hatred for Tasayo and his family was too real. But could someone else have turned the spy master? Someone who could, perhaps, offer Arakasi a better position from which to conduct his war against the Minwanabi. With the price for that more secure position, the Akoma's betrayal? Mara's fingers tightened until they left white marks on her flesh. If the spymaster was the relly in her nest, everything she had done was for naught. At this moment, Nakoya's carping would have been welcome, a sign that errors could be rectified. But the old woman was now ashes, dust amid the dust of a thousand Akoma ancestors whose honour Mara was entrusted to keep. Again she tormented herself with the question, how could she have held such a deep, instinctive rapport with a man who wished her harm? How could she? The knight held no answers. Mara dropped tired hands in her lap and regarded her abandoned quill pen. Though the lamps blazed brightly around her and her best guards stood vigilant at her door, she felt cornered. With a hand that shook distressingly, she reached out and took up pen and parchment. She scraped dried ink from the nib, dipped it in the waiting ink jar, and wrote in formal style in the centre of the top of the page the name of Kamatsu of the Shinzawai. An extended interval passed before she could force herself to continue. Neither could she simplify her pain by sending a servant to fetch her scribe. Her promise to Nakoya was sacred. In her own hand, she completed the ritual phrases of the proposal for marriage, asking Kamatsu's honoured son, Hokanu of the Shinzawai, to reconsider after her former refusal and take her hand as consort of the Lady of the Akoma. Tears welled in Mara's eyes as she reached the final line, added her signature and affixed her family chop. She folded and sealed the document quickly, clapped for a servant and gave her instructions with her throat tight with emotion. Have this paper delivered at once to the marriage brokers in Sulanku. They are to present it with all speed to Kamatsu of the Shinzawai. The servant accepted the paper and bowed before his mistress. Lady Mara, 
Your will shall be carried out at first light. Mara's brows gathered instantly into a frown. I said at once. Find a messenger and send the document with all speed. The servant prostrated himself on the floor. Your will, lady. She waved him impatiently away. If she noted his quick and puzzled glance at the darkness beyond the screen, she did not call him back in allowance for the unreasonable hour. If she delayed the proposal to Kamatsu until morning, she knew well she would not be able to send the document on at all. Better the messenger stand a few hours in the dark waiting for the broker to arise than risk another opportunity to change her mind and break her vow. The chamber suddenly seemed too stifling, and the scent of the Akasi cloying. Mara shoved her writing table aside. Filled with a desperate need to see Kevin, she stumbled to her feet and hurried down the lit corridors, past rows of vigilant guards, to the nursery wing. At the entrance, half blind in the sudden dark, Mara hesitated. She blinked back a fresh flood of tears and waited for her eyes to adjust, the pungent healer's herbs and poultice scents lay heavily upon the air. Finally, she crossed the threshold. Moonlight turned the closed screen copper and carved the rows of watchful warriors outside into dark silhouettes. In no way comforted by their vigilance, Mara made her way to the mat where Kevin lay, his bandages white smears in the gloom and his torso twisted in the sheets as though his rest had been troubled. She paused, looked to Ayaki, and reassured herself that the boy was more settled, asleep with his mouth open, his hands half curled on his pillow. The scratch on his neck was healing more quickly than Kevin's hurts, which had been treated less promptly in the field. But the assassin had left more lasting marks on the little boy's mind. Relieved he did not suffer another nightmare, Mara moved past, careful not to disturb him. She dropped to her knees by Kevin's mat and tugged to disentangle his limp weight from the constricting snarl of the bedclothes. He stirred at her touch and opened his eyes. Lady? Mara silenced his murmur with her lips. Kevin reached up left-handed and captured her around the waist. Strong, despite his injuries, he pulled her to him. I've missed you. He whispered in her hair. His hand moved and under his practised manipulation her light lounging robe fell open. Mara buried her grief and strove to match his light humour. My healer threatened dire consequences if I came to your bed and tempted you past restraint. He said your wounds could still open. Damn him for being a grandmother, Kevin said amiably. My scabs do well enough, except when he chooses to pick at them. Sure and warm, the Midkemian stroked her breast with the back of his fingers. Then he hugged her tighter. You're my cure, all by yourself. Mara shivered, half from sadness, half from poignant arousal. She banished the painful wish that the marriage contract to Hakanu could be recalled and snuggled closer. Kevin... She began. From her tone, he realised she was anguished. He gave her no chance to speak, but leaned across and kissed her. Her arms clasped him around the shoulders, avoiding his bandages. Kevin cradled her, instinctively offering her what his soul knew she needed. And, in familiar and natural companionship, they lapsed into lovemaking. His enthusiasm seemed in no way diminished, except that he fell asleep very quickly after his passion was spent. Mara stretched out at his side, her eyes wide open in the dark. She ran her hands over her flat belly, much aware that her tryst in the nursery had not been planned with propriety. She had taken no elixir of terico weed to prevent conception. Nicoya would have been shrill with reprimand over the lapse. Nicoya would have been wise. By the dim, filtered moonlight, Mara studied Kevin's profile, nested amid a tangle of red hair. She found she did not wish to be wise. 
Marry Hokanu she must, if Kamatsu would allow, and he would have her. But if Kevin was to be sacrificed, she did not possess the will to relinquish his love and her happiness without any trace of a tie. Foolish she might be, even selfish, but she wanted Kevin's child. All she had accomplished had been for the honour of her family name and ancestry. Her heart felt battered, eaten up by rulership's endless griefs. This one thing she had to have for herself. I love you, barbarian, she whispered soundlessly in the dark. I shall always love you. Her tears flowed freely for a very long time after that. A week passed and another week, and the healer permitted Kevin short bouts out of bed. He found Mara seated in the east garden, the one the kitchen staff used for growing herbs. Clad in the light, loose robes she habitually used for meditation, she had set her discipline aside to sit amid dusty stems of aromatic plants and watch the front road. Messengers came and went, mostly on Jikan's errands. Whether she studied the traffic or whether she was lost in thought did not matter. You're moping again, Kevin accused, setting aside the cane he used to keep his weight off the leg that had taken the sword cut. Mara twisted a mangled bit of greenery between her hands. It had once been a slender tira branch, now wilted, stripped entirely of its spicy leaves. Peeled strips of bark emitted a heady, pungent odour on the noon-heated air. The lady who tortured the sprig did not answer. Kevin settled with some difficulty beside her, his wrapped leg stretched out before him. He lifted the poor stem from her hands and sighed at the sap beneath her fingernails. She was a mother to me, and more, Mara said unexpectedly. I know. He did not need to ask if she spoke of Nakoya. His response was gentle. You need to cry more. Spill your grief out and let it go. Mara stiffened, sharp-edged. I have cried enough. Kevin tilted his head to one side and shoved his fingers through unruly hair. You people never cry enough, he contradicted. Uncried tears remain inside you like poison. He did not intend to drive Mara away, but she rose abruptly and he could not regroup in time to follow, not with his leg bound in splints. By the time he reached his feet, found his cane and pursued, she had disappeared through the hedges. He decided it would be tactless to give chase. Tonight, in bed, he would try once again to console her. But forgetting the tragedy that had upset her was not possible, with soldiers in armour standing guard almost everywhere one stepped, the assassin might not have killed Ayaki, but the event had left other damage. Troubled, withdrawn in unhappiness, Mara could find no peace within the walls of her own home. Kevin shuffled out of the herb garden and decided to seek out young Ayaki. In a sheltered courtyard out of sight of the house servants, he had been teaching the boy how to fight with a knife. It might be forbidden for a slave to handle weapons, but on the Akoma estate no one would interfere. True Sirani, they all looked away from this latest breach of protocol. Kevin's loyalty was proven, and he reasoned that the boy might stop screaming from bad dreams if he learned a few tricks in self-defence. But today the courtyard was not deserted when Kevin arrived with a purloined kitchen knife and the Akoma air in tow. Kiyoke rested in the shade under the ulo, two wooden practice swords between his knees. He saw Kevin and the contraband, and a rare smile creased his eyes. If you are going to train the young warrior, someone should be on hand to see that the job is done properly. Kevin grinned insouciantly. <laughs> the lame leading the lame? He looked down, ruffled Ayaki's dark hair and laughed. What do you say, little tiger, to the idea of beating up two old men? Ayaki responded with an Akoma battle cry that caused the servants within earshot to dive for cover. 
Mara heard the shout from the secluded corner of the Kakali garden where she had chosen to make her retreat. The corners of her mouth lifted with the barest trace of amusement and then stilled. Her melancholy stayed in force. The sun beat down, sucking life and the colour from the glade. The bushes seemed grey in the glare, the deep indigo flowers scorched at the edges from the heat. Mara paced the walkways, fingering her morning robe's red tassels. Almost she seemed to hear Nakoya's ghost behind her. Daughter of my heart, the old woman seemed to say, you are foolish and thrice to be pitied if you persist with this idea of bearing a child to Kevin. A messenger will be returning from the marriage brokers any day with word from Kamatsu of the Shinzawai. Dare you enter into marriage with the son of an honourable house while carrying a slave's baby? To do so would shame the Akoma name past all mending. Then I will tell Hokanu outright whether or not I am with child. Mara interrupted the imaginary voice. She stepped around a gardener who raked away dead growth and meandered aimlessly down another path. Behind her, the servant set his tool aside and followed. Lady, called a voice as soft as velvet. Mara's heart missed a beat. With the blood gone cold in her veins, she slowly turned around. Fear raised a sweat on her body. She examined the servant in his sun-faded robes. Arakasi. With a grace quite outside the ordinary, he approached, holding a dagger. As a cry of alarm was almost on her lips, he prostrated himself on the gravel path and held out the blade hilt first. Mistress, said Arakasi, I beg your permission to take my life with my dagger. Mara stepped involuntarily back, numbed by shock. Some say you betrayed me, she blurted clumsily, without thought. Her words were accusingly rough. Almost Arakasi seemed to flinch. No, mistress, never that. He paused, then added in a tortured tone, I failed you. He was gaunt, the gardener's robe hung awkwardly over his shoulders, and his hands were drawn as old parchment. His fingers did not shake. Suddenly desperate for shade or any sort of surcease from the sun, Mara swallowed. I trusted you. Arakasi moved no muscle, unmercifully exposed by the daylight. All of his deception seemed stripped away. He looked like an ordinary servant, worn, honest and frail. Mara had never noticed before the attenuated bone structure of his wrists. He said, his voice as whipped as his appearance, The five spies in the Minwanabi household are dead. By my order they were killed, and the tongue that I hired brought me their heads as surety. Eleven agents that passed their messages from Setak province lie dead also. Those men I killed with my own hand, mistress. You have no spies in your enemy's house, but neither does Tasayo have any avenue left to exploit. No one lives who might be forced to betray you. Again. I beg leave to make atonement for myself. Allow me to take my life by the blade. He did not expect her to grant his request. He had been no more than a grey warrior once and not born to service in her house. Mara stepped back again and sat sharply upon a stone bench. Her sudden movement attracted her sentry's attention and several came running to investigate. The officer in charge spotted the servant at her feet and recognised him for her spymaster. The warrior signalled and his small patrol closed at a run. A heartbeat later, armoured hands seized Arakasi's outstretched wrists. Very fast they dragged him upright and had him pinioned. Lady, what should we do with this man? The patrol leader briskly demanded. Mara watched quite silent. 
The warriors, she noticed, handled their prisoner with care, as if he carried poison, or as though he might somehow strike back. Her gaze shifted to encompass Arakasi's still face and his hollowed, shadowed eyes. No secrets lingered there. The spymaster seemed an empty husk, all his spirit sucked out of him. He expected an ending, a hanging, and his mien was desolate. The fire and the pride that, along with a razor-sharp intellect, had marked him apart were missing. Let him go, she said dully. The soldiers obeyed without question. Arakasi lowered his arms, twitching his sleeves back into place out of habit. He stood with bowed head and a seemingly endless patience that was painful to observe. If he was acting, his extraordinary talent had her beaten. The air seemed sluggish and heavy as Mara dragged in her breath. Arakasi, she said slowly. Almost, she waited for a carping voice to raise protest. Then she remembered. Nakoya was dead. She pushed on with the matter at hand. You served as you saw fit. You and your network provided intelligence. You never guaranteed facts. You have not made decisions. I, as your ruler, decide. If there has been failure or misjudgment, the blame must be mine alone. Therefore, you shall not be permitted to take your life with your dagger. Instead, I ask pardon for my shame for demanding more than a loyal man should ever be expected to deliver. Will you still serve me? Will you continue to maintain your network and bring ruin to the lord of the Minwanabi? Arakasi slowly straightened. His eyes grew penetrating, disquietingly, uncomfortably direct. Through the sun's glare and the dusty scent of the flowers, he appeared to see through flesh and read her invisible spirit. You are not like the other rulers in this empire, he said, the velvet restored to his voice. If I could dare to venture an opinion, I'd say you were quite dangerously different. Mara lowered her eyes first. You may be right. She twisted the jade rings on her hands. Will you still serve? Always. Arakasi said at once. He released a long, audible sigh. I have news, if you would hear it. Later. You may go now and refresh yourself. When Mara looked up, she watched her spy master off, the spring in his step rejuvenated as he hurried away down the path. How did you determine he was innocent? asked a patrol leader just past his youth. Mara shrugged slightly. I didn't. But I looked at him and remembered his formidable competence at his job. She arose before her puzzled warriors, her eyes almost distant with thought. Do you think if such a man wanted me dead that he would have bungled the task? If he were Tasayo's agent or someone else's, the Akoma Natami would be no more. This I believe, so I trust him. Twilight threw a mantle of silver-green light over the garden when Arakasi reappeared to make his report. He had eaten and bathed and now wore a house-servant's robe tied with a crested green sash. His sandals were laced with meticulous perfection and his hair had been freshly trimmed. Mara noticed these details as he bowed and other servants walked softly around her, lighting the first lamps of the evening. He straightened, slightly hesitant, my lady, your faith in me is not misplaced. I say again, as I did once before, that I would see your enemies dead and their names obliterated. Since the moment I swore by your Natami, I have been wholly a coma. Mara received this reaffirmation in considerate silence. 
At length she clapped for a servant and asked for a tray of fresh sliced fruit. When she and her spymaster were alone once more, she said, I have not questioned your loyalty. Arakasi frowned and struck to the heart of the matter. It is as important to me as my life that you do not. He looked at her, his dark eyes for once unshadowed. Lady, you are one of the few rulers in this empire who thinks past ancient traditions and the only one willing to challenge them. I might have come to serve you once out of shared hatred for the Minwanabi, but now that has changed. I serve for you alone. Why? Mara's own gaze flashed up, also free of any posturing. The shadows of the lamps darkened as the sky deepened overhead. Arakasi made a gesture of impatience. You are not afraid of change, he observed. That one bold trait is going to take you far, perhaps even make your house lastingly great. He paused, and a startlingly genuine smile lit his face. I want to be there, be a part of that rise to power. The power itself does not interest me, but what can be done with it? There I admit to shameful ambition. Times of great change are upon us, and this empire has stayed settled in its ways for many centuries too long. He sighed. I do not know what can be done to alter our fate, but in more than fifty years of life I have met no other ruler more able to accomplish reform. Mara released a quiet breath. For the first time since she had known the man, she realised that she had pierced through his reserve. At long last she looked upon the real motive that drove her most enigmatic adviser. Master of deceit, Arakasi sat now stripped of deception. His face showed the longing of an excited boy, and with that she saw also that he cared deeply for her and would provide her with anything she might ask. At last, convinced that Nakoya had been right, that there were limits beyond which no ruler should press a loyal heart to perform, she smiled. In the most banal tone she could manage, she said, You mentioned you had news? Arakasi's eyes sparkled with sudden enthusiasm. He reached for a fruit slice and opened. The magicians have been very busy with a plot of their own, it appears. The rumours are intriguing and almost beyond imagination. Settled back on her cushions in relief, Mara waved for him to continue. Finishing his snack with a neat swallow, Arakasi licked his teeth. It's very thought-provoking. The word is that ten great ones from the assembly went through the rift to Midkemia along with three thousand Kanazawa warriors. A battle was fought, and wild speculation abounds concerning why. Some say the Emperor wished vengeance upon the King of Isles for the traitorous slaughter at the peace talks. Here the spymaster held up a hand to forestall his mistress's eager questions. That's not the unbelievable motive. Others say, persons in reliable offices, that the magicians made war upon the enemy. Mara looked blank. The enemy, Arakasi repeated. The one from the myths before the Golden Bridge. Surely your teachers recited stories to you as a child. Recalling those tales, recognition dawned. But those are tales, Mara protested. She glanced around at the lamps, as if the shadows they cast might suddenly have grown larger and darker. Not real. Arakasi shook his head, mystified and excited at the same time. So we thought, he agreed. But who can rightly guess what enemies might challenge the Great Ones, particularly since the renegade Milember had his name mixed up in the events? 
Those myths are older than history, as ancient as the names of the brothers who began the five families. How can we judge what is truth in that long distant past? Suddenly, poignantly troubled, Mara bit her lip. Kanazawa were involved. Then we can inquire what has passed when I hear from Lord Kamatsu. Her thoughts skipped ahead. We could surmise that the Emperor's interference with the Council might have been in cooperation with this action of the magicians. So, I presume. Arakasi helped himself to another slice of fruit, but that speculation. My sources closest to the light of heaven suggest negotiations may be underway for an exchange of prisoners between the Empire and the Kingdom of the Isles. So the rift is open, Mara cut in. Her voice held a strangely emotional note. Rightly attributing that to some concern with her barbarian lover, Arakasi coughed lightly. None of what I tell is common knowledge. <clears throat> but it would seem that if you applied again for a hearing in the right places, you might be able to gain the benefits of your trade concessions with Midkamia at last. Mara seemed only distantly interested in a subject that had once been a hot source of frustration. Arakasi tactfully used the interval to clean off the last fruit on the tray. He recalled Mara and Kevin's discussion of the rift in Kentasani. The subject had revolved around granting the barbarian his freedom. Cued by shrewd intuition, Arakasi knew the idea was emotionally painful. I will probe the issue for you, lady, and try to find more facts. Mara shot him a glance of wordless gratitude. For Kevin's sake, she said in a small voice, he does not deserve to stay a slave. As if shrugging off the torments of unseen ghosts, the lady changed the subject. If power continues to shift away from the council, there will be upheavals. Minoanabi will consolidate his allies and make a bid to revive the warlord's office. She sighed, frowned, and added, It would be nice if all of us were alive to enjoy the gains of my exclusive trade rights. Then her eyes narrowed. You had spies killed under Tasayo's own roof, you said. Why then does our enemy still breathe? Arakasi settled his elbows on his knees like a killwing ruffling feathers. My arm is not long enough to reach beneath Tasayo's roof to take his head, but his servants, they are a long and different story. In the soft summer night, under a brilliance of lanterns and stars, he told her, the servants were discovered, finally, in a lime pit in a vegetable garden that was occasionally used for burials to enrich the soil. Only the dishonoured were interred there, without rights, and where the stink of decomposition would not waft beyond the domestics' quarters. The five corpses were headless, and when the runner-boy who made the find reported it to one of the overseers, the older staff member understood at once that the master must be informed. Shaking in the knees and ducking his white head in consternation, he hastened off to report to Mergali. The Minwanabi Hadonra was hunched over ledgers stacked precariously high, doing his best to stay inconspicuous. All the household had felt Tasayo's temper since his ambush had failed to kill Mara. Bristling at the interruption, he heard the house servant's news and cursed as he recognised its import. This matter of dead bodies was not something he dared to ignore. Go, he commanded the house servant. Have the bodies removed from the garden and led out in an empty bed suite. As the old man left, Mergali arose, feeling tired. He chafed an arthritic wrist, put on his softest slippers, and, as soundlessly as he could shuffle, hastened to find Incomo. The Minwanabi first adviser was perhaps the only person who could approach Tasayo with impunity. As the Hadonra crossed through the corridor that led to the nursery, he clicked his tongue. Even the children were quiet, as if aware of their father's lingering wrath. 
Encomo was none too pleased with the interruption either. Sitting dripping in his bath with a slave girl one quarter his age sponging his stringy back, he sighed soulfully at the water that poured over his knees. This is most inopportune, he murmured in the direction of his privates. Mergali bobbed agreement. Most, the corpses are being installed in an empty bed suite. My lord can examine them there. Then, as Incomo heaved himself up from his tub and submitted to a rub-down by a towel slave, the Hedonra stole his moment to escape. Left dry and naked and alone to carry the news, Incomo indulged in a rare string of oaths. He forwent his chance to fondle the slave girl who gave up her sponge to robe him, and that put him in a spiteful temper. He tied his tasselled belt in a quick, irritable knot and set off to locate his lord and master. The search carried him from the dining chambers, through the grand hall, past innumerable meeting rooms, into and out of Tassio's personal study, the scriptorium and an exercise chamber. He finally ended his search on the archery range that lay on the far side of the guard's barracks. By now Incoma was puffing and sweaty as if he had not just stepped from his bath. He bowed and spoke very deliberately and loudly that his lord could not mistake his presence for that of another warrior. Clad in the lightest silk robe and an incongruously battered war helm, Tassayo shot off seven arrows in rapid succession. They cracked with uncanny accuracy into a small shield centre painted as a target, held upright by a trembling slave. Bodies! snapped the Lord of the Minwanabi. He punctuated the word with another arrow, loosed whistling between the slave's legs to smack into the dry summer earth. The slave flinched and forgot himself. He stepped back in white-faced terror. Tassayo showed no change in expression. His next arrow took the hapless man exactly in the hollow of the throat. I have told them and told them they are not to move. The Lord snapped his fingers, and a servant rushed to relieve him of his bow and quiver. Tassayo stripped off his shooting glove, and his amber eyes turned to his first adviser. By bodies, I presume that you have located the missing Akoma spies. Incomo swallowed. Yes, Lord. Five, you said. Tassayo snapped back. But we knew only three. Yes, Lord. Incomo followed the proper step behind as his master spun briskly and walked from the archery grounds. Tassayo pulled at the knuckles of his left hand, cracking each of the joints. I will inspect the bodies, now. Of course, Lord. Incomo stretched to keep up with the taller warrior's stride, the sweat springing freely from his face. When they reached the estate house, it took him some minutes to determine which bed suite housed the corpses. Domestic staff made themselves scarce with the master present, and he had to make too many inquiries to get answers. Tassayo tossed his helm to a hovering slave, then spent the interval in coiled impatience. You have not been efficient, he observed to Incomo, but fortunately he was in haste to inspect the corpses and made no further comment. He strode the length of a painted corridor, shoved past a bowing guard, and whipped aside a screen. The stench of corrupted flesh wafted with the breeze of his motion. Tassayo was unfazed. Apparently nerveless in the presence of horrors, he entered the bedsuite and knelt to examine the dirt-streaked, lumpish forms of what had once been five men. Incomo lingered outside the door. Engaged in a silent struggle to control the heaving of his stomach, he watched his master finger the remains with long, inquisitive fingers. Tassayo ran his hand along an indentation in the neck of one body, barely a hair's breadth below where the head had been severed. This man was strangled, he muttered. This is the work of a Tong assassin. He examined the last body and discovered a tiny cloth fragment embroidered with a red flower hidden in the corpse's robe. Hamoy! 
He arose, showing his anger as he spun to address Incomo. After my gifts of metal, I should own that tongue! The Minwanabi first adviser interpreted his master's glare as a warning. He bowed in instant obeisance. Lord, your gifts were copious. This should not have happened. Tasayo said in ice-cold rage. Send a messenger at once. I would have the Tong master before my dais to explain himself. Incomo sank lower. Your will, my lord. He could not move his old knees fast enough to avoid the shove of Tasayo's elbow as the master shouldered through the doorway. Send this carrion back to the lime pit, then send word to my wife. The lord barked at the nearest servant in earshot. Tell her I wish a bath to remove the stink of rot from my flesh. Incomo reached his feet and considered the idea a sound one. He reflected soulfully on the little slave girl and the delicious massage of her sponge. But the day's upheavals were not over. From his tub, Tasayo summoned in an endless succession of servants for interrogation. Many admitted to having seen the Tong assassin who had come to commit the murders. A patrol leader even confessed to allowing the assassin entry through one of the checkpoints in the hills at the border of the estate. The man's explanation for allowing the murderer passage was inherently logical. All soldiers know that my lord purchased the Tong's loyalty. The man came openly to the checkpoint stating he was on my lord's business and showing a document. Tasayo heard this with narrowed eyes and tight lips. He motioned to Incomo in the negative, and sadly the first adviser instructed the house scribe to write the warrior's name on the list for immediate execution. The soldier would be dead before Tasayo was dry from his bath. The lady in Kana continued mechanically to sponge her husband's back, but her cheeks were wax-white, and she looked sick around the eyes. Like a puppet on strings, she soaped the lean, muscular shoulders of the Lord of the Minwanabi over and over, until Tasayo tired of her attentions, and snapped suddenly to his feet. Inkana dropped her sponge with a splash into the bathwater, and snatched back with a startled cry. Silence, woman! Tasayo jerked his wet head, and towel slaves flew to attend him. The guild messenger could not have chosen a worse moment for arrival, nor could the servant who scratched at the doorway to announce the man's presence in the foyer awaiting the master's attendance. In no mood to hurry, but impatient with his dresser nonetheless, Tasayo snatched the lightweight but heavily embroidered robe from his body servant. He flipped it over his shoulders, held out his hand for his shell-decorated belt, then accepted the black lacquered sheaths of his sword and dagger newly threaded on a soft nidrahide baldric. A slave laced on his sandals, and he finished his dressing with a light padded jacket sewn with bone rings that offered the same protection as light armour without being as cumbersome. Send the messenger to me in my personal armoury he instructed his runner. Then he motioned for Incomo to follow and strode out, leaving his wife to oversee the slaves in the bath chamber as if her standing were no higher than an overseer's. The Minwanabi Lord's Armoury was a small windowless chamber with sanded wood walls, laid out with pegs for swords and stands for storing body armour. Tasayo's single personal indulgence since becoming ruling lord had been to purchase extravagant sets of arms for himself, some plain and deadly, designed for the rigours of war, others resplendent with lacquer and chasing for dress occasions. Yet a third variety was thin and strong and without fluting, designed to be secretly worn under clothing. Tasayo roved from stand to stand, stroking helms and breastplates and sword hilts, then examining his fingertips for dust. The slaves and servants who attended this chamber knew well to keep it immaculate. Predecessors who had failed the Lord's inspections had not survived his displeasure. Uncomfortable in the small, airless room, Incomo compromised his uneasiness by standing farthest from the lamp, 
which was hot, and drew unwanted attention to his actions, should the master's narrow scrutiny fall upon him. Still, as every Minwanabi servant had lately learned to become, he waited while the lord roved from sword to sword and helm to helm, stopping occasionally to arrange a buckle or a boss, or to finger the edge of a blade. Tasayo was testing a dagger when the courier bowed at the door. The lord flicked the barest glance over the man's guild badges, just enough to note the colours of the sullen cur denomination. He spoke in his deceptively gentle manner. What message do you carry? The man straightened. An overture from Mara of the Akoma, he began and silenced instantly as Tasayo whipped around in a breathtaking blur of speed. The messenger swallowed awkwardly against the pressure of a sword tip against his throat. He looked into the eye of the man who held the weapon and saw there a flat lack of expression that terrified him to his soul. My lord, he quavered. I am but a guild messenger hired to bear letters. Tasayo moved no muscle. And do you bring me a letter? His voice had not altered a hair's breadth. Incomo cautiously cleared his throat. My lord, the guild's runner is blameless and his life protected by oath. Is he? Tasayo fired back. Let him speak for himself. The messenger sucked in a difficult breath. Mara requests a meeting, he began, and stopped at a twitch from the blade. You will not mention that name under this roof, within these walls. Tasayo gave another light dig with the weapon and teased a trickle of scarlet from the skin beneath the point. What does this thrice accursed lady ask a meeting for? I wish no parley. I want only her death. The messenger blinked uncomfortably. Suspecting that he reported to a madman and convinced he would end with a cut throat, he gathered his dignity and bravely concluded the words he had been employed by his guild to deliver. The lady asks that the Lord of the Minwanabi visit her estate for the purpose of a mutual discussion. Tasayo smiled slowly. Impressed by the little man's courage, he lowered the sword, wiped the point clean on a polishing cloth, then replaced the weapon on its pegs. As an afterthought, he tossed the rag to the messenger, along with gestured permission to tend the scratch on his throat. The guildsman lacked the effrontery to refuse. He lifted the lightly oiled cloth to his neck and began tentatively to dab. And, as though no stranger were present, Tasayo resumed his inspection. Roving between items in his collection, he spoke to his adviser as if they were the only occupants of the room. Ah, in Como. I believe I have frightened her badly, he said. My ambush and my assassin might not have accomplished my ends, but Sezu's little bitch is running scared. Luck has helped her cause, but fortune never endures. She knows she cannot last another year. The Minwanabi lord abandoned one armour stand for the next. He fingered a plated gorget as if probing for a weakness. Perhaps the lady offers compromise. Say, a sacrifice of the Akoma name and line in exchange for survival for her son? Incomo bowed with due respect. My lord, that is a dangerous assumption. As well as you, the lady knows the time for compromise is past. She initiated blood feud with your uncle Jingu and Desio made pledge to Turakamu. For the sake of her ancestor's honour and against the Red God's displeasure, she must know she has no position from which to bargain. Tasayo let the plates of the gorget fall with a click like the rolling of game dice. She is desperate, he insisted. Let her come to me here, if she has a desire to speak. The armour room seemed stiflingly claustrophobic. 
Encoma risked a small movement to mop his brow and dared another interruption. My lord, I hesitate to remind. The lord Jingle underestimated the girl, and in this very home she forced a situation that required him to take his own life. Sandal scraped lightly on waxed wood as Tassayo leaned an elbow on a fine suit of armour. The tawny eyes he fixed on his first adviser were wide and bright in the lamplight. I am not a coward, he said gently, and my uncle was a fool. Incomo nodded hasty agreement, but even the bravest man should do better to act with caution. Tasayo's eyes narrowed dangerously. Do you suggest she could threaten me? He tipped his head and spat upon the polished floor. Here? Just because she is presently too strong to succumb to an open attack, make no mistake. It is only a matter of time before I will step in and finish her. Indeed, I should relish the chance to see my warriors sack and burn her estate. Perhaps I should use this request for Pali as an opportunity to go there and study the site for assault tactics. The guild messenger seemed uncomfortable with the turn the conversation had taken. His task as a courier required discretion, but the discussion at hand was not one he cared to witness. Rival factions might torture him to learn just what he was overhearing. His guild was well respected, but that did not make him sacrosanct for those hours with his family when he was not wearing his official badges. Incomo mopped his brow again, but the sweat continued to trickle down his collar. Learned in the ways of three generations of Minwanabi lords, he offered argument by his silence. Tasayo had examined all the armour. He could not leave the chamber without confronting his first adviser in the doorway, and Incomo stood like a rock jammed immovably in a river current when he had a point to make. Very well, the Lord of the Minwanabi concluded. I will not meet the bitch on her accursed Akoma soil. To the messenger, he snapped shortly, Here is my reply. Tell the lady I will consider a meeting but in the open on my lands. Let us see whether she has the courage or the stupidity to accept. The messenger bowed in relief and bolted promptly through the opening that Incomo edged aside to create. Straight as the door jam against his back and canny in years, the adviser regarded Tassayo. My lord, if it is trickery you have on your mind... Still, I would counsel you to take care. Mara is not just a girl, but an enemy to be feared. She has united the Hadama clan, no child's task. And even were you to have her brought naked and bound before you, surrounded by your bodyguards, still I would have you be wary. Tassayo stared into his adviser's spaniel eyes. I am wary, he said quietly, most wary of letting this matter become the obsession that it was for Cousin Desio. Mara I intend to kill, but I need no grand promises to the Red God to carry the matter out and neither will I give her ancestors the satisfaction of losing even one night's sleep over the matter. Now move aside. I would have the armory locked now, and a light meal brought to the terrace garden down by the shore of the lake. The Lord of the Minwanabi lingered in the terrace garden long past the hour of sunset. Great torches burned on poles in ceramic containers. A carpet had been laid over the stones, and a wooden dais brought, and upon this Tassayo sat, twirling a wine goblet between his fingers, exactly as he had while on campaign. The lake shore looked much like a war camp, with warriors in full armour performing a mock attack on a knoll overlooking the water. The soft splashes of feeding fish were interspersed with shouted commands. 
At Tasayo's feet sat a boy lately apprenticed to the house scribes, a sharpened chalk clutched in fingers that were tense to hide their shaking. As the Lord commented on his soldier's performance in low, half-whispered phrases, the boy scribbled down his words with a frown of desperate concentration. He was but duplicating the efforts of the scribe set to teach him the craft, but should the Lord of the Minwanabi decide to appraise his work, he could be beaten for failing to achieve some arbitrary standard. The warriors on the rise advanced in timed unison, and absorbed in every nuance of the drill, Tasayo did not at first notice the house runner who lay prostrate in obeisance at the top of the terrace stair. The unfortunate man had to raise his voice to catch attention. What is it? Tasayo snapped so suddenly that the scribe dropped his slate. The chalk fell bouncing across the carpet and rolled to a stop against the runner's forehead, which was pressed into the stone of the last stair. My great lord, the Hamoi Tong master has arrived in answer to your summons. Tasayo briefly weighed the displeasures of meeting the Tong and interrupting his evening battle drill. Interrogating the Tong won out. Bring him here. Then, obviously preoccupied with a subject that vexed him, he glanced at the apprentice's slates and compared the clumsy lettering to the finely practised script of his teacher. Take that away and be glad I didn't order you beaten with it. Motioning to the older scribe to remain, he glanced at the soldiers on the hill. Bowing profusely and trying not to cry, despite the disgrace of a reprimand, the apprentice collected his materials. He hurried off, almost crashing into the house servant who escorted the summoned visitor to the Lord's dais. The tongue master, the Obajan in the ancient tongue, was a man of immense breadth and girth, but not one ounce of fat. Save for a long scalp lock tied high and cascading down his back, he had a shaved head tattooed in patterns of red and white. His nose was flat, his skin deep tan, and his ears multiply pierced. His jewellery consisted of bone pins and rings that jingled lightly as he walked, and his belt held loops sewn into the leather, each of which held a variegated array of instruments of death. A half-dozen daggers, a weighted strangling cord, throwing stars, knuckle guards, picks, vials of poison, and a long metal sword. While considered an outlaw by Surani standards, he demanded the respect due a ruling lord from any he encountered in person. He was accompanied by two assassins clad in black, as much of an honour guard as Tasayo would permit. The Tong master came to Tasayo and bowed his head slightly, asking, Are you well, my lord? His voice was an ominous rumble. Tasayo ignored him for a long, pointed moment. Then he nodded once, acknowledging he was well. But the lord of the Minwanabi did not inquire after the Tong master's health, a pointed insult. Silence wore on the Tong Master, as if the metal wealth he had received from the personage on the cushions suddenly left a taste like curdled milk. The chief of the Tong spoke in sour tones. What does my lord require? This. The name of the one who hired your Tong to assassinate five servants in my house. The Tong Master unwisely raised his hand. The warriors arrayed behind Minwanabi's dais instantly shifted their positions as if to attack, causing the huge man to freeze. But he was not a slave, nor a man of weak nature. Fixing his host with a level gaze, the master of the Hamoi Tong slowly raised his hand to scratch his chin. His tone bit as he replied, Lord Tasayo, the order was your own. Tasayo jumped from his cushions with a speed that had the two assassins slap hands to their own swords. The Tong master motioned for them to resume their former positions. I, demanded Tasayo, I ordered this. How dare you utter such a lie? The Tong master locked stares with Tasayo, eyes narrowed in the flickering light of the torches. 
harsh words, my lord. He hesitated an instant, as if weighing the need to take offence at the insult to his honour. I will show you the document with your signature and your personal chop. Dumbfounded and clumsy for the first time in his life, Tasayo sat back down. My personal chop? His manner turned icy. Let me see. The huge man reached into his tunic and removed a parchment. Tasayo all but snatched the item out of red-stained hands. He sliced the ribbons with his dagger, cracked the rolled document straight and studied the contents with a frown. He twisted the paper this way and that and barked for a slave to hold one of the torches closer, turning his back upon the obajan. He scratched a fingernail over the ink-marked chop. Turakamu's breath, he murmured. Then he looked up, a light of murder in his eyes. What servant delivered this message? The chief of the Tong picked at an earring. No servant, my lord. The order was left in the usual place for such communication, he said calmly. It is a forgery, Tasayo hissed, his hereditary Minwanabi temper breaking free of restraint. I did not write a word of this, nor did one of my scribes. The master of the Tong's face remained impassive. You did not. I just said that. The Minwanabi lord suddenly spun, his hand clenched fast to his sword hilt. Only a gesture from their leader prevented the assassins from again making ready to strike. Tasayo stalked from one end of the dais to the other and rounded like a hungry predator upon the bulky figure of the Obajan. I paid you a fortune in metal to serve me, not to wreak havoc in my own house or to jump at the orders of any rival with the wits to forge documents. Some fool has dared to copy the Minwanabi family chop. You will find him for me. I want his head. Yes, Lord Tasayo. The master of the Tong touched his forehead with his left hand, signifying agreement. I will have the message traced and the culprit sent to you in pieces. See that you do. Tasayo drew his sword and slashed air with a sharp whine of sound. See that you do. Now get out of my sight before I give your flesh to my torturers for live experimentation. The Tong Master said, Seek not to anger me, Lord Tasayo. He motioned for his assassins to step back as he moved forward to confront the Minwanabi ruler. In a low voice he said, the Hanoi are not vassals, a fact you would do well to remember. I am the Obajan of the Hanoi. I will do this thing because my family has been dishonoured even as yours, not because you order it. Fate has given us a common enemy, my lord. But never again threaten me. He glanced down, and Tasayo followed his gaze. Between forefinger and thumb, the man held a small dagger masked from any other's sight. The Lord of the Minwanabi did not flinch or move away. He simply returned his gaze to the eyes of the Obajan. He knew the man had but to twitch and the blade would kill before the Minwanabi Lord could possibly raise his sword. Something like savage humour flickered in Tasayo's eyes as the Tong Master said, I enjoy blood. It is mother's milk to me. Remember that, and we may remain allies. Tasayo turned his back, ignoring the risk, and said, Depart in peace, Obajan of the Hamoy. His knuckles whitened upon the hilt of his sword. The Tong Master turned away, nimbly for a man of his size, the dagger vanishing into his tunic before any other could see it. He left at good pace, his honour guards falling in on either side as he strode from the terrace, leaving a frustrated and enraged man slashing at phantoms in the air. 
Chapter 25 Confrontation Trumpets sounded. A dozen liveried bearers carried a platform upon which Mara firmly held the wooden railing before her. She strove to appear assured, despite the inward conviction that she looked silly, wearing the newly fashioned armour of a Hadama war chief. Unaccustomed to the stiffness of laminated hide greaves and braces, and decidedly ill at ease with fittings and buckles and breastplate, she reminded herself to stand erect. Kiyoke and Sarek had insisted that while she could continue wearing formal robes during meetings, for the first public appearance as clan war chief, she must dress the part. How a man could fight and swing a sword under such a weight of constricting gear, Mara could not guess. Newly appreciative of the warriors who marched in ranks behind, she led the army of clan Hadama nearly 10,000 strong toward the gates of the holy city. Seated at her feet, as befitted her rank, Kevin tried to look like a meek body slave. But with the grassy verge on either side of the road jammed with cheering, waving commoners, he could hardly repress his excitement. Speaking with his face turned up toward his mistress so that few could hear him over the crowd's noise, he laughed. They seem quite taken with you, my lady. Mara unbent enough to return a surreptitious reply. I certainly hope so. Women warriors are rare in the Empire's history, but the few who are remembered were legendary, almost as unique as the servants of the Empire. She attempted to shrug off her newfound notoriety. Any mob loves a spectacle. They'd cheer no matter who stood upon this platform. Maybe, Kevin allowed. But I think they sense the Empire is in danger and see you as someone they can look to with hope. Mara regarded the people who crowded the way to the outer gate of the Holy City. All castes and trades were represented, from sunburned field workers to cart drivers, merchants and guildmasters. All seemed earnest in their approval of the Lady of the Acoma. Many shouted her name, while others waved or tossed tokens made of folded paper for luck. Mara still looked sceptical in the face of such admiration. Kevin added, They know who your enemy is, and they are as surely aware of Tassayo's dark nature as you are. You nobles may not speak ill of one another out of courtesy, but I assure you that commoners don't share that constraint. Given the choice, they endorse the one whose policy is likely to be the more merciful. Is it yours, or the Minwanabi lords? Mara forced herself to exhibit a calmness she did not feel. Kevin's logic seemed reassuring. It might even be true. But the support of the common folk would have no bearing on the outcome of the pending struggle. Aware that the next few days would find her either triumphant or dead, Mara tried not to dwell upon consequences. There could be no other choices. The attack upon her and her son had forced the issue. She must move or maintain a defensive strategy until the day that her warriors, her guard or her spy network failed her again. And Tassio's blade found her heart. On the day her father, Sezu, had fallen victim to a Minwanabi trap, he had chosen to fight to the death rather than shame his ancestry by choosing flight and a coward's life. Mara could do no less. She had tried to precipitate events by her demand to meet with Tassayo. If he refused her, she must confront him. And yet, with no plan in mind to spare either her house or her honour, her posture was no more than bravado. As she rode in triumph on the platform at the head of Clan Hadama's war strength, her mind held a morass of fears. Look at that! exclaimed Kevin. Jerked out of morbid introspection, Mara glanced where he pointed and felt her throat tighten. An army camped to the west of the Holy City. The hills were a patchwork of coloured tents and banners, which Kevin swiftly counted. After rough calculation, he said, I guess that encampment holds 15,000 warriors. Mara's initial jolt of nerves eased as she identified the banners. That is a part of Clan Zakala. 
Lord Hapara has brought the Zacatecas in strength. Others follow him. But not only her allies were present in force. Mara nodded across the river. Look over there. The road followed the Gagajin, and on the far bank Kevin saw another army, its tents so thickly clustered the land bristled with banner poles. God, there must be fifty, sixty thousand warriors in those hills. It looks like half the lords of the empire brought every man capable of wearing armour and carrying a sword. Mara nodded, her mouth drawn grimly taut. The issue will be decided here. Those across the river answer to Tasayo. That is the might of Clan Shonshoni, other families in vassalage, and the Minwanabi allies. I can see the banners of the Tondora and the Ginesa near the river's edge, and of course the Akamchi and the Inrodaka have at last sided with Tasayo. She made a sweeping gesture with her hand. I will wager lords Kedda and Tommagu are encamped to the north of the city with their allies close to 40,000 swords. And I am certain that beyond sight of the city another 100,000 warriors are within a day's march. Scores of lesser families stay out of harm's way but close enough to pick over the corpses if we come to conflict. She lowered her voice as if fearful the wrong ears might overhear her. So many soldiers ready to do battle. Can we avoid a civil war even if we wish? The crowd's cheers and its festive mood of gaiety suddenly rang hollow. Aware that his lady was trembling beneath her armour, Kevin returned a reassuring shrug. Few soldiers are keen to kill. Give them an excuse and they just as soon get drunk with one another or indulge in a little friendly brawling. At least, that's how it is on my world. Yet, the contrast between the animated expressions he remembered from Midkemia and the mask-like bearing of even the meanest beggar on Kelewan could not be ignored. Kevin kept the thought to himself that he had never known a bunch so willing to die as these Sirani. As long as people kept calm and didn't start insulting one another's mothers, all these factions might be able to avoid bloodshed. But if only one loud-mouthed sod got rude... The thought did not bear finishing. Even with the point left unsaid, Mara would not be blind to risk. One sword drawn for honour's sake and all the empire would shake. Could it be avoided? After witnessing the massacres that occurred on the night of the bloody swords, Kevin did not care to examine the odds. As her vanguard neared the arching city gate, the crowds of admiring gawkers fell away. Into stillness and a suddenly emptied road, a patrol of imperial warriors stepped forth to meet the Hadama entourage. Mara ordered a halt before the gate as the strike leader approached, his white armour with gold accents brilliant in the morning sun. Mara of the Akoma, he called. Unaccustomed to the weight of the plumed helm that shaded her brow, Mara nodded careful acknowledgement. For what cause do you marshal Clan Hadama and bring them to the Holy City? demanded the Emperor's officer. From the height of her platform, Mara stared down at the arrogant young man, supremely confident of his imperial rank. At last she said, You shame the light of heaven with your lack of manners. The officer ignored the reprimand. Lady, I will answer for my actions when Turakamu judges where I will next mount the wheel of life. The young man glanced first at the armies encamped upon the riverbanks, and then with pointed reproof at the warriors following after Mara's platform. Manners are the least of our difficulties. As the gods will, many of us could encounter our fate soon enough. I have my orders. Obviously strained that he had only twenty soldiers at his back, and many thousands stood ready to answer Mara's call, he finished in blunt command. The Imperial Force Commander insists that I hear your reason for bringing the might of Clan Hadama to the Holy City. 
Making an issue of this demand could prove just the flame to ignite the conflict, Mara realised. She decided it wise to ignore the slight. We come for counsel with others of our rank and station in the interest of the Empire's well-being. Then proceed to your quarters, Lady of the Acoma, and no Imperial peace is upon you. One honor guard of Acoma soldiers may accompany you with a like number of clan soldiers for each lord of the Hadama who joins you. But know that the light of heaven has ordered the council hall closed until he commands otherwise. Anyone who seeks entry to the palace without imperial consent will be counted traitor to the empire. Now, if you would proceed. The young officer stood aside to permit passage of the war chief's platform and her honor guard. Before resuming her march, Mara bent to Lujan and gave swift orders. Carry word to Lord Chekawara and the others. We meet at my townhouse at sundown. Her force commander snapped a bow. And the warrior's mistress? One last time, Mara scanned the surrounding hillsides with their blanket of tents and banners, soldiers and weapons racks. Seek out the Minwanabi standard and encamp the men as close to his lines as possible. I wish Tasayo to know that whatever he does, an Akoma dagger is poised at his throat. Your will, mistress. Lujan hastened to relay her orders to the appropriate sub-officers and then to assemble her honor guard. In formal state, Mara signalled for her company to continue on through the city gates. As Lord Chekawara and the other Hadama lords moved after, each in position according to rank, she wished she had some way to allay the dread lingering in the pit of her stomach. All would be determined here, within the next few days, and still she had no idea of how she would avert the fate Minwanabi had vowed, that she and her nine-year-old heir be delivered as sacrifice to the Red God. The armour she wore seemed to weigh on her shoulders, and the crowd's shout suddenly seemed uncomfortably loud. Was there anywhere left, she wondered, where she could go to find peace for thought? The journey through the city to her townhouse left Mara feeling taxed. Attributing her fatigue to poor spirits, she postponed her initial meetings and ordered the afternoon for rest. In retrospect, the change in schedule allowed Arakasi time to seek out his agents in the city and glean what information he could. She, her spymaster and Lujan dined alone, discussing various ways they might move to blunt Minwanabi's ambition. No one had any brilliant insights. Next morning, Clan Hadama met. Within the inner garden's freshly pruned greenery, the most prominent ruling lords of the clan, as well as a half-dozen allies, were seated in a large circle adjacent to the central fountain. Through the trill of falling water, the lord of the Ontara ventured opinion. Lady Mara, rulers who have no love for Tasayo will stand with him against the emperor, simply because Ichinda defies tradition. Many in our own clan fear an empire ruled by one man, even if that one man is the light of heaven. A warlord may dominate, the gods know, yet he is still but first among equals. Others murmured agreement. Still feeling oddly out of sorts, Mara made an effort to concentrate. Kevin's dry observations on Sirani politics were right on one point— these men were more in love with their own prerogatives than haters of cruelty, murder and waste. Freshly aware that her own thinking had changed to a degree incomprehensible to all but a handful of her ruling peers, Mara regarded her clansmen and allies and strove for tact. Those who cling to tradition blindly or out of fear of change are fools. To embrace Tasayo is to hold a rally to your bosom. He will take warmth and nourishment, but in the end, he will kill. Allow him to blunt the emperor's power, and you choose a worse course than absolute imperial rule. 
The Minwanabi Lord is a young man. He could hold the white and gold for decades. He is clever, ruthless, and if I may speak bluntly, captivated by the pain of others. He is a clever enough player of the game that he might make question of the succession a moot issue. Almecho and Aksantuka came close to creating a family office. Is the ambition of Tasayo of the Minwanabi any less? Several of the lords glanced at one another, for they had been among those inclined to back Tasayo's predicted bid for the white and gold. With the Amechan clan crushed by Aksantuka's shame, the Minwanabi were left unrivalled as first claimants to the office. Lord Zacatecas was too young and Lord Kedder too closely allied with the Blue Wheel Party to gainsay the Emperor. The only possible rival bid would be Lord Tonmargu if the Anasati lent full support. Yet Jiro was not deemed reliable. His own agenda was not yet clear and he had plainly indicated he would not be following in his father's footsteps. More than street gossips and rumour mongers were convinced that Tasayo would be the next warlord. The more pertinent question seemed to be whether he would gain the white and gold peacefully or by means of a bloody war. Of all present, Lord Chekawara was the only one relaxed enough to avail himself of the cakes upon the refreshment trays. Dusting crumbs from his chin, he offered his own opinion. Mara, in all you have done since becoming ruling lady, you have consistently shown a brilliant ability to extemporise. May we assume that you have some unexpected twist of the rope in store for Tassayo? Unsure how much this question might be rooted in bitterness over her assumption of his former office, and how much an honest plea for reassurance, Mara sought some hint of expression to give her a clue. But Lord Benshai's corpulent face remained impassive. Mara dared not answer carelessly. By forcing her clan to unquestioned obedience to her will, she had also taken on responsibility for ensuring their survival. Although she still had no idea what she would do, rather than let her doubts shake the foundation of her newly forged alliance, she chose to be evasive. Tasayo shall not command more than worms in the soil before long, my lord. The other lords present exchanged glances. Since to challenge this outright statement would involve a point of honour, no one rushed to speak in contradiction. After an awkward minute, the lords of Clan Hadama began to rise and bid their war chief good day. All knew that before the close of the week, Tasayo would march into the city to confront the emperor and demand a restoration of the High Council's power. Just how Mara intended to prevent him was beyond anyone's guess. Certainly she lacked the military might to challenge the Minwanabi lords in the field. Yet she had wits and enough presence that even Benshai of the Chekawara dared not speak against her under her own roof. The last lord departed and returned from seeing the clan rulers to the door, Sarik entered the courtyard garden and was surprised to find his mistress still seated by the fountain. Unofficially filling Nakoya's role as first adviser, he inquired gently if there was anything his lady might require. Mara took a long moment to answer. Turning a face that seemed shockingly pale, she murmured, Have my maid attend me, please. The phrasing was most unlike her. Aware that in some things he could never fill Nakoya's sandals, and also by canny intuition sensing that somehow his mistress needed more understanding than he had the background to offer, Sarik floundered at a loss. Are you ill, lady? Mara seemed to struggle for speech. Simply a disagreeable stomach. It will pass. But Sarek knew naked fear. She looked suddenly very frail. Afraid she might be taken with the summer fever, or worse, that an enemy might have found means to poison her food, the Acoma advisor took another quick step forward. 
His worry was sharp enough for Mara to take notice. I will be recovered within the hour. She reassured him and followed with a weak wave of her hand. My maid will know how to make me comfortable. Sarek's alarm transformed to a look of piercing inquiry, which the lady shied away from without comment. She had not lied. At last, she realised her tiredness of the past few days was not simple fatigue. The difficult stomach in the morning was a familiar sign of pregnancy. With Ayaki, she could not keep breakfast down for the first nine weeks she had carried him. Abruptly recalled to the fact that Sarek had been a soldier long enough to have observed the condition in the army's camp followers, she peremptorily ordered him to leave before he had time to make his suspicions a certainty. Left alone until her maid's arrival, Mara felt sadness well up inside. She permitted the tears that gathered in her eyes, aware that her feelings were amplified by the changes within her body. She would indulge herself now when contemplating bitter choices, for the time would arrive soon when she must act with... What had Kevin called it? Nerves of steel. Yes, she must have only hardness in her soul. And thinking of her beloved, sitting quietly in her quarters awaiting her summons or her return to his side, the tears flowed freely down her face. Above anyone else, Kevin must never find out she carried a child by him. That single fact would bind him to her in a way that would be cruelty to sunder. His devotion to Ayaki had established how much regard he held for children. Though he had never spoken on the subject, Mara had read the longing in his eyes. She knew he yearned for a son or a daughter of his own, and that, by his homeworld's code of honour, such things were not ever taken lightly. On Kelowan, the bastard child of a slave would not be an issue. The illegitimate children of nobles often rose to high office within their own houses. But to Kevin, the matter would lie closer to his heart than his own life. No, the man she loved must never know, and that meant her days with him were numbered. The maid arrived, and seeing her mistress in distress, came at once to her side. Lady, what may I do? Mara held out her hand. Just help me, so I may rise without becoming ill. The request was voiced in a strained whisper. As the lady of the Acoma stood on shaky feet, she understood that pregnancy was but a small part of the reason she was ill. The tension within her was like a bowstring drawn until it threatened to snap. Some day she hoped the child within her womb would be counted Hokanu's son and rise to be the lord of the Shinzawai. That he, already she hoped for a boy, would be Kevin's, was simply her way of discharging the debt of honour due the barbarian who had won her heart and repeatedly saved her life. His line would continue in distinction upon the soil of Kelowan, and so his shade would be revered and remembered. But Mara knew she must first survive the next three days. Even as powerful a lord as Komatsu would not bind his heir to a house with an enemy as threatening as Tasayo. White now from more than stomach cramps, Mara leaned heavily on her maid's supporting arm. She must formulate a plan to snatch the victory that seemed assured from the grasp of the Minwanabi. She simply must. The alternative was utter obliteration for her son and for Kevin's unborn child. Sunset threw red light through the wide screens of the chamber. Tasayo of the Minwanabi perched like a monarch upon a pile of cushions in the largest, most opulent suite of his residence in the Holy City. Unlike most other ruling lords who owned townhouses, the Minwanabi possessed a sizeable mansion on a hilltop above the city, overlooking the heart of the imperial precinct. Gazing through slitted eyes at the changing of the white-armoured guards at the emperor's inner gate, the Lord hardly glanced at the message handed to him by his first adviser. With utmost patience, Incomo prompted, 
Master, Mara is but a short distance from the city gate with her honor guard. She is also accompanied by an imperial messenger bearing a staff of office, and an imperial peace is upon the city. At your word, she will travel to the appointed meeting place. Her choice of timing will not save her. Tassio ran his thumb along his jaw as he followed the movement of the guards in their sparkling white armour. That silly boy who calls himself Emperor can delude himself for a few more days. But no call of imperial peace will prevent me from destroying an enemy. After an interval, Tassio added, However... It might be useful to wait to strike until we have a time and place of our choosing, and it might be entertaining to hear what the Akoma bitch desires, simply to learn what I may do to frustrate her. Inkoma grew tense with apprehension. Master, I would be remiss in my duty if I did not advise against this meeting. The woman is more dangerous than any other ruler in the Empire, as she has demonstrated on numerous occasions. Drawn at last from contemplation, Tassio silenced his first adviser with a glare. I have an army with me in Como. But do you stand to gain? The first adviser asked urgently, more than mindful that his lord's uncle had died under his own roof with his army about him as a result of Mara's plotting. If the lady of the Akoma desires talk... Anything she will say must be to aid her own cause against you. I see nothing to benefit the Minwanabi in this, my lord. Tassio drummed his fingers upon the cushion at his knee. Send this message to the bitch. I will honour the truce and speak with her. Seeing in Como's features cloud over, he narrowed yellow eyes. I see no point in all this needless worry. Mara and her brat might have escaped death by a narrow margin, but when I win the white and gold, she shall be the first of my enemies to be removed. Graceful, fast, and intent upon his beliefs, he stood. I may be magnanimous. Those silly fools in Clan Hadama will perhaps be allowed to live, but only if they become my vassals, after they see me end the Akoma name forever. With a rare smile, he added, You worry too much, Inkomo. I can always say no to whatever offer Mara makes. Inkomo remained silent. He had the terrible feeling that if Tassio rejected Mara's offer, that would be exactly what she wished. The first adviser bowed, turned, and went to send the message. The wind was called Butana in the ancient language of the Zataki people of the Empire. The translation meant wind from demons, and it blew for days, even weeks at a time. The gusts were dry, whipping out of the distant mountains in fitful, howling bursts. In the hot season, such winds could desiccate a piece of uncovered meat or fruit in hours. In the cool season, the air carried a chill, and at night the temperature dropped, sending people indoors to huddle around fires and under layers of robes. When the Butana blew, the common folk said dogs went mad and demons walked the land in the guise of men. Husbands were known to run screaming into the night, never to be seen again, and wives became melancholy to the point of suicide. Legends abounded of supernatural beings who appeared when the Butana whined across the land. The Grey Man, an ancient myth, was said to walk the empire on nights like this. Should a lone traveller meet him, he must answer a riddle and be rewarded, if his solution was found pleasing, or suffer loss of his head if the grey man proved dissatisfied. Such were the stories of the Butana, the bitter dry wind that blew this night. Under brilliant stars, atop a hill outside the city walls, two small armies waited facing one another. Torches guttered and banners flapped in the gusts, casting a flickering transience of light and shadow over faces taut with apprehension. 
Plumed officers waited before the ranks in motionless formation, and at the head of each army stood a ruler. On one side, a woman clothed in shimmering green silk and emeralds, and upon the other, a lean predatory figure in jet armour with black and orange bosses. Positioned equidistant between them, an imperial herald waited, his robe of office gleaming like bone under a one quarter moon. In a voice loud enough to carry over the wind, he addressed the two forces in attendance. Let it be known that the imperial peace is upon this city and the surrounding countryside. Let no man draw his sword in anger or retribution. So commands the light of heaven. Turning toward the band who surrounded Tassio, the herald intoned, This lady, of noble rank and line, claims that she comes to treat with you for the good of the empire. My lord, do you acknowledge? Tassio inclined his head, and the messenger deemed that sufficient. Turning to where Mara waited across a narrow expanse of grass, the herald raised his voice above the wind's rising whine. My lady, this lord answers your call to parley and acknowledges your intent to speak for the good of the empire. Mara returned a bow, making a point of correct courtesy to contrast with her enemy's lapse. The herald received his due without reassurance. His stance between two enemies sworn to blood feud was precarious, and he knew it. Family honour might be trustworthy when two such ancient lines were involved, but a single hothead among the ranks of common warriors could precipitate a massacre. He needed all of his training to speak steadily to those within earshot. What is the highest duty? Every man, woman and warrior present answered with the phrase, To serve the Empire! By crossing his arms, the Imperial Herald signalled for the principal parties to approach. That moment, the Butana drove down in a whipping gust, its sound like the moan of a dirge. Trying not to take the incident as omen, the Herald completed his office. My lady, my lord... I shall await at a distance so that you may discourse untroubled. He withdrew at a rate that was barely within the limits of propriety, leaving Mara and Tassio faced off with but two paces between them. Unwilling to succumb to the indignity of shouting over the wind, Mara left the opening words to Tassio. Predictably, he did not begin with politeness or salutations. His thin lips curled slightly at the corners, and in the unpredictable flicker of the torches, his eyes seemed to shine like a sarcat's. Mara, this is a situation I had not anticipated. He waved his hand, indicating the odd surroundings, the poised warriors and the snapping banners that were all in the tableau that seemed alive. I could draw my sword and end this now. Defiantly matching his malice, she answered, And disgrace your house's name. I think not, Tassio. Her tone turned dry. That would be too much, she fixed him with dark eyes, even for a Minwanabi. Tassio laughed, the sound unexpectedly bright over the dissonant undertone of the Butana. You will be made to understand a truth. A man with enough stature may do as he pleases with impunity, Mara. He studied her from under veiling eyelids and said, We waste time. Why are you here? For the good of the Empire, Mara reiterated. You bring your army and the bulk of Clan Shonshoni to Kentasani. I believe you come to make war upon the Emperor. Tassayo's manner showed interest, but under his veneer of civility, Mara sensed an almost physical wave of hatred. She resisted an instinct to step back and barely managed to keep her composure. As with dogs who circled before a fight, she sensed that the first one to turn away would be the one to invite attack. You bring the bulk of Clan Hadama behind you. 
the Minwanabi lord replied in deceptively lazy inflections. Yet I do not accuse you of preparing treasonous assault upon the light of heaven. Mara spelled out the obvious. I am in no position to claim the white and gold. As if conceding a compliment, Tassayo inclined his head. Yet his feline watching eyes tracked her every movement, seeking opening. The Lady of the Acoma gathered courage and added a barb. Cease your preening, Tasayo. Your position of ascendance has nothing to do with merit. The other claimants are in disarray because of their dealings with Aksantuka. A fine point, snapped Tasayo. Then he smiled. In the end, for whatever reason, I win. No. Mara allowed a slight pause. A stalemate could go on indefinitely. That would serve the light of heaven, since delay would allow him to bring the empire under his own control. The imperial government may be asleep, but it is not dead. Over time, more and more lords would accede to the jurisdiction of the imperial court and governors, and less power would reside with the high council. Should Ichindar order the smaller lords one at a time to send support to his imperial whites, consolidating his authority, soon the roads and the river between your estates and the trade cities would be commanded by his army. Already the Kanazawa serve alongside the whites. Who next? The Zakala? How long before you become a lord only within the boundaries of your own lands? A light touched Tasayo's eyes, hard-edged as the burn of the stars in a sky stripped of haze by the Butana. You speak of possibilities, Mara, and remote ones at that. Yet his manner had become subtly guarded. Pressing her narrow advantage, Mara sought to unbalance him. Not that remote, Tasayo, and well you know it. Before he could speak, she said, There is another possibility. What if Lords Keda and Zacatecas threw their support to Ton Margu at the outset? Tasayo's attention focused instantly upon Mara. Beyond that, he concealed his surprise. He was aware Lord Hapara was her ally, but mention of the Lord of the Keda was unexpected. As Tasayo continued his flat stare in silence, Mara said, I have a proposal. The other three claimants to the white and gold could form alliance only to frustrate you. Even joined, they cannot win their own choice. Given that I control enough votes in the council to swing the outcome. Tasayo's patience seemed suddenly worn. Then do so, Mara. Give the white and gold to Frasso of the Tomago and go home. Mara felt the wind like a tingle of chill against her skin. She played a dangerous game for perilous stakes and knew it. Yet she saw no other option. Too much innocent blood would be spilt if events were permitted to run their worst course. Choosing her phrases with care, she said, The difficulty is that while I would rather die than see you gain the white and gold, you are the only man who could hold the throne. Lord Tonmargu is not the sort of man to face down the light of heaven inside his own palace, so we are left with two choices. A warlord who is the emperor's puppet, or you. Wary and not so vain as to swallow all he heard without suspicion, Tasayo considered... If a figurehead warlord is a fate worse than death, but you wish my instant obliteration, what solution do you propose? I can do for you what I could also offer Frasai of the Tonmagu. Should I bid, enough lords will support you to put you firmly upon the warlord's throne. The wind held sway through another interval of silence. Tasayo stood motionless, his plumes whipping in the brisk air. 
His face became too still, a mask, and his hands rested like carved stone on the hilt of his sword, while burning amber eyes never moved from Mara's face. After considering her words, he said, Suppose for a moment you are correct. Tell me why I should care, given the fact, lady, that I can seize the warlord's mantle without your help. The reply came as gall from Mara's lips. At what price? Would you bring the empire to ruin to take the prize? You will win, I have no doubt, for while few would openly back your claim out of love for House Minwanabi, many will oppose Ichindar's break with tradition and to protect their own prerogatives. So, in the end... After a ruinous war, you will sit on the white and gold throne, marry your son to one of the departed Ichindar's many daughters, and have him become the ninety-second light of heaven. Then you will have no trouble having the new emperor ratify your election. But you will rule a shattered people. Mara strove to maintain poise, merely imagining the costs of such a bid for power caused revulsion in every fibre of her being. After a necessary interval to keep herself from shaking, she added, Such a conflict will certainly leave you critically weakened. Are your reserves deep enough to cope with those likely to prey upon your borders after such mighty conquest? The lesser houses would swarm over you like ravenous insects. Tassio broke eye contact with Mara for the first time. Loftily remote, and in his secret depths convinced he had gained the key to Mara's gravest weakness, he turned and surveyed his forces. Under his scrutiny, they seemed flawless, arrayed in rows across the hillside and ready for his instant orders. In their impeccably clean armour and correct bearing, they were a sight to bring pride to any commander. The glorious Minwanabi banner of alternating squares of black and orange snapped smartly in the wind. What else Tassio saw in the night that sheltered his army only he knew? At length, his gaze swung insolently back to Mara. Do continue on the assumption that your supposition is true, lady. What do you propose in exchange for my not seizing what I perceive is already mine? Mara stifled a fury that had nothing to do with enmity or blood feud, but held root in her personal desire to nurture life. I treat with you for the good of the Empire, Tasayo. I am not without resources, she motioned, and an unarmed servant approached from her lines. The Lord of the Minwanabi could not know that the man in the simple robe was actually Arakasi in disguise. In flawless imitation of civility, the spymaster carried a wrapped bundle, unrolled the parchment covering, and tossed a human head that reeked of preservative across the grass to Tassayo's feet. Barely shy of shouting, Mara said, You should recognise the face. Behold the remains of the man you attempted to use to compromise my spy network. Tassayo returned a startling rictus of hate. You! His word came out as a snarl. You were the one who ordered murder in my house. Only I may command death upon Minwanabi lands. A mad light entered his eyes, icily, without compunction. Touched by an involuntary shiver, Mara sensed threat in the air. The wind ruffled her robes, tugged at her elaborately piled hair, and chilled the sweat on her skin. No words were spoken, but Mara knew in her soul that only the thinnest thread of reason remained to remind Tassayo of his pledge of truce. At this moment, she knew, her enemy wished for nothing more than his hands around Mara's throat, perhaps as he took her in brutal rape. Then... With equally frightening abruptness, Tassayo's expression shifted to a satisfied smile. So, you admit to killing your own agent? Mara willed herself to outer calmness. 
Inwardly she was frightened by his shattering shift of mien, and aware that she was dealing with a man who could only be judged insane. She inclined her head. More than one, Taseo. Taseo's teeth flashed white as his smile turned cruel. Through a long and uneasy interval, the only sounds upon the hillside were the crack and flap of battle standards and the hiss of the wind through the grass. Then Tasayo said, So, you forged my family chop and paid the Hamoi Tong to murder your own agents in my house. Lady, you have unexpected turns of originality. He did not threaten or posture, which Mara found disturbing. That his heart held murder and worse could never for an instant be doubted, and yet she pressed him. You must consider the frustration in coming years of not being able to bring strangers into your service, Tasayo. You know, as I stand here, my agents shall be among them. Perhaps you should have all merchants and visitors banned from your estates, and even refuse the wagons of traders, lest you admit a Nakoma spy. Tasayo's patience suddenly vanished. He shouted, Do you really think such pathetic threats worry me, Mara? Upon your death, all your servants become slaves and grey warriors. What dread will I know when you are food for worms? With a droop to her shoulders that was not feigned, Mara drew a tired breath. I bring you a proposal. Tasayo took a half step forward. Uncannily composed and beautiful as a predator, he did not twitch a muscle at the sound as a hundred Akoma soldiers slapped hands upon their sword hilts. Reckless in his disdain, the Lord of the Minwanabi said, I have no interest in listening, Mara. My predecessor swore blood oath to Turakamu that this feud would end in a coma obliteration. While I lack Desio's passions and count the pledge regrettable, still I am bound to it. I must see the Akoma line ended. The alternative need not be discussed. There can be no cessation to our conflict. Mara sensed Arakasi's alarm, but she could see no other way beyond this impasse. Would you consider... A suspension? Caught by surprise, Tasayo blinked. What do you mean? Quarter. No end to our enmity. That will never abate until one family or the other is dust. But a postponement of conflict. Until the Empire is once again on a firm footing for peace. The good of the Empire, Tasayo murmured. His humour was cutting. Intrigued despite his sarcasm, he added, Say on. I propose a meeting with the ruling lords of the Empire, but in the Imperial Palace. There we confront the light of heaven with our need to resolve this confrontation and prevent a crisis that will plunge our land into ruin. Or would you wish to govern an empire where the eastern frontier is dominated by Thuril captains and their marauding highlanders? A northern border overrun each spring by thin raiders seeking Surani heads as trophies. A return of pirates to the outpost isles. You do paint a bleak picture, Tasayo allowed. If I agree to this meeting, you'll deliver the votes needed to grant me the warlord's throne without bloodshed? Should you agree to meet with the emperor... Peacefully, I will pledge to make every effort to the last of my resources to ensure no one ascends to the warlord's throne before you. Mara drew a shaky breath. Upon this you have my most holy oath, sworn upon my family's name and honour, from now to the last generation of the Akoma line. Tasayo raised his eyebrows at this most sacred of vows. A sceptical twinge of malice coloured his tone. If any of your descendants are worth swearing by, how long a truce would you wish? 
although offered the most mortal of insults, Mara steeled herself against irrational anger. More than her family's name was at stake here, and more than the affairs of nobles. Servants, children, craftsmen and thousands of nameless slaves would suffer if the Empire's rulers were to indulge in a senseless war. Changed from the woman of limited perspective that she had once been, Mara did what she could not have conceived of prior to being influenced by Kevin's foreign ideas. More, she swallowed her family's honour. Rather than merely a phrase, to serve the Empire was now her only guiding motive. Swallowing mortification, she said, Hold off your final assault until I have returned home and seen to the affairs of my house. After that, let our struggle resume without stint until the bitterest end. Her tone of capitulation drew a bright laugh from Tassayo. Unable to resist toying with the vulnerability she had exposed, he said, Already you presume to guess my answer, lady. You overestimate my love of the Empire. My honour is my own, not my nation's. He looked her avidly up and down to see if she showed discomfort. But Mara was familiar with his malice. She revealed not the slightest hint of discomfort to gratify his lust for torment. After apparent thought, Tassayo amended. However, a quick solution to my accession to the white and gold would spare me a certain degree of bother. He smiled, and Mara saw how well this madman could mask his depravity behind military propriety and courtly manners. I will agree. Let the High Council meet before the light of heaven and have an end to his dictatorial rule. You shall marshal your allies, and when the moment comes, you will have them support my claim. Then, when such things as fate requires are finished, you shall have my safe conduct back to your estates until you have put your affairs in order. Be sure that I will march against you, Mara. But until then you may count the hours you live as payment for your service to the Empire. Drained, and feeling desolate beyond words, Mara sealed her pledge with a bow. She dared not wonder how her father or brother would have reacted were they alive to know of her commitment. All she could hope was that war might be averted, lives might be spared, and the unborn child within her womb might be permitted enough time to achieve birth. Whether she and Ayaki died for the pact she sealed this moment... Perhaps the Chojar Queen would consent to keep one newborn infant alive in secret. When shall we meet? Tassayo said in a voice that betrayed satisfaction. The day after tomorrow, said Mara. Send word to the Emperor and the other council members, and leave me free to muster the support I have promised. It shall be interesting to see whether the lady can meet her obligation. If she forswear, she will not leave the city alive, Tassayo ended. He returned the shallowest of bows, barely more than an inclination of his head. Then he spun with the quickness of a sarcat and walked back to his own lines. Beaten down by a sense of hopelessness greater than any she had known in her life, Mara returned to Lujan's protection. From the sidelines, the Imperial Herald proclaimed... This conference is ended. Depart in peace and honour, and know the gods are pleased that no blood was shed this night. As Mara's officers called orders for the Akoma army to disperse, the Minuanabi first adviser drew breath to address his master. But Tassayo held up his hand. She is defeated in Como. He watched Mara's retreating figure, a knowing smile on his lips. I have seen that look in the eyes of warriors waiting for death upon the battlefield. He gave a half shrug. Oh, they fight well, and do honour to their ancestors. But they know they are fated to die. Mara knows I have won. Master, 
pleaded in Como. I would be less than your dutiful servant if I did not point out that there may be unexpected turns in your assessment. There are other issues at stake beyond who may claim the white and gold. Ichinda has fathered no son. At this moment, many of the Imperials might whisper that the time draws nigh to install another member of the royal line upon the throne. Jiro of the Anasati could be their choice. Kamatsu of the Shinzawai can trace ties to royalty and his son is well regarded. What if you were to discover this offer is but... Tasayo sharply cut off speculation. Mara knows I have one. It is over. Oddly piqued, as if he had relished a challenge that would not materialise, the Lord of the Minwanabi signalled his force commander to wheel his columns of soldiers and march back to their camp. Left alone with the mournful song of the Bhutana, Inkomo lingered behind. He could not imagine how Mara might contrive to shift the course of events yet to come, but he knew this conflict was far from over. At best, Mara had bought herself the gift of a few more months in which to plot. At worst, she would have some trap in mind, and the Minwanabi would be swallowed by it. Chilled by a heavy gust, Incomo caught his flapping robes about him and hurried to overtake his master. As he picked his path downhill in the darkness, he mulled over the most prudent course, to send inquiries to his agents for the latest information they might uncover about Mara's intentions, or to complete his unfinished Last Testament and death poem. Caught by a deepening sense of finality, Incomo decided to do both. The night's progression of events did not end with the meeting on the hilltop. Mara arrived back at her townhouse feeling tired to her bones. She shed her outer robe and pushed back strands of hair torn loose by the incessant wind. And only then came out of her days long enough to understand what Sarik was telling her. An imperial messenger had called in her absence. What did he say? Mara asked dully, and by the concern on Sarik's face she realised she had asked him to repeat himself. Tactful, Sarik explained, and the particulars of Ichindar's latest proclamation struck Mara like a blow to the heart. Her mind went numb after the first words. That the Emperor of Suranoani was buying up all Midkemian slaves belonging to the subjects of the Empire. The words fair price and imperial treasury seemed sounds made by cold winds, an evil extension of the nightmares brought by the Bhutana. Reeling as if the underpinnings of her life had all been torn asunder, Mara did not feel Sarik's hands help her from the hallway into the sitting room. The cushion that supported her did not seem real, and the tears that sprang into her eyes seemed those of somebody else. Her body, her mind, her heart, all seemed open wounds of anguish. Why? she asked dully. Why? Sarek had not released her hand, mostly because she clung still to the warmth of his touch. He offered what comfort he could, though he guessed the futility of such efforts. In the gentlest of tones, he tried to soften the insupportable. It is said that the light of heaven will sell Kevin's countrymen back to the Midkemian king. All slaves who were prisoners of the war will be shipped downriver and sent through the rift. The original rift has been reopened outside the city of the plains. Flinching outright at the mention of her beloved's name, Mara could not prevent brimming eyes from spilling over. The emperor makes free men of slaves. Calmly, Sarek qualified. Out of respect for our gods, one could say that act would be the province of Liam, King of Isles. Mara regarded the whitened fingers twined with those of her adviser. Her resolve to keep nerves of steel had availed nothing. She felt defeated down to her core. 
The threat posed by the Minwanabi had at last overtaken her scant resources, and now she was to lose Kevin. The fact she had already resolved to send him away into freedom made no difference. The immediacy of the moment devastated. When does the light of heaven require the slaves to be surrendered? She asked, surprised that her tongue could shape words. Sarik answered with profound sympathy. By noon tomorrow, my lady. There had been no warning of this. None. Mara choked back a sob, shamed by her show of emotion and hearing the shade of Nakoya scolding her for ignoble sentiment. She grasped for one single thought upon which to bolster her courage. For bravery alone would see her through the ruins of her only happiness and the hopes she had dared to cherish concerning the continuance of the Akoma name. Only one hint of good came to mind amidst the bleakness. Kevin would be spared the disaster that must follow her support of Tassio for the warlordship. If the barbarian's recitations of kingdom law and the great freedom were truths, then his king Liam would free him. He would live out his days honourably in Zun and escape the madness and carnage to come. Mara tried to convince herself that her beloved was better off gone, but logic did not appease the lacerating pain in her heart. She found the hand not gripping Sarix cradled over the small spark of life engendered deep in her womb. Like a spill of light through a doorway, revelation came. She realised that all she had done this night had been for Kevin's unborn child. She and Ayaki were Surani-born, dedicated to centuries-old tradition that held to honour before life, and they would unhesitatingly choose death before disgrace. But the spirit that quickened in her womb was half Midkemian. Somehow she had acknowledged its future right to live and prosper with the values the father would have accorded such things. Recognition dawned with no small portion of fear as Mara of the Akoma understood she had again stepped beyond the bounds of her culture. She had accorded the common folk of the Empire consideration before her family name. Once she would have believed such a concept would have shamed her father and her ancestry, even earned the wrath of Suranuani's many gods. Now she could conceive of no other viable choice. Torn between tears and the sense of relief that soon, very soon, the years of tribulation would be ended, Mara came back to herself. She loosened her fingers from Sarix and blotted awkwardly at her eyes. I will need the services of my maid, she managed tremulously. Kevin must not see that I have been upset. Sarik made to rise and bow, but a small shake of Mara's head detained him. Send word back to Kiyoke that all of our outworld slaves are to be sent forthwith to the city of the plains. Then choose our strongest warriors to escort Kevin to whatever staging area the Emperor has set aside for the Midkemians. Say nothing of this to anyone save Lujan, lest word of this deployment be carelessly mentioned by the servants. Here Mara paused to wrestle past a catch in her throat. But my lover has a contrary and stubborn nature. Although he longs for his freedom, he may have a mind to argue over the manner in which it is bestowed upon him. Here the lady was unable to continue, but Sarek understood. Kevin had never submitted to orders except through choice or brute force. He had proved himself a formidable fighter and, where Mara was concerned, no man might predict how he would react to being parted from her. For his own safety's sake, and the lives of the warriors who must deliver him into the care of the Emperor, he must not hear of the fate that awaited him beforehand. Saddened, for he had come to like the Midkemian's odd humour and his decidedly strange views of life, Sarik bowed to his mistress's wisdom. But, as he hurried off to send in her maids, he reflected that he had never seen a more bleak expression in the eyes of any woman he had known. The night passed in terrible, restless torment for Mara. While the Butana wailed across the roof-tree, she made frantic love to Kevin, the last time ending in tears in his arms. 
he stroked her with a tenderness that threatened to break her heart. Hurt by her silence, her unwillingness to speak her fears, he nevertheless ignored his own pain in a profound effort to comfort her. Mara clung to him in a mounting tide of hysteria. Her world seemed unhinged, and she could not conceive of a life without the solid presence of the man who had caused her to re-examine every aspect of her beliefs and forced her to see the deficiencies of her culture. Kevin had become more than lover, more than a man she could confide in. He was the taproot of the tree of her resolve. She had to rely upon his strength to change the empire and make it honourable in a new and moral way. Without him, the power, the goals and the shining vision she held for a future now shadowed by her recent vow to Tassayo seemed things devoid of joy. Mara lay in the warmth of Kevin's embrace and listened as the soft, steady beat of his heart blended with the hollow dirge of the winds that rattled the screens. Somehow, against his volatile barbarian nature, Kevin sensed that her turmoil would not support questions. His sensitivity wounded her, robbed her of a perverse excuse to fly into anger and send him away. Mara endured the tender caress of his hands, cupped by the knowledge that this was the last night she could touch him. At last, exhausted, she fell into restless dreams. He lay awake, her head cradled in the hollow of his shoulder. Through all the years he had known her, he had never seen her so distraught. Open in revealing his own passions, it never occurred to him that her love for him might be the hidden cause of her anguish. Dawn came, unwanted as an executioner's arrival. Mara found a grain of courage amid the wreckage of her nerves and ordered Kevin away before the onset of her morning sickness. She spent a miserable interval torn between tears that would not flow from swollen eyes and dry heaves. Her maids worked tirelessly to restore her to a semblance of proper appearance. By the time she was fit to be seen in public, noon had already drawn nigh. Mara emerged from her quarters to find the escort quietly arranged by Sarek already waiting by the door. Unaware of the Empress' proclamation, Kevin waited in his usual place by her litter, his red hair familiarly tousled and a concerned expression on his face. At the sight of his blue eyes on her, Mara all but broke down. Then the stern fibre of her warrior forebears sustained her. Drawing upon all her temple-taught training, she shut off her clamour of emotions and forced herself to step forward, one foot after another, until finally she reached her litter. Of desperate necessity, she chose Sarek to assist her to her seat. Then, in a voice unrecognisable as her own, she said, We must leave. She named no destination. This detail Sarek had already attended to, and Lujan knew what lay ahead. But the anomaly roused Kevin to suspicion. Where are we bound for this day? he asked on a fixed note of sharpness. Mara dared not try speech. Aware that her eyes were flooding, she quickly snapped her curtains closed, and it was Lujan who waved her bearers to rise and her honour guard of soldiers to march out of the townhouse courtyard, as Sarek held his gaze upon the Midkemian with something resembling regret. "'Will somebody please tell me why everyone acts as they were going to a funeral?' Kevin demanded plaintively. He received only Surani blankness for reply, and resorted to a spectacular attempt at banter. His extravagance at any other time would have sorely tried the deportment of her warriors, but today the most devastating of his repartee fell upon deaf ears. No one so much as hinted at a smile, far less indulged in a laugh. Gods, but everyone's as lively as a corpse! Mournful that some of his best jokes had been wasted, Kevin lapsed into silence as the escort crossed the bustle of Kentasani and took a turn toward the less fashionable district by the south-facing riverside. Ahead lay a palisade constructed of wide, thick planks. Kevin stopped dead in the roadway and only their fighter's reflexes prevented the warriors behind from slamming into him. I've seen the likes of this place before, 
he accused in a tone that snapped with reckless insolence. Why are we going to the slave markets, Mara? The Akoma warriors did not wait for any signal. Kevin's reactions were far too unpredictable for such nicety. Firmly, swiftly and in force, they closed around the Midkemian and caught him back by the wrists. Pinioned and startled into rage, Kevin twisted half an instant too late. The warriors grunted at the effort but managed to keep their grip. Traffic in the street was stopped by the commotion and heads turned to stare. Guards! Kevin exploded in a tone of blistering betrayal. You're selling me! The cry all but shattered Mara's heart. She whipped aside the curtains of her litter and looked up into blue eyes that burned with fathomless rage. Words failed her. Why? cried Kevin, with such terrible lack of inflection she felt clubbed. Why should you do this to me? It was Lujan who answered, and roughly, for his own voice threatened to show feeling unseemly for a warrior, far less an officer of his status. She does not part with you willingly, Kevin, but by the Emperor's order. Damn the light of heaven! Kevin exploded. Damn your sod of an emperor to the deepest pit of the seventh hell! Gawkers poked their faces out of windows, and more passers-by stopped to stare. Several farm matrons made a sign against blasphemy, and a sour-faced merchant on the verge expressed thoughts of sending for a priest. Unwilling to be tried by the temples for the mouthings of a miscreant barbarian, a warrior less well acquainted with Kevin reached out a hand to cover his mouth. The barbarian exploded into violence. He wrenched a fist free, knocking two of Mara's guards aside before any others could move. The men were under orders to refrain from drawing blades, but as Lujan joined the heaving knot of struggle that centred around the Midkemian, he prayed no one would forget. Kevin battled as if possessed, and with his great height no one watching from the sidelines could miss that he transgressed sane limits. He was irate enough to forget protocols, and should he succeed in his attempt to snatch a sword from one of the warrior's scabbards, the Emperor himself could not keep him from dying. Lujan glimpsed the fear on Mara's face. Then he dared a fury more focused than any Harold's and dived headlong into the press. The wrestler's move he employed prevailed, and he struck Kevin squarely off balance. Lujan bore him over backward onto the cobbles of the street, while another soldier added his weight to the force commander. Most men would have been stunned by the fall. The Midkemian seemed unfazed. Driven by a rage that dulled physical pain, and goaded by emotions that no line of reason might stay, he tore into Lujan with a ferocity well capable of killing. Narrowly avoiding a knee in the groin, the Akoma force commander grappled a whirlwind of moving flesh. Somehow he managed to rap out orders to his men. Close in! Use your shields and bodies to hide this fracas from public view! A fist grazed his cheek. Feeling the burn of torn skin, Lujan indulged in a rare curse. Damn it, man! Will you stop or must I be forced to hurt you? Kevin snarled an obscenity. If you had a mother, he finished. Aware that the slave he sought to subdue had not hesitated to pitch himself weaponless against armed ranks of enemy warriors, Lujan reacted by reflex. Desperate and moved by care and admiration for Kevin, he employed the honourless, brutal tactics learned in the mountains as a grey warrior. Another criminal might have recognised the moves. Any proper Surani warrior would have been ashamed to employ a fist to an opponent's groin. Felled by a blow that held nothing of fairness and blanched dead white with the pain, Kevin rolled into a moaning knot of limbs on the filthy paving of the street. Sorry, old son, Lujan murmured, his inflection and choice of phrase borrowed intact from Kevin. You will finish your life in freedom and honour, whether you wish to or not. Then, feeling battered inside as well as out, Force Commander Lujan raised himself to his feet. Bind and gag him, 
he said with whiplash curtness to his men. We dare risk no further incident. Then, aching for the mistress who watched all from the shadow of her litter, he forced his face back into a semblance of Surani impassivity and ordered the party forward on its errand. At the gate of the compound, the master of Kentasani's slave guild stepped out of his hut to inquire after the needs of the Lady of the Acoma. Mara choked words past numbed lips. This slave is to be returned to his homeland by order of the light of heaven. A limp weight in the grip of her guardsman, Kevin turned blue eyes toward her. The light in their depths beseeched, but the child in her womb kept her strong. I am sorry, she murmured, heedless that the master of the slave guild stared at her in dumbfounded curiosity. Unable to voice the words, she moved her lips to mouth the phrase, My love. The rest of what she wished to say stuck impossibly in her throat. The slave broker nodded. I was very strong, though a bit past prime. I would think a fair price. Mara held up her hand, silencing the man. No, send him home. If the slave master found this behaviour odd, he said nothing. He was having enough difficulty understanding why the emperor would choose to buy slaves simply to send them away to some alien palace. The edict had created enough confusion, and if this lady chose to be generous, he would not object. My lady, he said, bowing deeply. At last, unable to bear the wild, haunted pain she saw in her loved one's face, Mara whispered, Live a long and noble life, son of Zun. She managed to achieve the impossible and summon the courage to order her warriors onward to take Kevin away to the compound set aside for the Emperor's purchases. The slave master directed the way and dimly Mara heard one of her warriors speak words to the effect that Kevin was to be treated with respect and care once his bonds were removed. The stockade doors swung closed, forever cutting off her view. Lujan remained by her side, his face a stone mask beneath the shadow of his helm. Most atypically, he did not realise that his officer's plumes had been bent and knocked awry during the foray in the street. Mara sank back on her cushions, wrung dry of tears, and too debilitated to lift even a finger to close her curtains. The shadow thrown over her by the great wooden gates seemed utterly frigid. She could not banish the memory of Kevin's eyes in the moment she had ordered their parting. Always, to her grave, it would haunt her that she had sent him away, bound and helpless. Dully, she wondered how long Tassio would spare her after the coming truce came to its inevitable end. How many nights would she lie awake, aching with the now unanswerable question... Would Kevin have left her reasonably or willingly if she had owned the nerve to consult him beforehand? Lady, Lujan's soft voice intruded into a wilderness of pain. The time has come to go home. The warriors had returned unnoticed. Mara returned a limp wave. How, she wondered, with a pain sharp as a knife thrust, was any place in the Empire ever again going to feel like home? The day and the night that followed seemed desolate and without ending. Alternately ravaged by grief and cruel nightmares, Mara tossed on her sleeping mat. Waking, Sleeping and in dreams, she seemed to see Kevin standing at her bedside, a look of naked accusation in his eyes. By now, the barge that carried him would be well on the way downriver. By the time she and Tassayo and the Lords of the High Council resolved their differences with the Emperor, the man she loved above all others would be far beyond reach on the soil of a distant other world. 
stung awake time and again as she reached out and encountered the empty place where he had lain, or jolted bolt upright in terror by the vision of Tasayo of the Minwanabi holding a sacrificial sword over the gutted body of her son, Mara prayed. She begged Lashima for insight that would grant her the miracle she needed to thwart the enemy who cared for power more than peace, and who would see the Natami of her ancestors buried face down forever beyond reach of the sunlight. Hag-ridden and feeling ill, she at last abandoned her pretense of rest. She paced the floor of her chambers until dawn, and then called a meeting of her advisers. The Butana continued to blow, its whipping tireless gusts pried at the shutters and screens as Mara, her force commander, and her acting first adviser sat down in conference in her sitting room. Huskily, as though her throat had been scraped with sand, the Lady of the Akoma opened. I have one day to prepare for the confrontation between the Emperor and Mimonabi. Painfully bright in his confidence, Sarek said, "'What have you planned, mistress?' Mara closed swollen eyes, worn through to her soul. "'I... have no plan. "'Unless you and your cousin have considered something I have not, "'we march into this moment of destiny "'with nothing more than our naked wits. "'I have promised Minwanabi that no one shall ascend to the warlord's throne before him. Then, said Sarek in a tone of patent reason, the only choice must be that no one sits upon the warlord's throne. For a prolonged moment, only the wail of the Bhutana held sway. A maid entered with a tray of chochar and sweet rolls and quietly left. No one seemed interested in refreshment. Mara regarded the faces that all turned toward her with maddening expectancy. Well, how shall we contrive to make a miracle? She said in thinnest exasperation. Showing a bruise and a scabbed cheek from his fisticuffs with Kevin, her force commander said without humour, Mistress! It is for such things that all look to you. Mara stared bleakly back. This time I have run out of inspiration, Lujan. Her force commander shrugged with total impassivity. Then we shall die honourably, killing Minwanabi dogs. A surge of protest moved within Mara. Kevin is... Her voice caught, and a rush of emotion caused a sting of tears beneath her eyelids. Forcing her grief and pain behind rigid control, she ran a damp hand over her face. Kevin was right. We are a murderous race, and we waste ourselves in killing one another. The Bantana howled, shaking the screen and sending chill draughts across the room. Mara repressed a shiver and did not at first notice Sarek's request to speak. When she saw and signalled her acquiescence, he questioned her condemnation with a buried hint of impatience. Mistress, the answer is plain. It does not matter if Minwanabi is not defeated, so long as the Emperor wins, yes? Mara's eyes opened wide. Explain this? Sarek searched for words to express the concept which hovered upon the edge of his mind. If the light of heaven can bolster his position, can find enough support in the High Council for his absolute rule, Mara shot upright, causing her loosely pinned hair to tumble in waves down her back. Ignoring the maid who rushed to remedy the untidiness, the Lady of the Akoma knotted her brows in a frown. Then... He could order Minwanabi. She fought against the reflexive instinct to oppose any break in tradition and embraced the alien concept of absolute rule. Leave me, she said with sudden sharpness to her circle of advisers. I have much to think about. 
As Sarek arose with the others, Mara retained him with a command. Send word to the light of heaven, Sarek. Beg him for an audience. Swear upon whatever honour our name holds that the safety of the Empire depends upon this meeting. The young adviser repressed curiosity. When, mistress? Over the incessant noise of the Butana, Mara called, As soon as he is able! But no later than one hour before noon today! Her voice ceased sounding whipped as her mind weighed options, discarding those that were based on unfounded hope rather than sound possibility. For inspiration had arrived at a moment nearly too late. If Tassayo's ambition is to be thwarted, I will need every minute of time. Chapter 26 Resolution the Emperor listened. In his grand audience hall, a chamber large enough to house twenty companies of warriors, Ichindar, ninety-first in an unbroken line, sat atop his ceremonial throne. The imposing chair was ancient wood, overlaid with gold and topaz, with massive rubies, emeralds and onyx stones faced into the sides and back. It rested on a raised pyramidal dais, with a course of steps upon each side. The floor at the base was inset with a vast sunwheel pattern in warm tones of agate, white opal and more topaz. Upon each side of the huge pyramid, twenty imperial white stood guard upon the chairs. The floor directly before Mara held chairs for high priests and advisers, but only three were present. A scribe, who took notes for distribution to those temple representatives who were absent, the chief priest of Duran, and the High Father Superior of Lashima. Mara had been grateful for the prelate of Lashima's presence, hoping it was a favourable omen, for that man had officiated at her interrupted ordination on the day Kiyoke had arrived to take a seventeen-year-old child home as ruling lady of the Akoma. Stripped of even her honour guard, for warriors were forbidden in formal audience with the Emperor, she voiced the last part of her proposed plan. An imperial scribe, sitting to Mara's right, hurriedly transcribed her words for the archives, as her phrases echoed into the cavernous chamber. With the hall's vast domed skylights, gold and crystal framed windows and polished marble floors, the sound of her voice made her feel physically diminished. At the close of her last phrase, she bowed deeply and stood as protocol dictated, her hands crossed in salute at her breast, behind the low railing beyond which no petitioner might approach. Trembling despite her best efforts, she awaited the light of heaven's reaction. As the minutes passed and the silence became prolonged, she dared not even raise her eyes for fear she might find disapproval on the youthful countenance atop the dais. Much of what you propose rests upon speculation, lady, the Empress said on a note of unquestioned authority. Her eyes still locked upon the elaborately patterned floor, Mara said, Majesty, it is our only hope. What you suggest is unprecedented. That Ichindar considered tradition ahead of his own personal safety suggested much. This slender, solemn-faced young ruler was not greedy for absolute power, neither was he too timid to embrace bold concepts in the light of pending crisis. Admiring the maturity and courage apparent in one so physically slight, Mara said, Much of what you have done, Majesty, is also unprecedented. Ichindar inclined his head the long golden plumes of his headdress swaying as he nodded a stately acquiescence. Enveloped in elaborate layers of robes, he sat with painful formality, his face already marked by the ruler's burdens. Green eyes in dark hollows and cheeks gaunt from sleepless nights marred what should have been a carefree visage. Beneath the jewels and pomp, Mara perceived a spirit beaten down with worry. Young he might be, 
but the light of heaven was aware that he stood upon ground more perilous than quicksand. He held no delusions. His strength stemmed from the incalculable reverence the Surani people held for his office. But although deep-seated, such sentiment was far from limitless. Although uncommon among Ichindar's ninety predecessors, regicide was not unheard of. The emperor's death was considered proof unto itself that the gods had already withdrawn their blessing from the empire. Circumstances must already be disastrous for any but the most ambitious of lords to attempt such a deed. Yet Mara knew Tasayo harboured just such ambition. And there were those this day who considered abolishment of the warlord's office a dire enough offence against tradition to justify such an act. Aware of the perils she invited by encouraging a course that departed further from the familiar, Mara raised her eyes to the enthroned figure on the dais. Majesty, I offer only hope. I can stem Minwanabi's ambition alone, but only at great cost. Tasayo would have to be granted the warlord's title. A peaceful succession to the white and gold might send these armies outside Kentasani home in peace. I submit to you this is an easy choice. Take it and you may retire from the great game. Return to the High Council its license to act and retire to your divine contemplations. But all personal feuds and differences aside, I submit that this course would only buy time. A Minwanabi on the warlord's throne would lead to a future of strife. I believe the chance exists here and now for permanent change, an end, perhaps, to the needless bloodshed that riddles our concept of politics. I believe that honour need not be rooted in killing for supremacy. Our moment to instil a more compassionate governance may never come again in our lifetimes. Humbly, I implore you, think what that could mean. The Emperor's green eyes regarded her piercingly, even from his place high upon his dais. When he did not offer opinion, the priest of Duran the Just arose from his seat. A flick of one thin hand from the enthroned figure allowed him permission to speak. Mara of the Akuma. Does it occur to you that your words might not be pleasing to heaven? Yours is an old and esteemed name, and yet you appear to have laid aside your family honour. You pledge one thing to Tasayo of the Minwanabi, but even now you seek to forswear a most sacred vow. Mara knew a terrible invasive shadow of fear. The perils of inciting accusation of heresy were not far from her mind, so she directed her reply solely to the light of heaven. If I have laid aside the blessing of my ancestors, I say this is my own affair. I have transgressed no laws nor offended heaven. In all that I have done, through all that I implore you to consider... I act for the good of the Empire. She shifted her regard to the priest as she added, Even if I should dishonour my family's name, this I would willingly do to serve the Empire. A stillness greeted this statement, and then a stir of murmurs from the handful of advisers and priests. The representative from Duran's temple sat down with a look distinctly shaken. The light of heaven turned wide, intelligent eyes upon the lady who stood in erect defiance at the foot of his throne. After an interval of unhurried thought, he gestured to his priests. Let none present impute disgrace to the lady. She does no shame to her house and name, but honours the empire with her courage and service. For who else among our thousands of ruling lords has dared to approach us with this truth? He paused, reached up with his own finely drawn hands, and removed his ceremonial headdress. 
A servant rushed in from the sidelines, knelt and relieved him of its burden. With the high, feathered crown gone from his head, Ichindar seemed to shed his formality. He ran a hand through tousled brown hair and turned reflective. When I first embarked upon my course within the great game, it was because I saw my uncle Almecho manipulate the empire for the sole purpose of keeping himself in power as warlord. The results brought suffering to many. His ambition was a threat to the nation and myself, he added ruefully. In working with Lord Kamatsu and others to end the bloodshed, I came to question the manner in which we live our lives. And I believe I understand something of the necessity that moves you. Ichinda stood. He waved away the guards who would close at his shoulders and descended the steps from his dais. Let me share something with you, Mara of the Akoma, something only a handful of men know. The Empress Manor was sure, but behind the mask of a ruler born, Mara saw a boy who was still vulnerably young and as human as she under the enveloping weight of his state finery. He crossed the floor in measured steps. The priests watched, the one from Duran's temple wrapped as a carrion bird, and the High Father Superior of Lashima's order faintly smiling as the light of heaven reached across the rail and took her hand from its position of salute. Since such unexpected familiarity appeared to disconcert Lady Mara, he looked directly into her eyes. Originally... I tried to force peace upon the nations, for I saw great danger to us as a people if conquest were our only goal. But after Milimba returned, my reasons changed. You may have heard rumours of a great conflict upon the world of Midkemia. I confide to you now that the foe confronted there was the being our legend's name, the Enemy. Mindful of a past discussion with Arakasi, Mara was unsurprised to hear this confirmed. She had reread the ancient tales of some unknown horror called the Enemy, which had destroyed her ancestors' homeworld, sending them across a mystic golden bridge into refuge on Kelowan. Although most of her peers had no cause to believe the old tales were anything other than myth, her quiet, earnest manner held no hint of scorn or disbelief. This was not lost on the Emperor. Warming still more, Ichindar said, Their menace from before the dawn of our history existed, and was more terrible in fact than in story. The assembly of magicians stood with me in my desire that should such an evil conquer our former enemies in the kingdom and turn their wrath upon us, we as a nation must stand united to face them. For this I suspended the High Council, that the machinations of the great game not be allowed to weaken us against such awesome threat. At my command... Ten great ones and three thousand soldiers of the Kanazawai clan, led by Hokanu of the Shinzawai. Hokanu has been upon the other world? Mara blurted. Then, realising her rudeness before the Emperor, she added, I beg my sovereign's forgiveness. Ichindar smiled. You uh, hold the young man in some regard, I see. Yes, Hokanu spent some weeks at war on Mikemia, and more time with his brother Kasumi, the Empress smiled. We do not understand our former enemies in the kingdom. Kasumi's bravery in serving his new master in the conflict won him appointment to a lordship among the nobles of the kingdom. I am unfamiliar with their titles, but the one granted Kasumi is no mean thing, I am told. The great freedom that Kevin had recalled with such fondness was true then. Mara blinked back sudden tears, this certain proof setting final seal upon her changed beliefs. 
Forever after, she could not live comfortably with her own people's rigid concept of caste. Men and women were only human beings. Gods did not appoint them slaves or nobles or craftsmen with irrevocable finality. That in her culture a son might be born and live in exemplary honour and yet never be awarded the rank deserving of his deeds was injustice and waste of the first order. It is to our shame, she murmured unthinkingly loud, that a captive might gain freedom and begin a noble house that might some day rise to greatness among his former enemies, those we call barbarians. And yet... Many equally worthy sons taken prisoner into our empire could become no more than slaves. I fear we are the barbarians and not the Midkemians. Taken aback by this concept, which previously had only been aired with Kamatsu of the Shinzawai, the emperor of Suarunuani regarded the woman across the rail. So I thought... Also, perhaps you will appreciate the fine point that all slaves returned across the rift will be free men on their home soil. Their king Liam swore such to me, and though the first peacemaking was a disastrous mishap, I now know him for an honourable ruler. Torn by memories of Kevin, Mara could only nod. I am. Loath to relinquish control of the empire back to the High Council. Ichindar resumed, returned to the subject that had brought her. He lowered his voice so the priests and the scribe would not hear. I also have come to understand that the chance arises to begin afresh. He released Mara's hand with a half-smile of chagrin that oddly reminded her of Hapara. Then... Gesturing for his servant to return his formal headdress to his brow, he swept back up the stair to his lofty throne. Once again seated in state, he framed his official answer. Whatever will occur on the morrow, the empire will be forever changed. The magicians have held counsel on this issue, but they are reluctant to intervene further in politics since the risk of the enemy is past. Many of my allies against that threat have withdrawn, he indicated the empty chairs upon the pyramid steps, some as a result of my condemnation of Aksantuka. Ichinda studied Mara a long and final time. I think your plan has merit, but the risks you court are equal to, if not greater than, others you wish to avoid. The point did not have to be stated that more than lords might fall if Mara's proposal went awry. The empire itself might be plunged into bloody ruin. I shall send word in the morning of my decision, Ichindar allowed. Tasayo has already requested a meeting with all ruling lords in attendance. It's just this side of a demand I appear before the High Council to answer charges, I think. Now seeming only a boy wearing a costly weight of jewels, sparkling metals and silk, Ichinda sighed. I expect I have no choice. I shall confront Tasayo. He ended the audience with a tired smile. Whatever befalls, Lady Mara, you have my regard. Await my word tomorrow, and may the gods protect you and the name of your ancestors. Mara bowed low, feeling admiration for this young man, trained since childhood to revere tradition, and yet gifted with imagination and intelligence enough to see beyond false glory to the higher good of his people. Aware that he was special and that his office might never be blessed with another of such unbiased perceptions, Mara left the great hall. In the imperial anteroom, her own party awaited, including Sarik and Lujan and Arakasi as attending servant, along with a picked honour guard of warriors. As one of Ichindar's ministers escorted the Akoma contingent out of the imperial quarters, 
Mara remained deep in thought. Outside, as she was helped by Arakasi into her litter, she said, Home, quickly. We have much to do and dangerously little time. Mara held council throughout the night. Lords of many parties and clans made their way to her townhouse to seek her wisdom. Two hours before dawn, the lady gathered an escort and departed in her litter to appear before the one ruler who had failed to call. To the sleepy guard who answered Lujan's knock upon that man's townhouse gate, she demanded, Tell Lord Iliando that Mara of the Acoma waits without for his welcome. The disgruntled Lord of the Bonchura arrived a short time later, his hair still in spikes from his pillow and his robe mismatched with his slippers. Through an expression still surly from being wakened, he spoke the words to welcome Lady Mara into his home. When she was comfortably installed in his sitting room and servants were called from their beds to attend to the courtesy of refreshments and chochar, he spoke bluntly. Mara, why do you arrive unbidden at this hour of the night? Mara signalled for Lujan and her honour guard to withdraw. I come to ask for your help. Iliando held up a hand. You have my sympathy in your time of difficulty. But as for opposing Tassayo... Mara snapped erect. What? Had the Lord of the Bonchura spies among the Minwanabi retinue, or had one of Incomo's staff been too free with his tongue? None but her inner circle should have known the contents of her discussion with her enemy on the hill. Come, girl. Your meeting with Tassayo atop the hill with two armies at your backs could hardly be kept secret. Could it? Mara's expression showed that she had hoped it could. I will save you time. I have already given my support to Jero of the Anasati, the Lord of the Bonchura confessed. A slave arrived with the Chochar tray and unobtrusively began to fill cups. While the older Lord blew on his cup to cool the scalding drink, Mara's eyes narrowed. Jero! What is he seeking in this? You'll have to ask him. The Lord of the Bonchura unwisely tried a sip, burned his tongue, and set down his cup in distaste. Mind the chocha, he warned unnecessarily. Out of patience, but tactful enough to keep still, Mara waited for the elderly Lord to qualify his statement. Jiro has sent word to all members of Clan Yonani, making plain his beliefs that he considers his house in better standing than that of Lord Tonmagu. So he bids to be war chief, Mara surmised. Suddenly she needed the Chocha as an excuse to busy her hands. Nerves and tension and the uneasy adjustments her body was making to pregnancy were all exacting a toll. If Frasai of the Tonmagu fears to confront Jiro, we'll have a major shift in the ranks of the great families. It may be overdue, the Lord of the Bonchira surmised. He did not need to belabor the fact that Frasai detested conflicts. Stunned, Mara absorbed the implications of this unexpected twist. Sadly, she realized that Nikoya and Kevin had been right. After long years of brooding, Jiro was still angered that she had chosen his brother over him as her husband. Jiro apparently had discerned the only course left open to her and had taken steps to ensure that she would fail. For if she lacked the support of Clan Yonani in a coalition to block the Minwanabi majority, her years of garnering influence and debts of vote all amounted to nothing. The Anasati heir could refuse to support Minwanabi and Akoma both, deadlocking the High Council. Her prediction to Tasayo about encroaching imperial rule by slow default would come true. But Mara would gain little satisfaction, for a sworn enemy would then turn his full attention to the obliteration of her house in the instant that Ampas became obvious. Clearly, the Lady of the Akoma would not live long enough to see her prophecy come true. Her hands instinctively touched her middle, as though to shelter the seed of Kevin's child. Boy or girl, the babe might never know birth. 
and if Jiro was patient and clever enough to survive as the conflict raged on, he could emerge as the logical compromise candidate for the office of warlord. Deep in thought as she sorted implications, Mara lost herself in the tangled turns of the great game. Lady, are you ill? Lord Leando's question snapped her from contemplation. No, I am only... tired. She waved away her host's concern and said, You are in my debt. The man inclined his head, acknowledging this was true. Regret coloured his tone. I may not compromise my honour, Mara. You hold but my single vote in council, and only under circumstances that cause me no family or clan dishonour. Those were our conditions. I would demand no such breach of integrity, Mara assured him. Instead, I request that you marshal Clan Ionani's support. If you can convince your kinsmen to support the Ionani war chief against House Minwanabi, you will have satisfied your debt to me as well as your clan's honour. Iriando shrugged. Even those who will back Tasayo in the end will go through the motions of supporting Lord Tonmagu's bid through one round of voting, Mara. It is expected. Don't confuse my request with a pro forma show of respect for Frasai. Mara interjected. Beyond the screen, the first grey pallor of dawn had begun to drive back the night. She was rapidly running out of time, and that realisation vastly shortened her patience. I require as many vows as possible against the chance that conflicts might arise between Tasayo and your war chief. In that event, I depend upon the assurance that Clan Ionani will stand resolute until I clearly show you it is no longer useful. "'particularly since Jiro of the Anasati "'may replace Lord Tonmagu as war chief by this time tomorrow. "'Lord Iliando sighed deeply. "'You ask a difficult bargain. "'I will see what I can do starting with Lord Kudabi. "'He is influential, and his cousin Lord Jadi was ruined by Tasayo's uncle, "'so his house bears no love for the Minwanabi. "'Good.' Mara set aside her half-empty chocha cup and arose. I will see the Lord of the Tomagu myself. As her host saw her through to his outer door, she concluded, This is more than a matter of feud between myself and Tasayo, my Lord Iliando. The Empire has been plunged into change, and it is up to you and me and others like us to decide whether the result is good or ill. Remember this. No matter what else you may think, I serve the Empire. Once she was outside, Mara's need for haste took over. She gave rapid instructions to Lujan, climbed into her litter and endured a jostling ride as her bearers trotted through the city. The streets at that hour were deserted but for vegetable sellers driving laden nidra wagons and priests chanting daybreak devotions. Too fraught with nerves to feel sleepy, Mara closed stinging eyes until she arrived at her destination, an unobtrusive but beautifully appointed villa in the old city with guards in blue armour at the gates. Even as her bearers bent to set down her litter, Mara pulled aside the curtain and called, Mara of the Akoma! The officer on duty approached and offered a salute. My lady, what service? Announce to your lord that I wish to see him at once. The plumed officer returned a bow of impeccable politeness and strode inside the gates. Despite the early hour, Kamatsu of the Shinzawai was not in bed. Already finished with breakfast, he sent word that Mara be escorted inside to the comfortable study of his garden. In a secluded chamber surrounded by flowers and greenery, Mara found the Lord of the Shinzawai in conference with another figure in the black robe of a magician. Caught off guard, Mara hesitated, then bowed low. Great one, I crave pardon for my intrusion. The cowled figure turned. Mara recognised Fumita as enigmatic dark eyes swept across her. You do not interrupt, Mara of the Akoma. You merely find two old men reminiscing. His statement was kindly meant, 
but even the casual scrutiny of a member of the Assembly was disquieting in Mara's state of barely contained agitation. I would return later, she apologised, but time is limited and I have need to speak with Lord Kamatsu. The war chief of Clan Kanazawai waved the lady toward a sumptuous pile of cushions. Have you eaten, Lady Mara? If not, my servants might bring you refreshment. Mara accepted the seat gratefully, but the thought of any food caused her stomach to feel queasy. A little tesh will be sufficient for my needs. As one of the Shinzawai servants departed unobtrusively for the kitchen, she glanced around the room. Where is Hokanu? The elder lord of the Shinzawai smiled in a warmth of indulgence. He will be distressed to learn that he missed your visit, Lady Mara. But as acting force commander of the house and sub-commander to Lord Kedda, he is needed in the hills with the army. Sadness touched his expression as he added, Like every clan in the empire, the Kanazawai make ready for war. Then, presuming she called to learn what had become of her contract of marriage proposal, Kamatsu sighed. As if a weight bore down upon his shoulders, he gestured to his visitor in appeal. Mara, in other, calmer times, nothing would please me better than to bind my house to one as honoured as the Akoma. His honesty was genuine as he qualified, nor could I wish for a daughter-in-law more resourceful than you. But, although my first son was not lost, as we first supposed, he will not be returning to rule after me. He has been granted his own title to lands by the King of Isles. As his father, I honour his choice to remain in the land of Midkemia. Hokanu remains my heir. Aware that the older man paused to search for words, Mara tried to relieve him of his discomfort. It was not for the marriage contract that I came here. Please do not feel obligated to deliver your answer to me in times when other difficulties surround us. Kamatsu returned a warming smile. Your thoughtfulness is appreciated, Lady Mara. I have always understood Hokano's reasons for favouring you. In fact, if the choice were simply personal, he would have had me send acceptance on the day your writ arrived. The delay in answering your request was mine alone, since the future of our land is precarious. I'm not certain any of us will be in a position to enjoy weddings after tomorrow. So he also had heard about Tasayo's call to confront the Emperor. Forgetful of the presence of the Great One who sat motionless as shadow in the corner, Mara regarded the man who was among the most honoured rulers in the Empire. His age lay lightly upon him. The silver hair at his temples made him look distinguished rather than old, and his eyes were kindly with laugh lines. Where Hokanu's intelligence held an intensity like fire, the father had weathered with years to a quiet, confident wisdom. Intuitively, Mara sensed that this was a ruler to whom she could speak her true mind. "'Hear me out,' she said earnestly. "'For what I say is intended for the good of the Empire.' With that formal beginning, she outlined a plan she had been contriving to set into play since sundown the day before. Before the entrance to what had been the High Council section of the palace, Tasayo and his black and orange-clad honour guard were halted by a contingent of a dozen Imperial Whites. In full ceremonial regalia and commanded by a strike leader whose golden plumes spread like a fan over his polished helm, they stood in neat ranks across the entrance, barring the way. Before Tasayo could speak, the Imperial strike leader held up his hand. My lord of the Minwanabi, you are commanded to present yourself to the light of heaven, who awaits your presence within the chamber formerly employed by the High Council. The officer motioned, and his warriors stepped smartly aside, allowing Tasayo clear passage. Resplendent in his finest suit of armour, and carrying his heirloom family sword in the scabbard at his black lacquered belt, Tasayo ordered his retinue forward. 
As they traversed the lofty halls of the council complex, he gave his first adviser a dry, satisfied smile. Ichindan knows enough to keep the illusion of command, even if the reality of his authority is in question. Inkomo gave no reply. Hot in his ceremonial clothing and too breathless from brisk walking for even a pretense of dignity, he barely maintained the correct distance behind his master as he attempted to ascertain what might go wrong during the coming confrontation. As they reached the entry to the council hall, Inkoma was caught by surprise as Tasayo stopped suddenly on the threshold of the main portal. The elderly adviser barely avoided a collision. Yanked from his preoccupation over possible disasters, Incomo peered over his master's shoulder to see what caused the delay. The chamber was filled with ruling lords, not unexpectedly, since the lowest ranks took their seats first, and, as the current most powerful family in the Empire, Tasayo was privileged to assume his place last. That this was no ordinary council stood confirmed by the fact that even the highest tiers of galleries were packed. The least significant lords in the Empire had seen fit to attend this gathering, surest indicator of a time of crisis. Incomo squinted near-sighted eyes to better make out the central dais. In the dazzle of sunlight from the dome, he made out a figure in shining white overrobes and armour of precious polished gold. Ichindar, ninety-one times emperor, stood at the top of the central dais. Through the flash of jewels and metal, Incomo took a moment to notice what had changed. When he did, the reason behind Tasayo's precipitous stop became plain. The ivory and gold throne that had seated generations of previous warlords was no longer in place upon the dais. Curse the name of her ancestors! Tasayo hissed under his breath. After the absence of the gold and white throne, he had spotted Mara, clad in shimmering green silk, and standing below the dais at the feet of the light of heaven. My lord Tasayo, addressed Ichindar in the awkward interval while Tasayo was still not recovered from surprise. The lord of the Minwanabi had plainly intended to enter the chamber and, before the entire High Council and the Emperor himself, presumed to mount the dais and take the warlord's seat. Mara had arranged to have the chair removed to rob him of such theatrics. As all eyes turned, catching the Minwanabi lord in his moment of furious embarrassment, the light of heaven continued. You sought my attendance at a meeting with the lords of the Empire. I have come. Tasayo recovered his poise with a reflex as swift as a sword stroke. As if he intended to speak all along from his position in the central doorway, he looked loftily over the hall. "'Your Majesty! My lords!' he glanced at Mara. "'Lady!' Entering the chamber to a hushed audience, he slowly descended the stairs. "'We come to demand an end to this interruption of the traditional course of governance in the Empire.' Without pause to make a bow, he said, "'Majesty!' I say it is time for the High Council to reconvene for the appointment of a new warlord. Quiet for only a moment, as Tasayo reached the wide concourse above the lowest floor, the glittering figure on the dais inclined his head. I agree. Taken aback a second time in moments, Tasayo stopped. He realised that to descend the stairs further would put him below the Emperor. So he remained where he was, looking at Ichindar at eye level. Yet he hesitated. Of all the answers he had anticipated, this was the last he expected to hear. You agree, Majesty? Ichindar raised his jewelled rod of office. Before this day is ended, we must arrive at a clear consensus. The High Council must ratify my decisions of the last year or the old order must be re-established. He glanced down at Mara. I am in debt to the Lady of Akoma for lending me understanding. I now perceive that a single dictate is not the way to gain support for the changes necessary to ensure our future. If our empire is to survive, the time has arrived for us all 
to rethink our needs. Other worlds and cultures are now open to us through the rift gates. In our first experience, we have learned to our sorrow that the old ways of conquest and war are poor coin to treat with the peoples of other realms. Not only have our former enemies shown themselves to be honorable men, continued the emperor, they have generously kept us apprised of their struggles against the ancient horror known in our history as the enemy. A buzz of talk greeted this, yet Ichindar raised his voice above it. To deal with the Midkarians and others who may come after them, we need to change our ways. Tassio cried out in heartfelt appeal to the council lords. To deal with foreign powers, we must be strong. We suffered shame because Almeto lacked the courage to forge a million swords into one weapon wielded by a single strong hand. Looking in scorn upon the young emperor in his many layers of finery, then down at the diminutive lady at his feet, the lord of the Minwanabi gestured in outright scorn. It is time. Mara returned his hard look without flinching. Before all, she said, I gave my vow that I would see no other upon the throne of white and gold before you, Tasayo. Behold, the ivory and gold seat has been removed. By this you will see that I keep my sworn word of honour. No one shall sit upon that throne before you, Tasayo. A murmur swept the packed galleries, and Tasayo's lips twisted with rage. Yet, before he could manage rejoinder, a voice near the front ranks called out, I will let my choice be known. All eyes turned to observe as Jiro of the Anasati arose from his seat and crossed to a point midway between the emperor on the dais and the figure in orange armour on the stair. After a moment of dramatic confrontation, he moved to stand beside the Lord of the Minwanabi. From there, he directed a triumphant sneer at Mara. Lady, this settles an old debt between us. Perhaps my brother's shade will find rest in the knowledge his murderer has been punished. Mara suddenly felt every hour of missed sleep and the ache of every dashed hope. The error she had made was now past all chance of remedy. Again, she had underestimated Jiro's thirst for revenge and placed too much stock in his ambition. Still, like her father, she faced defeat with a fighting spirit. You think to support Tasayo now? she called with a derision that carried to the uppermost tier of the galleries. Is it your intent to catch him weakened after he spends himself destroying me? The conjecture was preposterous, given the current Minwanabi ascendance. Jiro simply smiled and looked at Tasayo. I stand with the new warlord, for order must be restored to the Empire. The words touched off a wave of motion as a score of lords joined Jiro's bid to re-establish the old ways. They rose in a rustle of robes to array themselves behind Tasayo until the stairway where he stood became packed and then overflowed into the adjacent ranks of seats. Some lords were trapped in the press and no small number lost the spirit to fight against the prevailing surge to win free of the crowd. Their numbers added to those of the truly dedicated, forming a formidable wedge of support behind the Minwanabi lord. Yet Mara persisted, against reason. My lord Zacatecas? Hopara of the Zacatecas stood and crossed to stand with her beneath the emperor. A score of loyal clan Zakala nobles joined him, their features grimly determined. Lord Iliando of the Bonchura came to Mara's side, then members of the clan Kanazawai entered the field ringing the central dais. Still, these gains were rendered impotent at a stroke, as most of the clan Ianani moved to stand with Tasayo. The few members of the Emetian who had attended divided evenly. When all the lords in attendance had taken sides, the majority backed Tasayo. Lounging at ease against a railing, his expression suavely assured, he turned languid eyes to his enemy. Well, Mara, is this the best you can do? 
less showy, but every bit as commanding in presence, Mara squared her shoulders. Lord Jiddu of the Tuscalora, you have sworn allegiance to me. The recalcitrant vassal, who had thought to hide himself to the rear of the Minwanabi faction, shamefacedly removed himself from the stair. Compelled to apologise profusely as he squeezed his corpulent body through the press, he arrived at Mara's camp red-faced and sweating with embarrassment. Mara paid his discomfort no heed. Lord Randala, she cried, you have sworn me a vote in council. I now call that debt. A major lord in Clan Zakala and a potential rival to the young lord of the Zacatecas for the office of war chief, the sandy-haired ruler of the Zosai removed himself from Tasayo's side of the hall. Two other Zakala lords abandoned other allies and followed. After them came another man from the upper galleries, armoured in scarlet and brown. Let all know that Tasayo of the Minwanabi used the honourable name of the Hankar in an attempt to ruin the Akoma. I take offence at such presumption and cast my lot with the lady. Accorded unexpected satisfaction from the disastrous past ambush in the glen, Mara advanced onto the lowest stair of the dais. To all present she announced, Never again will a noble of the empire wear the office of warlord. As a stir threatened to drown out her words, she looked pointedly to five others who stood with her family's blood enemy. My lords, all of you have committed one vote of my choosing. I call in the debt at this time. Reluctantly, the rulers in question vacated their chosen position. As they and a trickle of their vassals and allies swelled the crowd gathered behind Mara, others reacted to the shift of power in the room. More and more supporters left Tasayo's ranks and added to the throng around Mara. Tasayo's features twitched with irritation. In tight tones he said, You have your stalemate, Mara, and I concede the cleverness that allows you to keep your vow to the letter without embracing its gist. You have gained a few days at most, so why not end this pretense? I do not play the great game this day for personal gain or glory, Mara interrupted. For the good of the Empire, I call on my lord of the Tonmagu. From the rear of the hall, the second most powerful claimant to the warlord's office entered amid an honour guard of twenty. Erect despite his advanced age, he made careful progress down the stairs, past Tasayo, and came to stand beside Mara. If his body seemed wasted with years, his voice was still powerfully resonant. By the honoured blood of my ancestors, hear my pledge. I act for the good of the Empire. So saying, he mounted the dais and bowed before the dazzling figure of the Emperor. Majesty, he intoned, in the best interests of all my people, I surrender my authority to your care. He raised the staff that was his badge of office as war chief of Clan Ionani and handed it up to Ichindar. Jiro started forward in rage. You can't do this! Lord Frassai of the Tom Margu turned up his silvered head in the direction of the young man who had inherited the mantle that had formerly been Takuma's. Sadly, he said, Son of my kinsman, you are mistaken. Ichinda is of our own blood. Dare you claim that any stands above him in our clan? Red-faced with fury, Jiro looked ready to argue, but a swelling roll of sound drowned his voice as excited talk broke out. Amid the commotion, two more entered the hall, Lord Kamatsu of the Shinzawai, wearing the armour of his ancestors and carrying the staff of Kanazawai, and, beside him, Lord Kedda, his predecessor, and another from a line with recognised claim to the warlord's office. Kamatsu reached Ichindar's dais and bowed. We speak as one, and act for the good of the Empire. With grand dignity for all his lack of ceremony, 
he surrendered his staff of office as war chief of the Kanazawa into the hands of the gold-armoured figure on the dais. Over a cresting murmur of surprise, Tasayo shouted, This is a violation of tradition, Kamatsu! The lord of the Shinzawai called this accusation down in rebuke. My family is as noble as any in the empire. We can trace our line back to the 24th emperor and are related by blood to the light of heaven. Tradition says that anyone of clan lineage may hold the office of war chief. He ended on a note of ringing challenge. Dare you deny the blood claim of Ichinda? Mara said, Tasayo, you may be a brilliant commander in war, but your grasp of history is deficient. Has it never occurred to you why only five families have traditionally been allowed to claim the office of warlord, first noble of the empire after the light of heaven? At a loss, Tasayo returned a Surani shrug. Those first five houses, including your own, are the most directly related to the Empire's founders. Mara regarded her sworn enemy with contempt. If you had asked, any master of law or the keeper of the Imperial Archives could tell you. The original High Council was begun by five brothers, all of them siblings of the first Emperor. With a sweep of her hand, Mara concluded, We all stem from the same origins, Tasayo. Trace back far enough, and one way or another, all the major families in the great clans are related. Lord Zakatekas spoke from Mara's side. I act for the good of the Empire. He joined his two predecessors on the dais stair and handed up his staff of Zakala war chief to the emperor. Gold armour flashed as Ichindar held up his hands and all present took note that he held not three staves but four. Into the rising uproar the light of heaven called out, I received the staff of the Omechan clan this morning, Tasayo. Take note and beware. In my province are four claims to the throne of white and gold. Jiro of the Anasati turned a look of naked anger upon Mara before he bowed to necessity. Tasayo, fate has decreed this. I am sorry. So saying, the second most bitter enemy of the Akoma abandoned his position at the Lord of the Minwanabi's side. His desertion precipitated the withdrawal of the remaining Inani nobles, leaving Tasayo alone with a handful of vassals and cowed followers. One of these abruptly turned away. As he stepped down the stair toward the gathering around the dais, Tasayo gave way to rage. Bruli of the Kautara! You disgrace the memory of your father! He gave a generation of honourable service to the Minwanabi, and in your cowardice, his steadfastness is shamed. Handsome as few men could be in cumbersome formal trappings, Bruley spun lightly on his heel. Shamed, you say? That is an insult from one whose family once sought to use me as an instrument to destroy the Lady Mara. Neither you nor Desio condescended to treat me, your vaunted vassal, as generously as this lady at the time she defeated me. Bruley spat in contempt toward the stair where Tasayo stood. I am done with the Minwanabi. I will see the lands of your ancestors sown with salt and your Natami shattered, screamed Tasayo in a surfeit of rage. The threat left Lord Bruley unfazed. He moved off without a look back until he reached the floor beside Mara. There, in public, he bowed. Some may say you have deserted family honour this day, Lady Mara. Then he smiled. I think not. Despite our past differences, I believe in my heart that you truly do serve the Empire, Lady. May peace hold between us from this day forward. Mara smiled in return. Before the High Council, I acknowledge friendship between the Kehotara and the Akoma. 
Tassayo's eyes blazed with frustration. You may have played into Ichinda's hands, Mara, but this is not the end. I have given my word that you may return safely to your home, but the moment my scouts bring news that you have set foot upon a coma soil, then shall I unleash the might of the Minwanabi upon you. More! He spun in command upon those still behind him and cried, I call upon Clan Honor! The Akoma have disgraced the Empire and Clan Shonshoni. Let war come to Clan Hadama! Ichinda said, I forbid this! Tasayo's smile twisted with overweening malice. I have fifty thousand soldiers ready to march at my command. Although the bearing of blades was deplored within the great hall, he flouted custom and drew his sword for emphasis. The rare metal blade caught the light like fire while an uproar swept across the hall. Over the clamour, in his commander's shout, Tasayo cried, If you seek to make an end to this Ichindar, let us do so on the field of war. Will your supporters stand with you then? demanded Tasayo, his face flushed in challenge. Mara felt a chill pierce her being. Before her stood a madman who would see his civilization reduced to ashes rather than suffer a rival to claim victory. Numbed by the sight of her worst nightmare made real and stabbed through by recognition that her hope had been ground down by the caprice of the gods, she closed her eyes to hide her anguish. Because of her pride and her ill-founded attempt to wrest the course of the future into a new mould, more than the Akoma would fall. With her, she dragged down the best among the mighty, and in that most terrible recognition came the personal grief that Ayaki would die before manhood, and Kevin's unborn child might never know the chance to draw breath. Mara felt withered by responsibility. For in cold truth, this impasse had happened because of her. Her acts had brought her nation to civil war. Numbly, she heard Ichindar murmur words of apologetic consternation. Too devastated to speak, she turned to bow to his better grace. Seeing the young man standing without sign of fear, Mara forced herself to speak. The Akoma are yours to command, my emperor. At once, many lords pledged support or made a display of putting distance between themselves and their neighbours. Bloody chaos was too close at hand not to make it clear where one stood. Those who wished no part in the coming clash sought to escape being swept along. That instant, a voice from the edge of the chamber rang out in absolute command. There shall be no conflict! The uproar died. Mara snapped her eyes open to find silence as the nobles surrounding her looked upward in disbelief. Dozens of black-robed figures descended into the hall in a ring through every entrance and side door. Eerily silent and contested by none, the great ones of the assembly advanced down the steps to the lowest floor of the High Council. The whim of the magicians was as law, even above the might of armies. Mindful of the havoc unleashed by just one man trained to the black in the arena, no lord present was fool enough to stand against the will of the assembly. Tasayo stood frozen in abject fury, fully aware that he had lost. The last colour drained from his features as he resheathed his sword in disgrace. Fifty magicians closed in a ring around the lords who surrounded the emperor. Their spokesman gave a formal nod to the lady of the Akoma. With a faint start, Mara recognised Fumita. In a giddy rush of fear, she recalled that he had been present throughout her entire discussion with Kamatsu. At his side were two others she did not know, a short, very stout magician and a thin one with angular features. Confronted by their stern, impassive gazes, unknowingly steeped in power, Mara knew an instant of terror. Surely... They came to take her, to punish her unpardonable boldness. For if Tassayo was greedy with ambition, she was as much at fault for her presumptuous attempt to shatter tradition. Yet the Great One did not speak to berate her. 
Taking a stance between her and the sworn enemy of her family, Fumita addressed the gathering at large. We speak for the assembly. Our council has met and determined that Mara of the Akoma has acted for the good of the empire. She has jeopardized herself in selfless honor to prevent strife, and her life in this moment is sacrosanct. The stout magician took up where Fumita ended. We are divided on many issues, but one thing must be made clear. We shall not permit a civil war. The thin magician spoke at last. Tasayo of the Minwanabi, you are forbidden to conduct any conflict with Mara of the Akoma from this day forward. This is the will of the assembly. Tasayo's eyes widened, as if he had been slapped. His hand tightened again on his sword hilt, and a disturbed light glittered in his eyes. In a hoarse whisper he said, Great one, my family has sworn blood oath to Turakamu. Forbidden, repeated the slender magician. White to the lips, Tasayo bowed. Your will, great one. He unbuckled his sword, an heirloom of steel with an elaborately carved bone handle. Reluctance stiffened every line of his bearing as he descended the stair and surrendered the weapon to Mara. To the victor. His hands shook from closely contained rage. Mara accepted the trophy with hands that openly trembled. It was a close thing. Tasayo loosed a bitter laugh. I think not. You have been touched by the gods, Mara. He glanced around the room. Had you never been born, or had your family not died to make your inheritance possible, I have no doubt that change might have come. But this... He gestured in white rage at the assemblage of lords, magicians and emperor. Nothing so momentously conclusive would ever have come to pass. I think I prefer facing the Red God to seeing the great game of our ancestors reduced to a paltry charade and our lords cast away pride and honour for subservience to the light of heaven. His hard, topaz eyes roved one last time over the council he had dreamed he might rule. Gods pity you all and the empire you surrender into disgrace. Be silent! Fumita snapped. Shimon of the Assembly will conduct you back to your estates, my lord Minwanabi. Wait, I beg you, Mara cried out. Desio vowed to the Red God on the blood of the Minwanabi line. By the terms of his oath, none who claim kinship with Tasayo may survive if the Akoma are not sacrificed. Hard as stone, Fumita faced the Lady of the Akoma. Foolish is the Lord who presumes that the gods take such a particular interest in his enemies. Desio transgressed prudent limits to make such a pledge. The gods do not suffer recanting such vows. His kin must suffer the consequences. But Mara felt as if Kevin stood at her shoulder, and his irrepressibly foreign beliefs left a clamour in her mind that not even the great ones might still. What of Tasayo's innocent wife and two children? she appealed. Should their lives be wasted for honour? Desperate to see her point through, she spun and faced her enemy, only pity in her eyes. Release your children from fealty to the Minwanabi Natami, and I will adopt them into House Akoma. I beg you, spare them their lives. Tasayo looked at her, aware that her concern sprang very near to the heart. Only to deny her, expressly to hurt, he cruelly shook his head. Let their blood be on your conscience, Mara. So saying, he tugged the war chief's staff of Clan Shonshoni from his belt. My lord of the Sejayo, he called to a thick-necked man on the sidelines. This is now your trust. As the staff of office was removed from his hand, he gave one last glance around the halls of power. Then, with a flat look of mockery at Mara and the Emperor, he turned with all his grace and arrogance to the slender magician beside Fumita. I am ready, Great One. 
The magician took a metal device out of his robe, and a faint buzzing sounded through the hall. As he placed his hand upon Tassayo's shoulder, both of them vanished without warning, the only sign of their passing a faint inrush of air into the space that they had occupied. The Lord of the Sajayo regarded the war chief staff he now held, and reluctantly came to stand before the Emperor. Majesty, I do not know if I act for the good of the Empire or not. He glanced at the other lords who clustered unanimously around Mara and Fumita, but it is said that in the great game the gods favour the winners. I surrender to you the office of the war chief of the Shonshoni. Ichindar accepted the last of the five staves of office. Clearly, in words of newly unquestioned authority, he pronounced, The office of warlords is no more. Without further ceremony, he snapped each staff in two halves and cast the fragments on the floor. Then, over the echoes as the broken rods tumbled down the stair of the dais, he called upon Kamatsu of the Shinzawai. Hokanu's father returned a bow of deep courtesy. Majesty, the Empire has need of you, decreed the light of heaven. I appoint you to a new office, Imperial Chancellor. Again Kamatsu bowed. To serve the Empire, Majesty, I will gladly accept. To the assembly of nobles, Ichindar proclaimed, Kamatsu of the Shinzawai is my voice and my ear. He shall hear your requests, your needs and your suggestions as we undertake to reshape our nations. When the new imperial chancellor was dismissed, the light of heaven called another name. Frasai of the Tonmagu. The old soldier made his way forward. Majesty! We shall have need of one to oversee military matters. If Kamatsu is my eyes and ears, will you act as my good arm? To serve the Empire, Lord Frasai returned in his basso voice. Clearly, Ichindar outlined new duties. Frasai of the Tonmagu shall bear the title of Imperial Overlord. He shall conduct the business of the Empire as did the Warlord in days past, but only at my bidding. Then Ichindar inclined his gleaming helm toward a figure nearest to Mara. Further, I instruct Hopara of the Zacatecas to act as his second in command. The youthful Lord grinned at Mara. To serve the Empire, he cried exuberantly. Mara gave him Tasayo's sword. Send this to the desert men to honour your father's vow. Hopara of the Zacatecas received the ancient sword from her hands and bowed respectfully. And then the light of heaven turned his visage to the lady who stood patiently in robes of shimmering green silk. Mara of the Akoma! The woman who had given him a throne and the burdens of absolute power looked up, her eyes unreadably deep and her emotions locked behind impeccable Surani bearing. You have prevented chaos from overtaking the nations, Ichindar stated to those at large, and then his tone turned personal. What reward can we offer? Mara found herself blushing. Majesty... In truth, I wished for nothing beyond the chance to conduct the affairs of my family in peace and prosperity. I fear I have sacrificed too much of my honour to deserve any reward. And yet you set aside those very needs and honour to serve the greater good, Ichindar pointed out. You have reminded us of forgotten truths and true greatness. He paused to sweep the air with one golden-armoured hand. You have recalled to our times a concept neglected for centuries. By your sacrifice, by setting aside family for the good of the nation at large, you have defined the highest of all honours. Is there no reward we might grant? 
Mara considered barely a moment. Majesty, I would ask for title to the estate and lands that belong to the Lord of the Minwanabi. A harsh, uneasy mutter ran the breadth of the hall. Surani tradition dictated that a fallen house was accursed by the gods, to be avoided by commoner and noble alike. Many fine estates were gone to ruin and weeds as a result of the deep-seated conviction that a lord's luck was tied to the soil. The emperor made a gesture of uncertainty. Why such an ill-omened gift, lady? Majesty, she said gravely, we gather today to embrace change. To my mind, it is the greater offence against heaven to allow a dwelling of such magnificence to be abandoned to waste and decay. I hold no fear of ill luck. Allow me, and I shall send to the Red God's temple and seek clear notice that Desio's blood vow stands fulfilled. Then may the priests of Chochokan bless the property, every foot if need be. And on the day when the restless spirits of the Minwanabi are banished in peace, I will make my home there. Struggling to hide tears of relief, Mara continued, Too many good men and women have died, Majesty. Others are slaves, their talents denied, their potential ignored. Poignantly struck by the memory of Kevin, she fought her voice level and continued, I work for a future of change, and for that I ask to be first to break a profitless tradition. To her startling request, Ichindar nodded acquiescence, and, into a stillness grown profound, as each lord present examined his land and his people in a new light, Mara called out in appeal, This waste must end! Now! To all who have stood against me in the past, I make this vow. Come to me with peace in your heart, and I will put an end to old conflicts. She glanced at Jiro of the Anasati, but he returned no flicker of feeling. His face under his red and yellow helm remained unreadably remote. On the dais, the emperor watched the exchange and the wonder in the expressions of many of the nobles who were gathered. He sensed something of Mara's emotions, and yet he understood but a fraction of what motivated this deep and complex woman. Profoundly moved by her vision of a forgiving victory, he said, Lady Mara, lands are insufficient compensation for the gift of enlightened thought you have brought into this council. You have wealth and power, influence and prestige. At this moment, none stands above you in influence and greatness in this hall. He smiled in sudden wry humour. I would offer to make you my tenth wife if I thought you would accept. At Mara's blush of confusion, a wave of gentle laughter filled the hall. Over the general mirth, the emperor raised his final command of the day. You have chosen to serve others ahead of your own self-interest. Therefore, you shall be recognized throughout life and all of history. In past ages, when the empire was yet young, when a citizen came forward to undertake extraordinary service at risk of life and honor, my forebears bestowed on them a title that all in the land might recognize them with highest acclaim. Mara of the Akoma, I give to you the ancient title, Servant of the Empire. Stunned, speechless, Mara clung to the tatters of her bearing. Servant of the Empire. No man or woman in living memory had received such a lofty accolade. Only a score of times in two thousand years had the title been awarded. Those twenty names were recited for luck and memorised by children as they learned the history of their people. The rank also brought formal adoption into the imperial household. Reeling mentally at her unanticipated rise in status, Mara realised that she and Ayaki could choose to retire to the palace and live upon imperial largesse for the remainder of her days. 
You overwhelm me, Majesty, she managed at last. And she bowed to his presence like the humblest of his servants. Then Lord Hapara of the Zacatecas let out a battle cry, and the High Council Hall erupted in cheers. Mara stood at the centre of a circle of admirers, giddy with the recognition that she had won, and more, she had ensured that her family was forever safe from the machinations of House Minwanabi. Chapter 27 Beginnings Hokanu stood motionless. Then, in the wash of golden light that fell through the western window, the son of the Shinzawai rested his hands upon the sill. His back to Mara and his gaze directed outward into the colours of a brilliant sunset, he remained in silent contemplation. Seated upon the cushions in Komatsu's private meeting room, Mara agonised that she could not see to read his face and gauge his reaction to her presence. Her distress was further heightened by anticipation of the difficult words she had yet to utter. She caught herself in Kevin's habit of picking at the fabric's fine fringes and forced back sadness and longing as she stopped. She must live out her days as Lady of the Akoma, even as her beloved must as a free son of Zun. Lady, Hokanu said softly, Things between us have changed since we spoke last. A tinge of awe touched his tone, and his hands tightened against the beautifully inlaid wood of the window frame. I am heir to the Shinzawai lordship, true, but you are servant of the Empire. What life could there be between us with such a vast gap between our ranks? With an effort, Mara shook off her memories of a roguish barbarian slave. We would live as man and woman, as equals, Hokanu. Our families and our names would continue through our progeny, and both our ancestral estates would be managed by factors. Bemused, Hokanu finished for her. We would live in the mansion that once belonged to Minwanapi. Hearing a catch in his voice, Mara said, Do you fear bad luck? Hokanu gave a short laugh. You are all the luck I or any man would ever need, lady. Absently he murmured, Servant of the Empire. Then, in swift recovery of the topic at hand, he added, I have always admired the home of the Minwanabi. With you at my side, I would most certainly find happiness there. Sensing he had reached the point of speaking formal words of acceptance of the marriage proposal his father Kamatsu had given him permission to decide, Mara spoke fast to forestall him. Hokanu, before you say more, there is one thing I must tell you. Her serious tone caused him to turn from the window. She wished he had not. His directness made the task ahead more difficult. Fine, dark eyes caught her in earnest appraisal, and, at their clear depths and the honest admiration in them, Mara felt a twist to the heart. Her words became painful to complete. You should know I am one month with child to another man, a slave I held in highest regard. He is returned forever to his homeland across the rift, and I will not see him again. Only if I marry, I add the insistence that his child be counted as legitimate. Okanu's handsome face showed not a flicker of expression. Kevin, he mused aloud, I know of your barbarian lover. Mara waited, tautly braced for an outburst of male jealousy. Her hands tightened on the cushions until fringes threatened to tear. Her worry and nerves did not pass unnoticed. Hakanu crossed the room and gently pried her grip from the cloth. His touch was light and trembling ever so slightly with emotions he politely did not show. Lady, I would expect that you did not enter into this pregnancy lightly, knowing you as I do. Therefore I can only presume that Kevin was an honourable man. 
her surprise brought a light of joy to his eyes. Suddenly smiling at her, he asked, Did you forget I had spent time on Midkemia? My brother Kasumi made sure I was well educated in their barbaric concept of fairness. His tone made it clear he used the term in jest. I am not a complete stranger to the fibre of the Midkemian people, Lady Mara. Then his smile twisted. I was the one who chose to bring the barbarian Great One Pug to my father, sensing in him something rare. When the name didn't bring a reaction from Mara, he added, the one who came to be known as Milimba of the Assembly. Mara couldn't contain a giddy rush as she saw the ironic humour. As she laughed lightly, he said, In my own meagre way I played some small part in the tremendous events we have known. The Lady of the Akoma looked up into Hokanu's face, and there read a rare understanding. She might not bring the fire of passion to any union with House Shinzawai, but this was a man whom she could honour one with whom she could share her new vision of the future. Together they might shape a greater empire. He crossed to stand before her, then began to kneel. You could care for two boys, not your own, she asked as he knelt before her. Okanu regarded her tenderly. More, I could love them. He smiled at her profound astonishment, Mara, did you forget? I am the foster son of Kamatsu. Though we do not share the blood tie of father to son, he taught me the value of a strong and loving family. Ayaki's merits are apparent. Kevin's child we will shape as his father would have desired. Overwhelmed suddenly by emotion, Mara ducked her head to hide tears. As Hokanu's arms closed in comfort around her, she gave way to a flood of relief. She had hoped for nothing beyond having her child by Kevin accepted. The gift of Hokanu's complete support was more than her wildest expectations, certainly more than her wayward, headstrong decision had deserved. Almost she could hear Nakoya's voice carping that the man who held her was special and deserving of regard. Softly she said, The gods have chosen wisely, Hokanu, for no man born of this world could better understand and respect my needs. I accept your proposal of marriage, lady, servant of the empire. Hokanu murmured formally into her hair. Then he kissed her in a manner different from Kevin's. Mara tried, but her body could not warm to the sudden change immediately. His touch was not unpleasant, simply different. In his uncanny manner, Hokanu seemed to sense that she needed time to become used to him. He drew back, still holding her strongly, and a light of humour touched his eyes. How in the name of the good gods can you know that the child you're carrying is a boy? Mara's last apprehension dissolved in a rush of pleased laughter. Because, she said, for once a woman rather than a ruler, I would have it so. Then, my strong-willed future wife, announced Hokanu, drawing her to her feet, it must be so. We had best go out and inform my foster father that he will need to spare time from the emperor's duties to be attending a wedding. Mara signalled, and the company halted. The priest of Turakamu turned his red-masked face in her direction in unspoken formal inquiry. He stood in full-dress attire, which meant more paint than clothing. His nude flesh was stained red, and a feather-and-bone cape over his shoulders mantled his necklace of baby skulls. Yet he came in regalia only, without any acolytes in attendance to conduct ceremony his purpose to oversee the relocation of the prayer gate off Minwanabi property. Mara arose from her litter to treat with him. My lady, he greeted formally, your generous offerings to the temple have been looked upon with favour. Mara indicated a bonfire some distance up the road where several large timbers lay burning. What is that? 
Desio's ill omened gate that was never finished. The temple has decreed, by their fall from power, the Minuenabi have demonstrated beyond doubt that their cause found no favor with the Red God. Therefore, the gate is neither consecrated nor blessed, and may be destroyed without fear of divine retribution. He indicated a pair of large Nidra wagons drawn off to one side, awaiting the dismantled timbers of a second gate. This structure will be sent to the site you provided. That soil will be reconsecrated. From behind the grim skull mask, the priest sounded almost conversational. It was something of an odd request, this relocation of a prayer gate, Mara, but upon discussion no blasphemy or sacrilege was seen. Given the association of this gate and the vow that was made, it was understandable why you might wish to have it removed once you hold this land. The priest gave a Surani shrug. Now that the High Council is an advisory body only, the temples may again take a more active role in the well-being of the Empire. Your part counted for much, and the servants of the gods are grateful. He motioned aside to a worker who approached the west post with a shovel. Gently, he called out in warning. The remains of the sacrifices must not be disturbed. Be sure there is ample soil around their graves. The overseer to the workers acknowledged the priest's instruction. Satisfied the matter was in hand, the servant of Turakamu reminisced in friendly fashion with Mara. We who serve the Red God are often misunderstood, lady. Death is part of life, and all come to Turakamu's hall eventually. We are not in a hurry to gather their spirits. Remember that in the future, should you ever have need of our counsel. Mara nodded her respect. I shall, priest. Then she turned to Lujan and said, I will walk for a while. She led the march down the gentle rise to the landing, where boats waited by the docks to cross the lake. On the far shore in the sunshine lay the vast house that soon would honour the Akoma and their visitors and emissaries. Lujan, she murmured, as her eyes followed the magnificent vista of lake and mountains and the distant inlet from the river. Did you ever think we might lose? Lujan laughed, and Mara felt a rush of affection for this man, most like her rakish barbarian with his pleasantly teasing nature, Mistress, I would be a liar if I said I had not contemplated defeat on more than one occasion. More seriously, he added, But never for a moment did I doubt you. Mara impulsively took his hand. For that I humbly thank you, my friend. Together, Lady and Force Commander made their way to the docks where boatmen waited to take them across the beautiful lake. Lujan, Sarik, and Kiyoke assumed seats in the vessel with Mara, while her two force leaders directed the other Akoma soldiers into craft to follow after. Soon the water was crowded with the flotilla of her army. Mara glanced back to where Kiyoke sat, holding a bundle in his lap as if it were fragile and precious. Under a mantle of green cloth beaded with jewels rested the Akoma Natami. Mara's advisor for war had drilled endlessly with an old wooden coffer to perfect the handling of both burden and crutch. He counted this trust as the highest honour ever awarded him, even over accolades won in battle. The boats floated swiftly across the water. Wishing poignantly that Kevin could have been at her side, Mara was surprised out of her reverie to see a magician waiting for her upon the docks outside the great house. Behind him stood priests of Chochokan, who had been overseeing the blessing of the new Akoma estate, in preparation for Mara's coming union with Hokano of the Shinzawai. The first guests would arrive within the week. Mara had been relieved, for by her estimation Kevin's child would be born slightly less than eight months after the wedding, close enough to raise only eyebrows, and not giving incontrovertible evidence that the father was other than her pledged husband. The lead boat reached the landing. Helped to the dock by Lujan, Mara bowed to the magician. Great one, you do us honour. The great one waved a pudgy hand. No, I remain only to inform you 
that my colleague conducted Tasayo here, then witnessed the ceremony as the former Minwanabi lord made ready to honorably end the feud and take his own life. Mara was joined by her advisers as the Great One added sadly, Please come with me. The Akoma party followed him down spacious paths on the opposite side of the great house. There, more than ten thousand people waited in silent ranks. Before them stood a large bier fronted with red bunting. Mara raised her eyes to the four shrouded figures that lay in their final rest. Tears flooded her eyes as she saw that two were children. Servants had tried to make them look presentable, but their fresh wounds could not be hidden. Tasayo had cut their young throats. Sickened by the thought that the boy might have been her own Ayaki, Mara felt Lujan reach out and steady her arm. I would have spared them, she murmured numbly. The Great One regarded her with sorrow. The Mimonabi line is ended, Lady Mara. The assembly officially stood as witness. Now that my charge is complete, I will excuse myself. Live in a long life and a happy one, great lady. Hotchapepper reached into his pocket, where he kept his talisman of transport. A buzzing sounded upon the air, and he was gone. Mara was left at a loss before the host of former Minwanabi retainers who still survived. The first six rows of people had all donned grey robes of slavery. Behind were ranks of soldiers with weapons and helms stacked at their feet and heads bowed in defeat. An ancient man, garbed as a slave but aristocratic in bearing, stepped forward and prostrated himself before Mara. My lady, he intoned respectfully. Speak, the lady bade him. I am Inkomo, former first advisor to Lord Minoanabi. I present myself to assist you in whatever dispensation you decree for all of us who served that unlucky house. Their fates are not mine to dispense, Mara whispered, still shaken by the bodies of the dead children. Inkomo looked up, emptiness in his dark eyes. Lady, my former lord commanded all blood relatives to their ancestral home. He ordered and saw each kinsman kill his own wives and children, then fall upon his sword in turn. But he waited until an hour ago when he heard you had set foot upon Minwanabi soil before he took the lives of his own family. Only when they were dead did he fall upon his sword. Trembling in abject fear, Inkomo performed his last duty to his master. Lord Tasayo bade me tell you that he would rather see his children in death's hall at his side than live in an Akoma house. Mara felt a stab of horror. That murderous animal! His own children! Blind rage shook through her, then dwindled to grief as she again regarded the small forms of that little boy and girl upon the bier. Grant them full honours, she said softly. A great name ends this day. Incomo bowed. I am your slave, mistress, for I have failed my master. But I beg you, have mercy for I am old and ill-suited for labor. Grant me the boon of honorable death. Mara almost snarled in her outrage as she said, No! Her eyes bored into the startled man as she cried, Stand up! Stunned by her unseemly emotion, Inkoma was taken aback. Mara could not bear the sight of his subservient attitude an instant longer. Taking his arm in a surprisingly strong grip, she pulled the elderly adviser to his feet. You were never sold into slavery by Tasayo, were you? 
Nkoma couldn't speak. He was so taken off guard. You were never ordered into slavery by an imperial court, were you? No, lady, but who calls you a slave? Her disgust was palpable as she half dragged the old man to where her own advisers stood. To Sarek, wearing an advisor's formal robes, she said, Your training under Nakoya was sorrowfully cut short. Take this man as your honoured assistant and heed him well. His name is Nkomo, and as all of Tasayo's former enemies know, he gives competent counsel. The old man gaped at his new mistress, who smiled at him in a surprisingly friendly way. She looked from his astonishment to a wry, nearly laughing Sarik and said, If you have ambitions to become my first adviser, you will listen to whatever this wise old man may tell you. Mara turned away, and the former Minwanabi adviser said, Master, what is this? Sarik chuckled. You'll discover that our mistress has her own way of doing things in Como. You'll also find you have been given a new life. But freeing a slave? At this, Mara spun back in a fury. You were never pronounced a slave. In my house, you never will be. It is tradition that made free men slaves when their masters fell, not the law. Now serve me well and cease this discussion. As she moved on, Sarik raised eyebrows in his personal brand of bemusement. She is a servant of the Empire. Who will say no to her if she changes another tradition? Incomo could only stand mute and nod. The concept of working under a mistress who was blessedly not afflicted with temperament or an insane lust for cruelty seemed a vision of perfection from the gods. Uncertain whether he was dreaming, he shook his head in wonder. The old man raised his hand and was shocked to find tears flowing. Forcing himself back to an honourable, impassive mien, he heard Sarik whisper, When you've reconciled yourself to death, a new life is something of a shock, yes? Nkomo could only nod, speechless, as Mara returned her attention to the priests of Chochakan. The clerics finished their rites over the bodies of the Minwanabi lord, his wife and his children. As they lit their candle to start the death fire, Mara looked one last time at the hard, clean profile of the man who had nearly come to ruin her and whose hand had brought the deaths of her father and brother. Our debt is settled, she said to herself, then raised her voice in formal call. Soldiers of the Miwanabi! Give honours to your master! As one, the waiting warriors relieved their helms and arms from the ground. They stood at attention, saluting their former master as his earthly form and extravagantly fine armour were engulfed in curtains of fire. As the smoke rose toward heaven, Irilandi stood forward and was permitted, in a voice almost tremulous with gratitude, to recite the long list of Tasayo's honours in the field. Mara and the Akoma retinue stood and listened with impeccable politeness, and, out of respect for her feelings, the fallen Minwanabi force commander omitted the names of Mara's father and brother when he mentioned the battle that ended their life. When his recitation came to an end, Mara turned to face those arrayed before her. Raising her voice to be heard over the roaring fire, she cried, who among you were advisers, her donra, servants and factors? You are needed. Serve me from this day forward as the free men you are. Several of those in grey robes rose uncertainly, then moved to stand on one side. You who are slaves, serve me also in the hope that one day this empire will find the wisdom to grant the freedom that should never by right have been forbidden you. These others followed hesitantly. Then Mara shouted to the soldiers, Brave warriors, I am Mara of the Akoma. 
Tradition holds that you now lead a masterless existence as grey warriors, and that all who were your officers must die. The front rank of men who had once worn plumes received her words impassively. They had expected no less, and their affairs were settled in preparation for the end. Yet Mara did not order them to fall upon their swords. I find such a practice a crime and a dishonour for men who were but loyal to their lawful lord. It was not your choice to be led by men of evil nature. That fate decrees a death without battle honours is a foolishness I have no intention of perpetuating. Softly to the force commander at her side, Mara murmured, "Lujan." Did you find him? Is he here? Lujan inclined his head to speak in her ear. I think he stands on the right in the first rank. It's been years, so I can't be sure, but I'll find out. Stepping away from his mistress, he called out in his field commander's voice, "Jadanyo, who was once fifth son of the widow Wyo." The soldier who had been identified bowed in obedience and came forward. He had not seen Lujan since boyhood and had thought him dead in the destruction of the Tuskai, so his eyes widened. Lujan, old friend, can it be you? Lujan waved introduction to Mara. Mistress, this man is Jadanyo, by blood my second cousin. He is an honourable soldier. And worthy of service, the lady inclined her head toward the former Minwanabi warrior. Sir Daniel, you have been called to serve the Akoma. Are you willing? The man stumbled over his words in dismay. What, what is this? Lujan gave a devilish grin. In a laughing voice, he said, "Say yes, you idiot, or will I have to wrestle you into submission as I did when we were children?" Jadanyo hesitated, eyes wide. Then, in a joyful shout, he cried, "Yes, lady, I am willing to serve a new mistress." Mara saluted him formally, then signalled Kiyoke forward. In the tone that once commanded armies, her battered adviser for war cried out, "Uralandi, who was my friend as a child, present yourself." The Minwanabi force commander took a moment to recognise a former friend and rival, resplendent as he was in the glittering finery of an adviser. With a glance in wonderment at the crutch and the face whose chiselled line still held vitality and pride, he moved from his place before the front ranks of his dishonoured soldiers. By every tradition, he expected to die this day, along with all his sub-officers. Too old a campaigner to set any store in miracles, he heard without belief as Kiyoke said, "Mistress, this man is Irilandi, who is brother to one who married my cousin's wife's sister. He is therefore my cousin, and worthy of service to the Akoma." Looking at Tasayo's former force commander, and moved by the iron courage that masked a turmoil of confusion, Mara said kindly. Irilandi, I will not kill good men because they faithfully discharge their duties. You are called to serve the Akoma. Are you willing? The old officer searched the lady's eyes for a long moment, speechless. Then restraint, suspicion, and disbelief gave way to boyish abandon. Swept by irrepressible elation, he said. With all my heart, my most generous mistress. With all my heart. Mara gave him her first command. Marshal all of your soldiers and compare bloodlines with those in my retinue. Most will have ties to soldiers serving the Akoma, or at least they will have by the time the last of you have sworn service. All here are worthy. Therefore, let the forms be observed that all may be lawfully committed to duty. If there are any among you, officers or common warriors, who feel they could not give loyalty to my house, you have my leave to permit them to fall upon their swords or depart in peace as they choose. 
A handful of soldiers stepped from the ranks and departed, but fully nine men in ten remained. Mara said, Now, Irilandi, will you come before the Akomanat army and vow your obedience that the task ahead may begin? The old officer bowed deeply in gratitude, and, as he rose with a shining smile, the ranks of leaderless soldiers erupted into uncontrollable cheers and shouts. The name Akoma! Akoma! rang in the morning air until Mara was nearly deafened by the clamour. The cheering continued unabated for long minutes while the rising smoke from the Minuanabi pyre rose on the clear air forgotten. Over the waves of noise, Mara told Sarik and Incomo, Sort this out and ready these men to swear before the glade. I am going now to place the Natami in its new home. A priest of Chochokan, the good god, and Kiyoke accompanied Mara to the contemplation glade. Waiting outside with a shovel in hand was the gardener who was the traditional keeper of the grounds. He expected the Minwanabi Natami to be buried face down forever in the time-worn custom of a house fallen to conquerors. The moment came at last, and Kiyoke surrendered the burden of the Akoma Natami to Mara. Her escort halted outside the entrance, while the priest and gardener accompanied her inside. The glade was much larger than the one upon the Akoma estates and was tended in impeccable fashion with fragrant flowers and fruit trees and a series of pools interconnected by the trilling splash of waterfalls. Mara gazed in wonder upon a beauty that stopped her breath. Half dazed, she said to the gardener, What is your name? All but trembling in apprehension, the dutiful servant replied, Nura, great mistress. Softly she said, You do honour to your office, gardener. Great honour. The sun-browned man brightened at the compliment. He bowed and set his forehead to the earth he had tended so lovingly. I thank the great lady. Mara bade him rise. She walked on down shaded paths to the place where the ancient rocks bearing the Minwanabi crest rested. For a long moment she regarded the talisman, so much like her own, except for the weather-worn sigil. It might have been the twin to the one she carried. Poignantly reminded that all great houses of the Empire shared a common beginning, she renewed her dedication to make that a common future as well. At last she said, With reverence, remove the Natami. Nera knelt to do her bidding as she turned and faced the priest. I will not bury the Minwanabi Natami. She needed no symbolic act to rejoice in the recognition that the struggle she had fought most of her life had at last come to an end. She had risked much and lost a great deal that was dear to her. And the thought of even ritual obliteration of a family's memory made her feel sour inside. Too easily, all too easily, the defeated house might have been her own. In deep recognition of her own strengths and failures, and the legacy they might leave to her son and future children, she nodded to the Minwanabi family talisman. Once heroic men bore that name, it is not fitting they should be forgotten because their offspring fell from greatness. The Akoma Natami shall rest here, where I and my children may sit in peace with the shades of our ancestors. But another place, on a hilltop overlooking the estate, will be set aside for the Minuanabi stone. I would have the spirits of those great men see their ancestral lands are well cared for and nurtured. Then they too will rest easy. To the gardener she said, Nira. You are free to choose this site. Plant a hedge and a garden of flowers, and let no feet tread there but yours and those of your appointed successors. Let the ancestors who participated in the founding and continuance of this nation know sunlight and rain that the memory of a great house shall endure. The man bowed low and expertly dug around the base of the ancient rock. 
While the priest of Chochokan intoned a blessing, his work-calloused hands raised the talisman and shifted it aside. Mara gave over her own family stone into the hands of the priest of the good god. He raised the Akoma Natami toward the sky and recited his most powerful incantation for Chochokan's everlasting favour. Then he returned the Akoma Natami to Mara, who in turn passed it to the gardener. Here is the heart of my line. Tend it as you would your living child, and you will be known as a man who has done honour to two great houses. Mistress, Nera said, bowing his head over his new charge in respect. Like every other servant on the estates, he had expected slavery, but instead he discovered he was being given a new life. The priest consecrated the ground around the Natami as Nera trampled soil around the base. At the completion of the ritual, Chuchakan's servant sounded a tiny metal chime and departed the gardener following on his heels. Mara remained alone with the stone that bound her ancestors' spirits to renewal on the wheel of life. Careless of her fine silks, she knelt in the earth and ran her fingers across the surface, the faint lines of the Shatra bird crest worn with age. Father, she said quietly, this is to be our new home. I hope the sight pleases you. Then she added words for the dead brother whose absence even yet left a wound in her heart. Nanakuta, rest you well and no peace. Then she thought of all those who had died in her service, those close and loved and others barely known. Brave Papiwayo, who gave your life to save mine, I hope you return to the wheel of life as a son of this house. And Nakoya, mother of my heart, no, the woman you raised as a daughter sings your praises. She thought of her beloved Kevin, who now was back among his own family, and prayed that he would find a happy life without her. Tears flowed freely down her cheeks for both losses and victories, joys and sorrows. The game of the council as she had known it was forever changed, and by her hand. Yet, as she knew her people... She understood that their nature would accept this new order slowly. Politics would shift, and she would be required to work hard to preserve peace. The wealth she would gain from her Midkemian trading concessions would help underwrite such efforts, but the difficulties ahead in establishing Ichindar's power would require as much nurturing as any plan she had completed to defeat enemies. Mara arose, both sobered and exhilarated by the weight of new responsibilities. Inspired by the beautiful gardens and by old trees lovingly tended, she arrived at the gate that marked the entrance to her family's sacred glade. There she encountered her inner cadre of advisers and thousands of Minwanabi soldiers upon their knees with Lujan before them. Mistress, he called gladly, to a man! These remaining warriors embrace a coma service. Mara waved him a salute. Even as she had restored hope and honour to a band of houseless outlaws as a girl green to the ways of power, she said, Swear them to honourable service, Force Commander Lujan. Proud in his plumes, the Akoma Force Commander led them in the short vow that he had undertaken those same years before, when he had been among the first soldiers in the Empire to receive the grace of a second chance at honourable life. As he finished and marshalled the warriors newly dedicated to the Akoma Natami, Mara's eyes lifted to the distant shores of the lake. A flash of movement there snagged her attention and her spirit soared with emotion. Setting a hand upon Kiyoke's shoulder, she said, Look! Her weathered advisor for war turned his gaze where she indicated, My eyes are not young, mistress. What do you see? Shatra birds, came Mara's awed reply. By the grace of divine favour, they come to nest in the marshes on our shores. From his place beside the youthful Sarek, Inkomo said, 
The gods seem pleased with your generous heart, mistress. We can only hope, Incomo. To her circle of advisers she said, Come, let us make our new home ready. My husband-to-be shall arrive soon in the company of my son and heir. Mara led old ministers and new toward the house she had so long admired, now to be home to her family, and a roof to join two great houses dedicated to the betterment of the empire. Mara of the Acoma passed the ranks of her newly sworn soldiers, men who but days before had been confirmed enemies, zealous in their duty to bring ruinous ending to her house. That she could work miracles was now firmly believed by most who watched her. For not only had she defeated three lords of the most powerful house in the empire, she had forgiven their servants and embraced them as if they had never done her harm. Such generosity and wisdom would shelter them and make them prosperous. And she bore the most ancient and honourable title ever bestowed, Servant of the Empire. That's the end of Servant of the Empire by Raymond E. Feist and Janny Wirtz.